Detransition, Baby By Tori Peters Chapter 1 One month after conception The question, for Reese, were married men just desperately attractive to her? Or was the pool of men who were available to her as a trans woman only those who had already locked down a CIS wife and could now explore with her? The easy answer, the one that all her girls advocated, was to call men dogs. But now, here's Reese sneaking around with another handsome, charming, motherfucking cheetah. Look at her, wearing a black lace dress and sitting in his parked beamer, waiting while he goes into a Duane Reed to buy condoms. Then she's going to let him come over to her apartment, avoid the pointed glare of her roommate, Iris, and have him fuck her right on the trite floral bedspread that the last married dude bought her so that her room would seem a little more girly and naughty when he snuck away from his wife. Reese had already diagnosed her own problem. She didn't know how to be alone. She fled from her own company, from her own solitude. Along with telling her how awful her cheating men were. Her friends also told her that after two major breakups, she needed time to learn to be herself, by herself. But she couldn't be alone in any kind of moderate way. Give her a week to herself and she began to isolate, cultivating an ash pile of loneliness that built on itself exponentially, until she was daydreaming about selling everything and drifting away on a boat toward nowhere. To jolt herself back to life, she went on Grindry, or Tinder, or whatever and administered 10,000 volts to the heart by chasing the most dramatic tachycardia of an affair she could find. Married men were the best for fleeing loneliness, because married men also didn't know how to be alone. Married men were experts at being together, at not letting go, no matter what, until death do us part. With the pretense of setting the boundaries of just an affair, Reese would swan dive super deep, super hard. By telling herself it would just be a fling, she gave herself permission to fulfill every fetish the guy had ever dreamed of, to unearth his every secret hurt, to debase herself in the most lush, vicious, and unsustainable ways then collapse into resentment, sadness, and spite that it had been just a fling, because hadn't she been brave enough and vulnerable enough to dive super deep, super hard. She saw herself as attractive, round face and full figure, but she didn't pretend that she stopped traffic nor did she frequently note people standing around to admire the harvests of her brain. But with the right kind of man, she bore a genius for drama. She could distill it and flame it like jet fuel when solitude chilled her bones. Her man this time was similar to her others. A handsome, married alpha type who put her on a leash in the bedroom. Only this one was better, because he was an hiv positive cowboy turned lawyer. He had a thing for trans girls and had Sarah converted while cheating on his wife with a trans woman, and the wife had stayed with him, and now he was at it again with Reese. We. Oui. Did you bottom or something? Reese had asked on their first date. Fuck no, he said. My doctors said I had a 1 in 10,000 chance to contract it from getting head. You figure that at least 10,000 blowjobs are happening every minute but that one in 10,000 was me. Also, she gave me a lot of blowjobs. Cool, said Rhys, who knew that that explanation wasn't factual, but had only really agreed to make sure he wasn't going to try to bottom with her. Within the hour, she had him back in her room and confessing from whom he'd gotten him and where. Within two hours, Rhys convinced him to talk about his wife's disappointment, how she was unwilling to let him fuck a child into her even though his hiv had declined to undetectable levels. He described how much his wife hated the IVF treatments, how their clinical nature reminded her over and over what he had done to put her on a cold doctor's table instead of in their warm marital bed. You're getting a lot more candor out of me than I'm used to, her cowboy said, sounding surprised at himself, even as he squeezed Reese's tits. The power of pussy. I guess. You might get my pussy, she responded, enjoying herself and aping his cowboy drool, but a good woman will flay your soul. Ain't that the truth, he drooled back. He lifted a big paw to the back of her neck and brought her face close to his. She sighed, went limp. Her eyes glassily held his. Tell you what, he told her, first I'm going to own your pussy. He paused, 
and with his hand still on her neck, he slowly, firmly, pushed her face down into a pillow. Then we'll see about my soul. Now he slides back into the car, with a little brown bag full of lube and condoms, and a tickling of anticipation slides across Reese's stomach. Do we really need these tonight? He asks her, holding up the bag. You know I'm gonna want to knock you up. This was why she still put up with him, he got it. With him, she'd discovered sex that was really and truly dangerous. CIS women, she supposed, rubbed against a frisson of danger every time they had sex. The risk, the thrill, that they might get pregnant a single fuck to fuck up, or bless, their lives. For CIS women, Reese imagined, sex was a game played at the precipice of a cliff. But until her cowboy, she hadn't ever had the pleasure of that particular danger. Only now, with his hive, had she found an analogue to a CIS woman's life changer. Her cowboy could fuck her and mark her forever. He could fuck her and end her. His cock could obliterate her. His viral load was undetectable, he said, but she never asked to see any papers. That would kill the sweetness and danger of it. He liked to play close to the edge too, pushing to knock her up, to impregnate her with a viral seed. Make her the mommy, her body host to new life, part of her but not, just as mother's eternal. We agreed on condoms always. You said you didn't want it on your conscience, she said. Yeah, but that was before you started on your birth control. She first called her prep birth control at a Chinese place in Sunset Park where he felt safe that none of his wife's friends would possibly run into him. It popped into her head as a joke, but he looked at her and said, fuck, I just got so hard. He signaled for the check, told her that she wouldn't get to see a movie that night, and drove her right home to put her face down on her floral bedspread. In the morning, she sexed him one of the sexiest, but most ostensibly non-sexual, sexts of her life a short video of her cramming a couple of her big blue Truvada pills into one of those distinctive pastel birth control day of the month clamshell cases. From then on, her birth control pills were part of their sex life. There was another reason, beyond the stigma, taboo, and eroticization, that their particular brand of bug chasing had bite for Reese, she really did want to be a mom. She wanted it worse than anything. She had spent her whole adulthood with the queers, ingesting their radical relationships and polyamory and gender roles, but somehow, she still never displaced from the pinnacle of womanhood those nice white Wisconsin moms who had populated her childhood. She never lost that secret fervor to grow up into one of them. In motherhood she could imagine herself apart from her loneliness and neediness, because as a mother, she believed, you were never truly alone. No matter that her own and her trans friends' actual experiences of unconditional parental love always turned out to be awfully conditional. Perhaps equally important, as a mother, she saw herself finally granted the womanhood that she suspected the goddesses of her childhood took as their natural due. She'd set herself up for it, once. She'd been in a lesbian relationship with a trans woman named Amy a woman with a good job in tech, and who became so suburban presentable that when she spoke, you imagined her words in Martha Stewart's signature typeface. With Amy, Reese had gotten as close to domesticity as she figured possible for a trans girl the trust and boredom and stability that now had the faded aspect of a dream recalled right after you wake. They even had an apartment by Prospect Park the kind of bright, airy space that evinced enough good taste and stalwart respectability that the idea of showing adoption agencies where they lived had been one of the lesser obstacles to motherhood. But now, three years later, as Reese's odometer clicked up into her mid-thirties, she began to think about what she called the sex and the city problem. The sex and the city problem wasn't just Reese's problem, it was a problem for all women. But unlike millions of CIS women before Reese, no generation of trans women had ever solved it. The problem could be described thusly, when a woman begins to notice herself aging, the prospect of making some meaning out of her life grows more and more urgent. A need to save herself, or be saved as the joys of beauty and youth repeat themselves to lesser and lesser effect. But in finding meaning, 
Reese would argue despite the changes wrought by feminism women still found themselves with only four major options to save themselves, options represented by the story arcs of the four female characters of sex and the city. Find a partner, and be a Charlotte. Have a career, and be a Samantha. Have a baby, and be a Miranda. Or finally, express oneself in art or writing, and be a Carrie. Every generation of women reinvented this formula over and over, Rhys believed, blending it and twisting it, but never quite escaping it. Yet, for every generation of trans women prior to Rhys's, the sex and the city problem was an aspirational problem. Only the rarest, most stealth, most successful of trans women ever had the chance to even confront it. The rest were barred from all four options at the outset. No jobs, no lovers, no babies, and while a trans woman might have been a muse, no one wanted art in which she spoke for herself. And so, trans women defaulted into a kind of no-futurism, and while certain other queers might celebrate the irony, joy, and graves into which queers often rush, that rush into no future looked a lot more glamorous when the beautiful corpse left behind was a wild and willful choice rather than a statistical probability. When Reese lived with Amy, she aspired to the sex and the city problem herself. It felt radical for her, as a trans woman, to luxuriate in the contemplation of how bourgeois to become. It felt like a success not to have that choice made for her. Then Amy detransitioned and it all fell apart. Now futurelessness had crept back into view. Now Reese made other women's prizes her own bliss, and made babies out of viruses. All right, she says, after they'd been driving for about ten minutes. All right, what? All right. Let's see if you can get me pregnant. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Her cowboy starts to say something, but she cuts him off. Only, if we're going to do this, you've got to start treating me better. You've got to treat me like the mother of your child. He reaches over to pinch her side. Mother of my child. Come on. You don't want that. If I put a tadpole in the well, then you're gonna want to be the knocked up 16 year old from the bad side of town. You want everyone knowing it's cause you're an easy slut. She squirms away from his pinch. I'm serious. Treat me better. He frowns, but keeps his eyes on the road. Yeah. Okay. I will. Let's get some food, he says, breaking at a red light. Really? They were driving to her neighborhood, Greenpoint, and he often wouldn't eat with her in that area. He knew too many people who lived there. Once she forced him to go out to a vegan buffet by her house, and he barely made eye contact the whole time. His gaze instead jerked to the door whenever someone new came into the place. After that, she let him drive her south, or sometimes into Queens. Never Manhattan, never Williamsburg, where his wife made her social life. But now, she says he can fuck her without a condom and all his rules go out the window. Reese has a moment of satisfaction. Her body is the ultimate trump card. Yeah, he says, maybe you could run in somewhere and pick up some takeout. Of course. Takeout. With him waiting in the car. She nods. Sure, what would you like? In the Thai restaurant, she doesn't order anything for herself. He loves curries, spiced to a barely edible Scoville level. She does not. She'll make herself something at home after he leaves. She's scrolling through Instagram when her phone rings, and it's a number she doesn't recognize, some out-of-state area code. Her cowboy uses Google Voice so her texts don't show up on his iPad at home, which his wife sometimes borrows, and Google often routes the calls through weird numbers. She hits the green answer button and brings the phone to her ear. I got you green curry with beef. Five-star spiciness, she says by way of a greeting. Hey, that's nice of you, but if you remember, I was always such a was about spice. A man's voice. Warm and smooth, but none of her cowboy's drawl, which he somehow managed to keep, 
even through his years in New York. She lowers the phone, checks the number. Who is this? The man's tone changes, not quite apologetic, but inviting. Reese. Hi. Sorry, it's Ames. Out in the car she can see her cowboy, the glow of his own phone illuminating the glasses he only wore to read. She turns away, as if he might overhear her through the glass windows of his car, the plate glass of the restaurant, over the clang of the kitchen and the talk of the scattered customers. Why are you calling, Ames? I didn't think we were speaking anymore. I know. She waits, holds her lips together. She can hear him breathing. She wants to make him talk first. I'm not calling to bother you, he presses on. I was hoping for your help. My help? I didn't know I had anything left for you to take. He pauses. Take from you? His bafflement sounds genuine. This was his whole problem. That he couldn't see what he had led her to lose. Maybe I deserve that. But I promise I'm not calling for that. It's almost the opposite. I'm on a date. I've got some Thai food coming. She knows it's vindictive to say. But she can't help it. He's thrown her off, and she wants both to return the favor and to prove to him that her life has moved on. I can call at a different time? No, you've got until my food gets here to explain yourself. Is there some guy watching us talk? I'm getting takeout. He's waiting in the car. A thrum of satisfaction plays in Reese's chest. Clearly, however Ames had anticipated this conversation going, she has wrested it away from him. Okay, he says, I'd hope to explain this at length, but we'll do it your way. Remember how you always wanted us to have a baby together? That's what we had planned for? Something must be off with him that he'd call her about this. He wasn't the type to hurt people for fun, and he must know such a question, asked so directly, would hurt her. She feels stupid for having told him that she was on a date. Is that still something you'd want? A baby, I mean. His question ends on an up note, as though he's slightly afraid of his audacity in having voiced it. Of course I still fucking want a baby, she snaps. That's so good to hear, Reese, he says. His tone is relieved. She knows him so well, she can almost picture the way his body is relaxing. Because something happened. Even after everything, you're the person I trust most to talk to me about it. For everything we had, please, please, can I see you? I badly need to talk to you. You'll have to tell me more than just this, Ames. He exhales. All right. I got a woman pregnant. I'm going to have a baby. Reese can't believe it. She can't believe that Ames would call her to tell her that he had gotten the thing she so desperately wanted. She closes her eyes, counts to five. The waitress behind the counter plops down a brown bag and signals that it's her order. But Reese doesn't notice. Her cowboy, his five-star green curry, the birth control pill he'll feed her later they're all lost to her. Somewhere, somehow, Amy did the impossible, she got herself a baby. Katrina sits in the roller chair before Ames's desk. The moment has an air of uncommon inversion. Because she is his boss, Ames nearly always goes to her office and sits in front of her desk. Her office, corresponding to their relative places in the corporate hierarchy, is double the square footage of his, with two full windows looking out on two neighboring buildings, and between them, a sliver of East River View. By contrast, Ames's office has one window overlooking a small parking lot. Once, in the twilight, he saw a brown creature trotting sprightly across the pavement and has since maintained that it was an urban coyote. One takes one's excitements where one may. Katrina rifles through a briefcase, pulls out a manila folder, and plops it on his desk. Her coming to his office makes him tense, like a teenager whose parents have entered his room. Well, she says. It's real. This is happening. 
He reaches for the folder. He has good posture, and gives her an easy smile. The folder opens to reveal printouts from an online patient portal. My gyno, Katrina says, watching him closely. She followed up with a blood test and a pelvic exam. She confirmed the home test results. Without an ultrasound, she can't say how far I am, so I had one scheduled for the Thursday after next. I mean, I know you maybe aren't sure yet how you feel about it, but maybe if you come, that'll help. If I'm more than four weeks into it, we'll be able to see the baby or I guess, embryo. He is aware that she is scrutinizing him for a reaction. He had been unable to give one after the pregnancy test came back positive. He feels the same numbness that he felt then, only now, he can no longer delay by telling her that he wants to wait for official confirmation to get his emotions involved. Amazing, he says, and tries out a smile that he fears might be coming off as a grimace. I guess it's real. Especially since we have he searches briefly for a phrase, and then comes up with one an entire dossier of evidence. Katrina shifts to cross her legs. She's wearing casual wedge heels. He always notices her clothing, half out of admiration, and half out of the habit of noting what's going on in the field of women's fashion. Your reaction has been hard to read, she says carefully. I don't know, I thought maybe if you saw it in black and white, I'd be able to gauge how you were actually feeling. She pauses and swallows. But I still can't. He sees the effort it costs her to muster this level of assertion. He stands up, walks around the desk, and half sits against it, just in front of her, so his leg is touching hers. He rotates the printouts, there's a list of test results, but he can't make sense of them. His brain shorts out when he cross-references the data that they clearly show he is a father to be with the data he stores in his heart, he should not be a father. Three years have passed since Ames stopped taking estrogen. He injected his last dose on Reese's 32nd birthday. Reese, his ex, still lives in New York. They haven't spoken in two years, although he sent her a birthday card last year. He received no response. Throughout their relationship, she had always talked assuredly about how she'd have a kid by age 35. As far as he knows, that hasn't happened. It is only now, three years after their breakup, that Ames is able to talk about Reese casually, calling her my ex and moving the conversation along without dwelling. Because in truth, he still misses her in a way that talking about her, thinking about her, remains dangerous to indulge in as an alcoholic can't think too much about how much she'd really like just one drink. When Ames thinks hard about Reese, he feels abandoned and grows angry, morose, and worst of all, ashamed. Because he has trouble explaining exactly what he still wants from her. For a while he thought it was romance, but his desire has lost any kind of sexual edge. Instead, he misses her in a familial way, in the way he missed and felt betrayed by his birth family when they cut off contact in the early years of his transition. His sense of abandonment plucked at a nerve deeper, more adolescent than that of jilted adult romantic love. Reese hadn't just been his lover, she'd been something like his mother. She had taught him to be a woman, or he'd learn it to be a woman with her. She had found him in a plastic state of early development, a second puberty, and she'd mould him to her tastes. And now she was gone, but the imprint of her hands remained, so that he could never forget her. He hadn't understood how little sense he made as a person without Reese until after she began to detach from him, until the lack of her became so painful that he started to once again want the armour of masculinity and, somewhat haphazardly, detransition to fully suit up in it. So now, three years have passed living once again in a testosterone-dependent body. Yet even without the shots or pills, Ames had believed that he'd been on androgen blockers long enough to have atrophied his testicles into permanent sterility. That's what he told Katrina when they hooked up the first time, the night of the agency's annual Easter keg hunt. He told her that he was sterile not that he'd been a transsexual woman with atrophied balls. Ames sifts through the papers in the manila folder Katrina has brought. Beneath the printouts from her doctor are more printouts, from what look like Reddit forums. What are these? 
She drops her hand to her stomach. It's flat, no baby bump, but she's already holding herself like a pregnant woman. Well, I know you said you were sterile now. I was looking it up, and vasectomies are like 99% effective, but I found some message boards, from men who still got women pregnant. He raises a hand. Wait a sec. I never said I had a vasectomy. His office, like all the offices in this row, has only a glass wall to separate it from the hallway. He's at the end of the row, beside an alcove into which is tucked the copy machine, water cooler, coffee maker, and a little kitchenette stocked with due to a recent human resources campaign only healthy organic snacks. Coworker hallway traffic remains constant throughout the day. He would not consider his office to be an ideal location to come out as a former transsexual. No? But we haven't used condoms for months and this whole time I thought what did you mean, then? Like low sperm count? I had very low testosterone for a while. He works to keep his voice casual, to resist the urge to lower it nervously. And during that time, my testicles atrophied, and my doctor told me that none of my sperm would ever again be viable. When Ames first went in for an estrogen prescription, he saw a gentle, elderly endocrinologist, who had taken on trans patients not because of any special interest in gender, but because trans patients were, in his words, so happy to come see me for treatment. The bulk of the doctor's other patients suffered from hormonal disorders that made them emotionally volatile. After this endo discovered trans gratitude, he filled his appointments with as many transsexuals as he could find. Ames, who had no history with trans therapy, and none of the paperwork that the hormone gatekeepers tended to require, had spent weeks before the appointment fretting that the endo would declare him not really trans and deny him hormones. Upon hearing that the doctor appreciated appreciation, Ames therefore gushed with gratitude, and duly walked out with a prescription for injectable estrogen. At his next appointment, the endo confided, perhaps, last time, I prescribed somewhat hastily. I should have said more about sterility. He told Ames that permanent sterility would set in within the first six months of a hormone replacement therapy regimen, and he gave Ames a recommendation for a sperm bank. The next day, Ames mustered great bravery and called the sperm bank. He did not want to think about fatherhood, that final plume in the cap of manhood, but he forced himself to call anyway. A receptionist on the other end of the line quoted annual prices for sperm storage akin to his cable subscription which he supposed was a reasonable cost for preserving the viability of his future genetic line. The receptionist put him on hold to make an appointment and as Vivaldi played, Ames pondered whether he ought to cancel his subscription to HBO in order to afford this sperm bank. He couldn't fully comprehend the enormous weight of fatherhood and generational lineage, but he could easily comprehend how much he did not want to cancel HBO. Without further consideration, he hung up. By the time his nipples began to ache that spring, he figured it was too late anyhow. The more his nipples hurt, the less he suffocated from the dread that came from thoughts of fatherhood. Now, with Katrina sitting in his office, for the first time in a long time, he had to think about the possibility of having sired a child. Shortly, very shortly, he was going to be called upon to make some decision, which would lead to other decisions, generations of decisions generated by this decision. Your testicles atrophied? Katrina asks, baffled. But they felt normal to me. Yes, he agrees. I mean, they're not huge or anything. No, not huge, Katrina affirms, and then adds encouragingly, but fine. On the other side of his office's glass wall, Karen from the art department pauses in the hallway to unwrap a granola bar. Ames becomes suddenly aware that Katrina and he are casually discussing his balls in the middle of a workday. Co-workers had shared the office gossip about Katrina almost immediately after Ames had joined the agency, bad divorce. She'd left her husband a few months before he'd interviewed. She cried in her office, the co-workers told him, then told her secretary not to put her husband's calls through. He had cheated on her, said one. No, no she'd had a miscarriage. Incorrect, said another, they'd had money problems. 
The speculation took on a tone both lurid and compulsory to have a boss is so commonplace that one rarely remarks on its strangeness, yet its structure compels a cult of personality around even the most quotidian of managers. As an underling, one needs to furnish an epistemology of how it came to pass that she has sway over one's precious autonomy. Basic comprehension of capitalism's arbitrary mechanics doesn't satisfy the heart demands a human explanation. Or at least that's what Ames said to justify his initial crush. Still, over that first year that Ames worked for Katrina, she kept her personal life just that. Instead of talking about her divorce, Ames intuited it. He noted the slight woundedness and exasperation that clung to her, the nearly teenage angst and willingness to test bad ideas that led to a certain oh fuck itness about her work and a straightforward honesty with her employees. She developed a visceral suspicion of conventional narratives. The anodyne corporate clients who came to the agency occasionally saw one or two much darker and more experimental pitches for their online marketing campaigns slipped in among the conventional fare. Dadaism for the Clorox bleach campaign. Cyborgian despair for anchor batteries. A series of radio ads for Purina in which John Lovitz catered to 90s nostalgia by reprising his cult role as critic Jay Sherman in order to give negative reviews to various puppies. It made her good at her work. Ames interpreted her tendency to re-narrativize as divorce-induced. Well into their romance, after they'd already slept together numerous times, she brought up the subject of her divorce. They were in his bed, on their sides, facing each other, he propped up on an elbow, she with her face resting on one of his forest green pillowcases, her glossy brown hair stepping down from head to pillow to bed. The bedside light shining behind her illuminated the outer crescents of her face he still instinctively noticed the curve of a brow. I know that people in the office probably told you about the miscarriage, she said. I stupidly talked about it with a few people. Telling Abby anything is a mistake. He laughed, because, yeah, Abby was a gossip. When you get a divorce, she said after a moment, everyone expects you to provide a story to justify it. Every woman I've ever met who has had a divorce has a story to explain herself. But in real life the story and actual reasons for the divorce diverge. In reality, everything is more ambivalent. My own reasons are closer to a tone than a series of causes and effects. But when I talk about it, I know people want a cause and effect, a clear why. All right, Ames said. So what's the tone of your divorce? I like to call it the ennui of heterosexuality. I see. Do you still suffer from the ennui of heterosexuality? Ames asked, gesturing grandly at their post coital bedroom tableau. I suffered from a miscarriage, she replied defiantly, puncturing his irony. Ames quickly apologized. Katrina shifted a pillow, and when she turned back to Ames, her face was, amused. See, you proved my point. When I said ennui of heterosexuality, you challenged me, but when I said miscarriage, you immediately apologized. That's why the miscarriage is the official story of my divorce. No one ever challenges it. Miscarriages are private, and so my miscarriage is a clean get-out-free card. It makes for a divorce in which Danny was blameless grief where you lose something you can't quite name. People assume that mourning drove a sad wedge between a couple no one's fault. Everything is assumed. No one ever asks how I actually felt about the miscarriage. How did you feel about the miscarriage? Ames asked. I felt relief. Relief? Yes. I was relieved. Which made me feel like a psychopath. I read all these articles in women's magazines about miscarriages, and they all said that I would feel grief and guilt. They assured me that it wasn't my fault, that it wasn't because of that glass of wine I had once, or that Italian sub full of processed meat. But I never thought it was my fault. My own guilt came from not having guilt. After a while of feeling that way, I began to ask why. Why should I feel relieved? It caused me to look harder at my marriage. I was relieved because of something I didn't want to admit, I didn't want to be with Danny anymore and if we had a kid together I would have to be. 
Danny was a good boyfriend to have when I was younger, when we were in college. Like, in the same way that a Saint Bernard would be a good dog to have if you were lost in the mountains. A big amiable body that a girl could shelter behind. Danny was an idea I inherited, maybe from growing up in Vermont, of what a man was supposed to be. We looked good together, like, early on I knew any photo for our wedding announcement was going to look like it came from a magazine. So when he proposed, I accepted, even though we had been dating two years, and I don't think that sex ever lasted longer than 15 minutes, including foreplay, and despite the fact that by the three-month point in our relationship, I had somehow already ended up doing his laundry. One time, I made this joke that my marriage was like a push-up bra, it looked pretty good underneath a shirt, but you know it's all just padding and by the end of the day you can't wait to take the damn thing off. My friends laughed, but I felt icy, because I realized I had inadvertently told the truth and it was awful. Ames listened. She had once told him that she liked how he didn't seem to feel a need to speak or give advice when she was working through a thought out loud. Could Trina removed her earrings and set them on the nightstand. Danny and I went to Dartmouth with this couple Pete and Leah. When they moved to New York from Seattle, they did this thing where they invited other married couples over to watch Cheers and eat pie. The couples were the kind of people who liked rock climbing and called themselves foodies. Everyone but me was very, very white. Watching Cheers was part of their weird hipster irony. We all snorted at the 80s era sexual politics like we were better than that, like we'd really come so far since then. Pussyhound Sam Malone and Shrill, wanna be feminist but secretly dick crazed what's her name? Oh. I can't remember what her name was. Diane, said Ames. Yeah, Diane. I, I just remember this one night, after I lost the baby, all the men, once the show started, sort of unfurled themselves around their wives, and each wife settled into her respective husband's arms contentedly. These bonded animal pairs. And suddenly they all looked like apes grooming each other. I was revolted. And Danny, you could see that he was leaning back on the sectional, opening his long arms so that I would place myself in them like all the other good wives. But I wouldn't do it. I sat stiffly next to him on the couch with a foot of space between us. Our hosts put on cheers, and we watched men and women say horrible things to each other and we laughed like that wasn't what we also did. Or do. Yeah, Ames said, nodding. All through it, Katrina went on, Danny kept sneaking me this hurt expression. I'm sure he didn't know what was worse, what I thought or what all our friends thought. But I didn't care. There was nothing that could ever have induced me to care about his hurt feelings just then. At that moment I blamed him for ruining me. For making me a psychopath. My thoughts were focused on him like I was psychically stabbing him with them. Over and over I thought the words, if you didn't annoy me, I wouldn't be glad to have lost the baby. I don't think it was fair or even logical, but I understood that I had felt that way for a long time. I had never even dared to think it in words. Just something about the smugness of that situation released it, of having to be his pet lap ape, while pretending we were evolved. Katrina cut off her own story with a mirthless laugh. Also, I think it was around then that I found his secret Asian porn collection. He had a secret Asian porn collection. A bunch on his computer and some DVDs titled Anal Asians or something. I dunno, Ames said. If I were an Asian... woman, and my husband had a collection of Asian porn, maybe I'd be flattered. At least it means he's attracted to me. No, she said. You don't get it. It means you begin to entertain creeping suspicions that after all you've been through together, years of learning to be adults together, 
The man who you married might only be with you because he fetishizes Asians even though I have felt not quite Asian enough my whole life. He couldn't even fetishize me accurately. What's that kind of chaser called? Ames asked. That kind of what? He pulled the covers around him, suddenly cold. He had the sense of having wandered out blindly in a winter storm to discover that he'd stumbled onto a thinly frozen lake. He had only ever encountered chasers in one context. Like, ah, uh, a tranny chaser. What's an Asian chaser called? She appraised him with a strange look. A rice chaser, she said flatly. In Vermont, growing up, the kids who saw my dad with my mom their favorite way to bully me was by saying my dad had yellow fever. Ames saw suddenly that she thought he was asking about himself. That she thought he wanted to know the slur for what having slept with her made him. He stifled an overwhelming urge to protest in horror. To tell her, God, no, I would never think having sex with a certain person could mark me as something I just really do get what it's like to be fetishized. I get what it's like to have someone think that his desire for me degrades or lowers him. But even at that moment, such an admission seemed too risky. What if coming out as a former transsexual meant never getting into bed with her again? What if it meant the end of their professional relationship? No, better to wait for the opportune moment. Now and again, Ames scrutinized Katrina, and imagined what it would be like to tell her. How she would react. When he was alone, he told himself that maybe, maybe, she'd even be into it. That maybe the deepest reason for her divorce from Danny had been sexual. That while not exactly queer she wasn't totally into the married straight life either. For real, she was a freak in bed. Their sex was way wilder than he had imagined in his crush stage. Their first hookup had been drunken, and involved pretty typical heterodynamics. Their second hookup which occurred dead sober, midday a week later after she took a day to work from home and told him, as her employee, to do the same had been decidedly bent. In her kitchen, she had opened her fridge and leaned into it. The shape of her from behind, along with the thick sexual tension, sunk him to his knees and he half-kissed, half-nuzzled her jean-clad ass. She looked back from the fridge, with an expression of near concern, at the same time she reached behind her and grabbed a handful of his hair. Are you sure you're okay with this, she asked. If the genders were reversed, and some man had told his female employee to take a day off of work and come over I'd be appalled. She had her fingers entwined in his hair even as she asked, so he couldn't pull back his head, and ended up responding to her ass, his mouth speaking an inch from her right ass cheek as if it were a microphone. Trust me, I love it, he told her ass. I'm in heaven. I've always had a thing for bossy women. Getting with my actual boss is like secret hotness level unlocked. You have consent or whatever, just please let me keep my face here. Should I be more of your boss about this, then? He looked up at her, unable to believe his luck. To find a toppy fam who was already literally in charge of him. Lotto odds. Yes, he said. Please. Fine. She laughed, and turned to face him, so that his nose was level with her crotch. Make me a PowerPoint presentation about why I should let you stay down there with your face in my pussy. He closed his eyes, inhaled happily, a dawning awareness that this play turned her on as much as it did him chiseled looser layer of the calcification that had begun to encrust his libido, and by extension, his heart, and by extension, his life. The next day she sent him an email while they were both at the office. Still waiting on that PowerPoint deck we discussed. When can I expect it to be delivered? He wasn't sure whether to respond openly. Here he was, with all his secret queer credentials, and this divorced straight woman had completely wrong-footed him. Which, of course, was so insanely hot that he briefly considered finding an out-of-the-way bathroom in which to jerk off. LOL, he responded weakly. No, I'm serious. I'll expect you to present your slides to me by close of day Tuesday. If you're late, I'll make you present them in a conference room. Your choice. 
This thing he had with Katrina their power games, the thrill of sneaking around at the office and the explicitness of their flirting it had all come together to make for really good sex. In his previous life, Ames had transitioned to live as a woman before he had ever had really good sex, and he wasn't sure that post-detransition, he'd ever have truly good sex again. Every other dalliance he'd attempted as a heterosexual man had disconnected his body and mind, fostering an inability to display real excitement or joy even as he performed all the necessary acts, until eventually, his partner took that disconnect as indifference and let go of him. When that happened he'd drift away without effort, like in shipwreck movies, that ubiquitous shot when the lover's body floats slowly down into the oceanic void. But not Katrina, for Katrina and her bossy games, he was fully here, electrified, daydreaming about it even when they were apart. Amazingly, his desire hadn't faded over the whole of the five months they had been together. If anything it had grown, gotten wild, lush unruly green life that overran the tidily landscaped paths and garden beds of proper behavior. He suspected that, although Katrina was too proud to openly say so, they had been having a type of sex that she had long craved but never before known to ask for. That this was the first time in her life that she was experiencing the mind-scrambling effects of good sex the kind of sex where you travel across the country for just a couple hours together after which you talk about buying property, or moving in together, or just generally entwining lives in a way logistically unjustified by a short period of intimacy. In short, the sex that Katrina and he were having was in the category that meant that when a pregnancy test comes up positive keeping the baby is very much an option. Except for two caveats, first, she didn't know that he was once a transsexual, and second, after all his mental gymnastics, after all the lessons of transition and detransition, fatherhood remained the one affront to his gender that he still couldn't stomach without a creeping sense of horror. To become a father by his own body, as his father was to him, and his father before him, and on and on, would sentence him to a lifetime of grappling with that horror. God, he'd hidden so much of his past from her, a past murky, half-spoken, all of it covered by the pretext that he was trying to protect their relationship from the office. It tired Ames, despite erasure having become a second nature mode of dealing with his past. In his office now, Katrina scoots forward in her chair and takes his hand. Ames, help me, she says softly. What do you want to do? I'm not asking you to decide anything for me. I surprised myself by finding out I'm excited. I feel vulnerable saying that, so please, give me some sense of what this means for you. She touches her stomach again. The baby yet not yet a baby beneath her hand. He remembers hearing that a fetal pulse is detectable at four weeks. He remembers that she has miscarried before. The quiet pain of that. It hurts to think about what she might be going through. You told me you were sterile and now I'm pregnant, she says. Now the only thing you have to tell me after my doctor's confirmation that you asked for is that your testicles are atrophied. This is not how most men react to finding out they are a potential father. Father. Spoken from the mother. She lets go of his hand, and picks up her manila folder, then examines the papers herself now, avoiding eye contact as she goes on. This is definitely not how I'd expect you to act if you truly believed it wasn't possible. Happiness, fear, joy, anger, whatever. But your level of surprise is like if we got dinner reservations somewhere you thought you couldn't get on short notice. Can you explain to me what is happening in your head? Ames inhales. Waits. Exhales now. She's waiting. Expecting him to say something, do something. That's who he is now, he reminds himself, someone who makes decisions, who doesn't let life just act upon him. Wasn't that the big lesson of transition, of detransition? That you'll never know all the angles, that delay is a form of hiding from reality. That you just figure out what you want and do it. And maybe, if you don't know what you want, you just do something anyway, and everything will change, and then maybe that will reveal what you really want. So do something.
And maybe he couldn't have picked a better spot than his office to tell her he'd always thought it would happen over dinner at some place where they'd be stuck discussing it. But in view of the office kitchenette? At work? This is the one place where she couldn't freak out, where she'd have to at least feign chillness. His silence draws out. Finally, Katrina makes a gesture with her hand, flipping up her palm, like, what? Just say it. So he does. I was told that I was sterile by the doctor who gave me estrogen. I injected estrogen and took testosterone blockers for about six years, when I lived as a transsexual woman. He told me I'd be permanently sterile after six months. So, like, given my past as a woman, fatherhood is a lot for me to handle emotionally. I'm sorry, you lived as a what? Expression drains from her face. I was a transsexual woman. That's why I thought I was sterile. He reaches out to her shoulder, to steady her. He's about to ask if he can tell her everything. A quick jerk of her arm out from under his touch, and her file of vasectomy reports and the pregnancy test flies at his face. Instinct bobs him a quick step to the side. The manila folder glances against his shoulder, opens, and printouts scatter. He wants to soothe her, to try to touch her again but she nimbly hops to her feet. I can't believe this. I feel, God, I feel she can't seem to speak, and instead brings her hands to her collarbone as if to push out the words that have gotten caught. Deceived. You deceived me. Why would you do this to me? He has enough experience with coming out to know that insisting he wasn't doing anything to her would only escalate the moment. Instead, he fights an impulse to stoop and gather the printouts back into their folder. The Reddit forum printouts now seem more glaring, more deviant than if she had tossed all five months' worth of their selfies and sexts. Still, he doesn't move. She's standing with one shoulder forward now, like a boxer, and although it'd be completely out of character, he's not sure that if he leans down, she won't pop him in the eye. But then, abruptly, she startles, and whirls. Josh, from the biz dev department, stares at them through the glass partition. When Katrina catches him gawking, he leans toward the kitchenette and snatches an apple from the wire basket hanging by the door. But he can't help himself, and turns back to regard the office diorama through the glass. He gives Ames a quick yikes, bro face. Katrina stares at Josh. She's visibly upset, her in-control boss demeanor still largely disassembled. Hello, Josh, Katrina says curtly through the glass. Josh is so enthralled by the scene that he doesn't seem to notice a break of the fourth wall. Decisively, she takes two steps, ignoring the scattered printouts, and opens the door. From the hallway, she spins and glares at Ames. Can you please pick up that file I dropped she points at the papers scattered on the floor and bring it by my office in about an hour? I'm late for a call right now. But we can discuss this further then. Of course, Ames says. Can't wait. Ames stoops to gather the papers. Josh waits until Katrina has rounded the hallway corner, leans in the door left wide open by her exit, tosses the apple in the air, catches it, and smirks down at Ames. Love a spat. Josh asks. Your fountain of youth doesn't seem to have run dry yet, observes Ames, sneaking a look at Reese's face as they move into a shady eddy in the slowly drifting current of idlers taking in the April sun of Prospect Park. She looks to him much as she had in her twenties. In fact, she's softer even in her lavender and white check dress, she flaunts that pear shape that women's magazines identify as a body type one must dress carefully to flatteringly de-emphasize, but that Reese always not so quietly prized as a marker of uncommon passability. His own period of softly estrogenated vampire skin had slowed the onset of cracks and furrows, but when his skin roughened again and the stubble poked through once more, a few grey scouts had camped among the darker hairs. He had carefully shaved them this morning. Both as a man hiding any signs of aging before he sees an ex for the first time in years, and confusingly, out of a dormant sense of competitiveness, an urge to show himself off as still a beauty. 
Your own estrogen levels seem to have run low, Reese says, but without much venom, like she's too tired for niceties, rather than really trying to hurt him. I'm told my crow's feet are dashing. Reese sighs. I don't want to talk about how you look, Amy. I'm not going to do that. Of course. That's fair. He ignores the Amy part. The name doesn't offend him, it's just a name no one says anymore. I just wanted you to know you look great. Reese shrugs, then licks the edge of the ice cream sandwich he had brought her. Her disinterest surprises him. He had figured on the compliment mattering to her. Hey, he says, affecting a light tone, I'm putting myself out there, admitting how great you look. She gives him a look like he's just stepped off a spaceship. Oh, she says finally, I get it. You were giving me that compliment as a guy. You're used to women acknowledging compliments like you're a guy. It's true. His compliments tend to have, at a minimum, the effect of being noticed. She performs a gruesome parody of batting her lashes and clutching her heart. My stars. Lil all me? All right, Reese. You're lucky I even agreed to come here. You're not getting a boy crazy teenager on top of it. I can see that. They had first met at a picnic here. A trans lady picnic. He still had his apartment near the north side of Prospect Park. The one they had lived in together. Over time his memories with Reese in the park had been replaced by new ones. The places where he jogged, where he read by the pond, or watched birds hoping for one of the red-tailed hawks that nested there, often settling for an escaped songbird, or, if hard-pressed, a swan. But seeing Reese reframes everything, conjures up the past. He can't quite figure out if she suggested meeting him here as a tactical move. Something to throw off his confidence. He can feel the lack of their prior intimacy though whether or not that absent closeness is forever gone or like a child playing hide-and-go-seek, he's not quite sure. The rusty hinge of a grackle sounds from the trees overhead. He's about to apologize, to say that he made a mistake and go home, when she offers him the ice cream sandwich. For the first time all afternoon, she lowers her guard, with something like a smile. Look, she says. I played along a little. I waited with those other women and let you buy me ice cream like we were just another hetero couple out on our hetero Sunday date with the boringly hetero idea to go to the park. Now have some ice cream, I don't want to eat all of it. He takes a bite, and she pulls it back. One thing I'll tell you, though, she says. You move differently than before. Move differently? Yeah, you were always graceful but you used to be so careful to swing your hips. You were a languid boy, who learned to move like a woman, who then learned to move like a boy again, but without wiping your hard drive each time. You've got all these glitches in the way you move. I was watching you in the ice cream line you slither. Wow, Reese, just wow. No. It's charismatic. Remember how Johnny Depp pretended to be a drunk Keith Richards pretending to be a fae pirate? You can't help but be a little drawn in, like, what's going on with that one? She smiles at him and takes a lick of ice cream, mock innocent. I forget what it's like being around trans women, he admits. That for once, I'm not the only one constantly analyzing the gender dynamics of every situation to play my role. Welcome back she says, seeming considerably cheered. You must have also forgotten that I taught you everything you know. Please. The student surpassed the master long ago. Girl, you wish. It's like coming home, that quick girl. Something warmer and sweeter than the spring sun heating his neck and the ice cream lingering on his tongue. It's scary seductive, emphasis on scary. Start looking for that kind of comfort and he's bound to make a fool of himself. The temptation to beg for inclusion pulled at him every time he spotted a trans woman on the street, on the train. A stab of need for recognition by her. 
Most apostates must feel similar, whether Amish, Muslim, ex-gay, whatever. Back when he lived as a trans woman, hardly anyone spoke about detransition. It was treated as the purview of conversion therapists and tabloid headlines, he was a man, then a woman, then back to a man. The topic of detransition was boring the reasons for it were never complex, life as a trans woman was difficult and so people gave up. Even worse, to discuss the possibility of detransition gave hope to the lunacy of bigots who wished that trans women would simply detransition, i.e., cease to exist in any kind of visible, and hence meaningful, way. He went two years as a woman before he met a truly detransitioned person. Amy was at a queer dance party with Reese and six other trans women. Defensively, they'd claimed a small corner of the room a section then promptly quarantined for disinterest by the gays and trans masks and CIS women. So once again, the conversation among the trans women was the same as it always was at queer dance parties, figuring out new ways to complain how we look fucking hot. Why is everyone ignoring us? It was a topic that, as the drinks lowered inhibitions and standards, gave way to pairing off and hooking up with each other. Except at that particular dance, halfway through the monologues about being ignored, Amy couldn't help but notice that they actually weren't being ignored. A plump man in his early thirties with a weak old beard had leaned in, and was laughing and shaking his head knowingly. Amy waited for someone to say, fuck off, chaser. But no one made eye contact with him. Instead, they made space for him with an air of resigned indulgence. It was as if he were an apparition whom they all could see but no one wanted to acknowledge not because the haunting frightened them, but because the ghost had a tendency to interpret any attention paid to him as an invitation to once again repeat the embarrassing story of how he died practicing autoerotic asphyxiation. Two obviously straight girls who had clearly dressed up in fishnets for the queer party and were about a decade or so younger than the man, brought him a drink. Yes, one of the trans women, let her interest flick briefly toward them, but pulled it away when she saw to whom they delivered the drink, an untouchable so pitiable and contagious that even the giddy proximate cleavage of overeager twenty-year-olds had been marked for bottom. Finally Amy pulled Reese aside. Who is that dude? Reese waved her hand. Ah. No, tell me. Who? I guess he calls himself William now. He detransitioned but still shows up to hang out with trans women occasionally. Really? Amy couldn't hide her curiosity. Yeah. I guess he still shows up to group therapy and stuff. His. Reese couldn't find the word. It's just sad. When William went outside, Amy slunk away to follow him a few moments later. She found him half a block away, smoking a cigarette. You're William, she asked. William was quite drunk. Too drunk to speak in grammatical sentences. But his face lit up at her attention in a way that hurt Amy to examine directly. She watched his cigarette instead of his face. Tried not to notice the soft and pupil quality to his body. Here's what Amy got from the conversation, he'd lived as a trans woman for seven years. But it was too hard. Too hard. He didn't pass. He wanted to die. He was still a trans woman. Everybody saw it, no matter what he did, but since he wouldn't say so, they couldn't either. He had a good job now. Medical supply distribution. He lived on Staten Island with those two young girls. He drove them to the party tonight and helped them get dressed. He didn't touch them, don't worry. He just liked being one of the girls. The cigarette looped in his hands, inscribing arcs of red in the night as he talked. Amy focused on the tip as if it were writing secret messages just for her. The more he spoke, the more Amy understood the polite, unsettling disdain the other trans women had shown him. She wanted to be anywhere but standing there listening to him. Pity teetered on the precipice of disgust. When Amy detransitioned herself, she promised never to let anyone see her as she had seen William that night. Never to pant for inclusion from trans women. 
Ames wanted no pity and rejected their disgust. But despite Ames's rigid need for dignity, for all the careful lines he drew to respect the differences in how he lived and how trans women lived, they called to him in a siren song. Whenever a girl passed, the William inside of him begged to be let free, to run toward her pleading pathetically to be noticed, to bask in every moment of her ichdart attention. The obvious answer to keeping other girls' pity and disgust at bay had been the hardest the addict's moment of clarity, cut off those girls' cold turkey. Because a single indulgence, and you're William. The past is past to everyone but ghosts. Except now, hear the whispered call, feel that ache, girl, you wish. A temporary chain-link fence rises behind the bench on which they sit in the park, casting fish-scale shadows on Reese's shoulders and face. Okay, daddy-o, so you got some woman pregnant, Reese says. I'm still waiting for what that has to do with me. The daddy-o indicates half his work of explanation is done. The insult would have no bite if she thought he had come to terms with fatherhood. Come on, Reese. Just be civil. Daddy, Reese says. You might as well get used to hearing it. Not if you'd listen instead of taking shots at me. Reese pulls back. What do I have to do with it? So far as I can tell, I'm not taking shots at you. I'm defending myself from whatever you called me here to rub in my face. You have everything to do with it. Ames's voice rises into an exasperated near shout so that a couple of passing college girls, maybe a little tipsy, stare at him, then make wide eyes at each other and glance at Reese like, you poor woman. This is how Reese has always fought with him. Preemptive defense. Ames puts his hands on his lap, with the palms facing up. A few months ago, he'd seen an interview with the actress Winona Ryder in which she said that when she wanted to appear unthreatening in her films, she often sat with her hands folded palms up on her lap, because this communicated openness and vulnerability, a gesture that Ryder had credited for her reputation as delicate. Ames has been trying out the gesture ever since, in an attempt to diffuse arguments, especially ones where maleness comes across as threatening. Carefully and quietly, he says, I'm trying to tell you that I want you to consider being a mother to this baby. Last week, after Katrina showed him the pregnancy test, he went home and lay in bed like a morose sea lion, moving only to scan through, yet again, Katrina's only social media account Instagram. After gazing at Katrina's face for an hour, he pulled up Reese's account, as was his habit when lonely or distressed, a habit he'd never quite been able to break. If he went far enough down in her feed, there were pictures of her from when they lived together all the pictures with him were erased of course, but in many others, he knew that he was standing just off frame. Looking at a shot of her wearing bunny ears from an Easter morning in their apartment, he tried to predict a scoffing reply were he to tell her that he was a father. In that exercise, he was surprised to brush, for the first time in hours, against a feeling like hope. It had only ever been through her, with her that he could imagine parenthood. Why not again? Reese the trans woman from whom he'd learned about womanhood would see his fatherhood and dismiss it. To her, he would always be a woman. By borrowing her vantage, he could almost see himself as a parent, perhaps one way to tolerate being a father would be to have her constant presence assuring him that he was actually not one. This possibility dovetailed with what he wanted anyway to be family with Reese once more, in some way. So why not in parenthood? Was it such a wild proposal to contemplate? Were Reese to help raise the child too, everyone would get what they wanted. Katrina would have a commitment to family from her lover, Reese would get a baby, and he, well, he'd get to live up to what they both hoped he could be by being what he already was, a woman but not, a father but not. What? You want me to consider being a mother to this baby? Reese does not have her palms facing up. That doesn't even make sense. Yes it does. Listen to me. But Ames has not fully convinced himself that his plan makes sense either, that he isn't speaking out of a deluded panic. 
that the game pieces for Katrina and Reese that he has been pushing around his mental chessboard bear only dubious relation to the movements possible by the actual Katrina and Reese. He, he laid it out. Katrina wanted him to be a father. If Ames could not, in fact, be a father, then Katrina did not relish the idea of being a single parent, and would schedule an abortion. Ames, for his part, wanted to stay with Katrina, and he could envision himself becoming a parent, but not a father. He knew, however, that Katrina didn't have the queer background to allow for that distinction, and that despite all his best intentions, she would default to the assumptions inherent in a man and a woman raising a child together. Unless he could find a way to escape the gravity of the nuclear family, no matter what he called himself, he'd end up a father. He didn't need to explain this to Reese. She knew that no matter how you self-identify ultimately, chances are that you succumb to becoming what the world treats you as. That's where you come in, Ames says, allowing for few pauses so that Reese couldn't interrupt him until he got it all out. I want you to raise a baby with me, and Katrina. With three of us, it'll be confusing enough to break the family thing. Katrina won't know how to see me as anything but a father, but you will, and speaking from experience, your vision, your way of seeing things is infective. Together, maybe we could be a family that works. Reese says nothing. Think about it, Reese. You could be a mother. You could raise a child. Like we always wanted. I'm going to get up and leave, Reese says finally. You've lost it. I thought I couldn't be shocked by your dumbass transformations anymore but even I couldn't have predicted that you'd come back to me proposing to become a bigamist. What the actual fuck? But she doesn't get up and leave. She doesn't move at all. He catches his breath, waiting for her to say no, to say that she'd never raise a kid with him, to close the door on the best offer he'd ever have to put on the table. If she wouldn't accept motherhood from him, she'd never accept anything. Is that how little you think of me? Reese continues after a minute. That I'd accept some second-rate motherhood. And meanwhile, why the fuck would this other woman carry a baby for a transsexual and an ex-transsexual? Who is this woman? What's wrong with her? No nothing is wrong with her. I don't even know if she'll be open to the idea. I haven't proposed it. Oh my god, you came to me first. You absolute psychopath. She can say no. You can say no. Who is she? And so Ames gives the particulars, the way you might introduce yourself to a new acquaintance, your work, where you're from and if you're a New Yorker, your neighborhood, and maybe, if your Samfroid is really pumping, your age. For Katrina, Ames reports these variables as, his boss at the ad agency, She's from Vermont but has lived in New York since college, she's got a two-bedroom in Brooklyn, and she's 39, she had a miscarriage before. But having repeated these facts, Ames feels like he hasn't said anything important, anything that captures Katrina at all, or why he thinks she'd share raising a baby. A dog bounds toward Reese, interrupting his explanation. Reese gives the dog a pet and the dog's owner apologizes. In refocusing on what he had been about to say, Ames attempts to dispel from his mind the slivers of moments, opinions, and impressions particular to his intimacy with Katrina that obscure the bold plain structures of her, in order to describe her as a dispassionate stranger might see her. When I first met Katrina, he says, she seemed kind of basic to me. Maybe it was because she was my boss and so that was part of her professional distance. But as I got to know her, I came to see her basicness as a disguise, or a defense mechanism. But not something conniving or intentional. It's more like she's led all this weirdness together in her life experiences, from growing up in Vermont, then leaving her husband, and just a fundamentally idiosyncratic personality, and then, as though she's shy about it and doesn't want anyone to notice, she'll cover that with being a foodie and doing pilates or whatever. But underneath, she's wild. Not at all conventional. She might go for this. 
What's she look like? I want to picture her, Reese says. He considers pulling out his phone to show her a photo, but he doesn't really want to get into a moment where Reese is comparing herself or evaluating the looks of another woman. She's average height, kind of delicate. Really cute toes. You perv. That doesn't help me see her. Is she a blonde? You always liked blondes. No, no, straight brown hair. She's mixed race, actually. Her mom is Chinese and her dad is Jewish. But she got her dad's last name, Petrogelic, and freckles all across her nose, so she passes as white with white people. In Vermont, she grew up with only white kids around, so she says it was a shock when she went to Amherst and other Asian kids immediately recognized her as Asian. Reese laughs. Of course that would be the case. Same story, different minority, no matter how easily she passed a CIS among the CIS, passing a CIS among other trans women never happened they had trained their entire lives to see signs of transness, and hope alone dictated that they would detect those signs in Reese. Great, she and I already have something in common, Reese says. We're both almost CIS white ladies. Ames had had more than a couple of conversations with Katrina about race and Katrina always expressed a sense of dismay about her passing. Yeah, you two both pass. But I don't know if she's as aspirational about it as you are. Almost the opposite, I gather she feels something lost by her passing as a white lady. She grew up entirely in Vermont. Yeah, yeah. But not just Vermont, like, rural, back to the land Vermont. They didn't even have a TV until she was a teenager. Prime Val She loves pop culture, the way kids whose parents didn't let them have sugar love candy. Katrina's stories from her early childhood struck Ames as cribbed from a cautionary post-hippie novel. The kind of story where idealistic types end up starving out on a commune somewhere, flower crowns wilting to reveal a grim human nature hidden beneath. In first-generation style, Katrina's mother, Maya, had staged a twofold rebellion against her immigrant parents. First, Maya insisted upon becoming an artist, and second she met in an art history class, and later insisted upon marrying, a Jewish kid from Brooklyn named Isaac. Before college, Isaac's Zionist parents sent him to live on a kibbutz in Israel for a year. At 18, he volunteered for the Israeli military service, which nearly lost him his U.S. citizenship. Within the year, he found himself participating in the incursions into Lebanon that came to be known as the 1978 Operation Litani, a participation which, to his parents' great dismay, disillusioned him to Zionism and, in the process, religion in general. He returned home with signs of what might now be called PTSD and convinced that his stint in the promised land made him some kind of farmer. This conviction remained with him throughout his romance with Maya, through his dropping out of college to elope with her, until at last, he spent an inheritance from his maternal grandmother on a tract of land in Vermont. At that point, as close to being a farmer as he'd ever been, he moved his newly pregnant wife away from her disapproving family to a drafty farmhouse on 20 acres of granite hills not far from the border with New Hampshire, promising to convert the back porch into a light-filled art studio for her work. After a couple of poor seasons trying to raise vegetables and sell them to restaurants and farmers markets, Isaac met a man who introduced him to a Danish system of raising mink for fur. So for the majority of her childhood, Katrina lived on a mink farm, where her daily chores included feeding a mixture of pured meat and dried fish to hundreds of slinky river predators stacked in 24 by 48 inch cages. Fur is really so gross, Reese says. I'm lucky I could never afford a fur coat, because that kind of raw barbarism is a little bit sexy. I wouldn't be able to resist flaunting it. Yeah, Ames agrees. She has a picture on Facebook, from like 8th grade, where she skinned a mink in front of the class as her science project. The student newspaper took the photo. It's like, of a pretty, 
gawky girl smiling in front of a pile of red gore. Horrifying, says Reese happily. No wonder she pretends to be normcore now. Ames's favorite story from Katrina's childhood was the one where a young black bear broke through a screen window and into their house while the family was out. The bear crashed around the kitchen, broke two bottles of red wine, then trod through the resulting wine puddle, leaving red paw prints all over the 70s white carpet and cream-colored couch. Isaac came home and, enraged at the property damage, charged around the house brandishing a fire poker, convinced that he had the skills to engage a bear in combat. Maya, by contrast, arrived home carrying Katrina in one of those toddler backslings and clapped her hands in delight. Mink pelts were never as lucrative as Isaac had been promised by mink breeders, and so the couple faced dire finances at times throughout Katrina's childhood. Within two weeks, Maya had sold the poor printed couch to some rich New Yorkers with a nearby ski lodge, who displayed it in a position of honor, the perfect conversation piece for their friends to admire. In fact, the couch sale was so lucrative that Maya forged a bear paw, poured out another bottle of red wine, and embellished the bear's paw route to include two other chairs that she went on to sell. Ha, huh, says Reese. When I tortured myself thinking about what women you'd love instead of me, a rural Jewish Chinese mink farmer was not what I came up with. My stereotyping has failed me. I'm not sure she's so happy I've picked her either. So why does she put up with you, may I ask? My rugged masculine good looks, obviously. Reese scoffs. He's still too pretty by half the once rhinoplastoperfect nose now broken but still delicate, and those light blue eyes that, in old photos, would have come out empty white, one of those colors that required photographic technology to evolve before it could be captured on film. Is she queer at all, this woman? Ames had thought a fair amount about this. I don't think she appreciates queerness so much as she came to feel ambivalent about heterosexuality. I know those two aren't the same thing. She's attracted to masculine bodies, of that I'm sure. He flicks his wrist in a semi-ironic indication of his own now curved depleted body as evidence. Although perhaps not men as a class. A lot of what she liked about me, she says, is how different I am from the other men she's dated. I think what she might be attracted to is my gender, the traces of queerness about me with me she gets queerness without ever having to name it or dredge up any attraction to women. But now that she knows I was once a transsexual, she acts like it's the only reason I am how I am. Everything she liked about me before is suddenly fraught. She's not taking it well. And it's true, she hasn't been. She declines his calls, and speaks to him only enough to keep up appearances at work. A few days after he told her, he caught her staring at him across a conference table, her eyes almost unfocused, the way one stares to make sense of an optical illusion. He recognized what she was doing, she was making him into a woman in her mind, an exercise that he'd done countless times himself but in reverse the ugly involuntary method by which his hateful vision broke a trans woman's face down into component parts, then remodeled them in the brain to strip away the apparent feminization and see what she had looked like before transition. His brain was an asshole, because the result of this exercise was to triple his insecurity. Given how easily and involuntarily he did it, even while aware of the high fucked up quotient, he imagined how frequently other people without his sensitivity had done it to him. He guessed that his take on Katrina's queerness was one that would predispose Reese to at least not hate Katrina. The mention of motherhood would have softened Reese up, and now he finished her off with secret moments of weird gender feels or confused faggotry, Reese's bread and butter. I get it, Reese says when he finishes. So everything is upside down for her, right? Post divorce, now she's pregnant. She's kind of a weirdo, and she's unsure about what she wants. She's questioning herself. And so you're thinking she might just let you invite another woman to raise your baby with her. Don't make me sound so sinister, Ames responds. 
but he has presented the argument with a sinister cast in an appeal to Reese's sensibilities. It hurts less to discuss a baby that she would desperately want to love and raise in the same way that Cruella de Vil discusses puppies. Please. You come up with the most fucked up shit, Reese says. You are so weird and devious, even when you were doing that Martha Stewart thing you did with me, and definitely while you're doing this fake CIS thing. But I get why you think it will work. You pitch her on the idea while she's confused and trying to figure out a new way of seeing the world. Isn't that right? Isn't that your plan? No. I actually want to do this right. Be good to her. I think this gives her every option an extra option, even. If she wants to raise a baby on her own, I'll pay child support and do what I can. If she wants an abortion, obviously I will support that. And finally, if she wants me as a father, I will say yes, and then propose that you enter our lives. Ah, says Reese. Once again, Reese is your plan C. I'm doing my best here, Reese. I can't force her to do anything. I don't even want to do that. The thing I am totally against, however, is the outcome where she gets an abortion, then she hates me, while you go on hating me too. The everyone hates me option, which, frankly, is looking the most likely. I want to avoid that. Reese made a scoffing noise. That's only the worst outcome for you. Maybe for us, being free of you would be ideal. And then you'll pass up yet another chance to be a mother. Reese flinches slightly and doesn't respond. Reese, Ames continues, I'm sorry I can't promise anything. But I'm asking you to consider an option where you're a mother. I'm here. I'm entertaining you, even if this is so messed up. But now Reese puts two fingers on his shirt I have questions. Tell the truth. Do you love her? I want good things for her. I for sure don't want to hurt her. Answer my question, Amy. Yes. I love her. We don't say the word love to each other. But I love her. He can't seem to make eye contact, and instead peers upward at the breeze rustling through the leaves above. Second question. Do you still love me? This was Maximum Reese. Asking such a thing at the moment when she had the ultimate advantage when he'd just laid out his feelings for another woman. Yes and no. Some days I still love you and some days I don't. Reese waited, sensing there was more. So he let her have as much of the truth as he could bear. But the days I don't love you, I have to work hard to make those days happen. The days I do require nothing of me. You were the most important person in my life for so long, and then, then everything went wrong and we just disappeared to each other. When I think about raising this child with you, well, it feels like a kind of redemption. Romantically, fuck, who knows if we would ever be right for each other again. It all fell apart so badly that I hesitate to even hope for that. But if we weren't meant to be lovers, it doesn't mean that we weren't meant to be family. Every single time I remember the state of things between us, I want to cry. I thought it would fade, but it hasn't, it's just changed. If we don't try again, it's like our time together, not only did it end, it was like it never was. You're the one who disappeared, Amy. Look at yourself. He rushes on, over her comment, afraid to lose the moment. But that's why I'm trying to see this as an opportunity. Right? What if we could make those years together into something new? All of our past could be the groundwork for something lasting. Reese puffs up her cheeks and blows out a little foot. She shakes her head, almost in wonder, and then an abrupt grin cracks her face. You know what, Amy? I think the best way to get back at you is to say yes to this offer, and then watch you struggle to figure it all out from a front row seat. So fuck you, my love. Yes, I will consider it. Consider it.
Yes, go ask this other woman, Katrina, to split her unborn child with a transsexual. I fully expect that she will murder you for the suggestion, for which I will take a portion of the credit without having to risk jail. If you are still alive in a week, we'll take it from there. Ames grips his own hands tightly. So you accept? I already said yes. Her voice betrays too much sincerity, and she worries that Ames can hear the naked hope that has already entangled her. He says nothing more, so she smacks him on the thigh, laughs a short nervous laugh, and then puts her face in her palm and mumbles, mostly to herself, actually this might be the most trans way of getting me pregnant. Chapter 2 Eight years before conception Reese was Twenty-six. the first time a man hit her as a man will sometimes hit a woman, not to injure her, necessarily, but to show her something. The blow, an open-handed hook, caught her as she opened her mouth to insult him. She hadn't seen his hand coming. Her head jerked back. Her vision wavered. Surprise turned to pain, which in turn surprised her with its force. Really? she asked quietly. He coiled his muscles tight again, as if to show her that yes, really. If she had it all to do over, she would have spat at him. But her body, which did not like pain, betrayed her, and without thinking, she flinched and blurted out, I'm sorry. Satisfied, his shoulders dropped. Copper trickled thinly from a split lip into the cracks between her teeth. She probed the edges of the cut with her tongue while her hands hung motionless at her sides, the stillness of an animal-turned-statue before a predator. Somewhere distant from her traitorous body, a covert part of her mind slipped away to calculate her advantage. Already she saw the doubt gathering across his face, the regret and worry that he'd hit her too hard. Already, in the cool distance, she saw how this would play out, she would make him suffer for this. She'd chip away at his self-image of a calm, assured, stoic man, ever in control of his wall, unable to be goaded. She'd make him guilty, she'd make him doubt, she'd hint at abuse. When the animal part of her body had calmed itself, when the pain had turned to memory, she supposed she'd finger the bruise, almost voluptuously, her trophy from a grim victory, his name was Stanley, and he was a rich man in his late thirties who didn't like dogs. That he didn't like dogs was one of the things Reese decided was important about his character. When she told her friend Iris his name, Iris said that there was no such thing as a good Stanley. That the name is a curse that parents place upon a son to ensure the boy grows up to become a douche. Reese knew her Stanley was a douche. Reese desired him, but she wouldn't say that she liked him. She liked his jealousy his controlling behavior, the way he told her how to dress. She liked seeing herself through his eyes, vulnerable, fragile, prone to the most exasperatingly feminine qualities he made fun of her for being obsessed with her looks, for flightiness, dreaminess, and her highly subjective and associative takes on the workings of the world. She liked how he called her a whore, then bought her expensive gifts. Rub his leg, ask for a new dress, get called a bimbo, go shopping for the dress. She liked how infatuated with her he had become, and how much he resented his own infatuation. The more he demeaned her, she knew, the more she'd hooked him. And so goading him into anger took on an unctuous, dangerous pleasure. Her friends hated him. Only Iris, she of the gorgeous blonde hair and the party habit, who frequently disappeared into two- or three-day meth-fueled sex benders, really understood why Reese kept digging in deeper with Stanley. I want to drive men crazy, Iris said in her customary arch manner. I want men to suffer. I want a man to love me so much he murders me. I want to die because I'm loved too much for him to tolerate my existence. Reese didn't want to die. Compared to Iris, Reese felt like she was only playing at this sort of psychodrama Fisher Price, my first abusive man, whereas Iris only had time for abusive men. Iris had a doll's eyes and a practiced Marilyn Monroe giggle. She'd been an English major at Brown before she had transitioned, 
but refused to read any books afterward, and instead presented vacant ambitions in which she could remain an object, get discovered and be a movie star, become a Lana Del Rey song personified. In the post methlows she spoke in other images, laced with serotonin-depleted terror and an almost prideful insistence on describing her own actions in the passive voice, being pimped, having my pussy pledged, spending days in adult semi-captivity among faceless men who made me addicted, who owned me, who fucked me limp, whose lives depend on my body. The dreamy way that Iris talked about what should have been horror made Reese jealous. Before Stanley, Reese's own sex games only flirted with possession, and alone with her Hitachi, images from Iris's stories kept making cameos in her fantasies. Hands on her throat. Slaps to her face. Fight leaving her body. To Iris, though, Reese said little, other than woe. Once, Reese asked Iris if she needed help, to get away from those men. In response, Iris grimaced and said, it's not like that. And for once, Reese, the transsexual who hadn't gone to college, much less brown, was embarrassed by her sensibilities, as she clutched her pearls, primly imagining the sensationalism of an SVU episode featuring sex trafficking instead of whatever Iris actually got, emotionally or otherwise, from the men with whom she disappeared. It was the same tone of uninformed concern that older CIS people used with Reese when they discovered she was a transsexual, oh dear, your life must really not be okay. The response always surprised them. I chose this. I want it. It makes me feel right. Whatever Iris was getting, Iris got it because she found in it something she wanted and Iris had shared it with Reese, because she had sensed that lurking in an unspoken place Reese craved something kindred. The least Reese could do was to be honest, to not pretend like she didn't understand the chaos that separated what can be wanted and what can be said. Consider for a moment Reese's own damage, she met Stanley on a fetish site with the word tranny in its name. During that period of her life, Reese only ever dated on fetish sites. She disdained the trans girls who disdained tranny chasers. It's stupid to rule out every single man who has come to the understanding that he desires your body. It's a mark of prudish inexperience to think that being fetishized and objectified isn't the hottest thing going in the bedroom. Reese's dating practice prescribed that the only chasers you had to avoid were the crypto trans women, the ones who want to be women but are too closeted to handle it, and so they live their fantasies through you. You can feel it when you're with a crypto trans. A crypto trans has to evacuate you, your personhood, to use you, to fantasize that he is you getting fucked even as he fucks you. You're just a body for him to live through vicariously. It's the most alienating thing in the world. It's like being psychically worn. Like you're a glove. Reese fled at the first sign of a crypto trans. She wished they'd just become ladies and stop being so weird. But every other chaser. Why bother convincing clueless, gun shy boys on OK Cupid of the sexiness of a girl with a cop when there are thousands of men out there who already know it, and among whom you get to have your pick? Want a movie star? You can have one, albeit a B-lister if you're willing to satisfy a guy's curiosity about bottoming for a transsexual, otherwise a C-lister. Want a tech scion to show you his yacht? Great. The ones with powerboats are best, guys with sailboats will make you pull random ropes, and to imagine yourself as a cool Jackie O is one aspirational self-delusion too far. Want a walking Bruce Weber photograph with washboard abs cut so deep it looks like he's constantly sidelit? Take a couple of male models and save one for later. The only thing you can't have is a decent guy who will take you home for Thanksgiving dinner, but you're not going to get that off a non-fetish site either, so at least have the good sex. How many girls did Reese know who, to prove to themselves that they could be just like every other woman? found themselves sifting through thousands of men on some straight dating site, looking for the non-horrible ones a task that even CIS women find awful. And then, how many times had Reese heard about these girls who wasted hours, days, weeks, 
months trying to find one of the non-horrible ones who would be willing to give a trans woman a try, only to finally end up in his bedroom, standing exposed with only a stupid lacy lingerie set for armor, as he sized up the new to him proportions of slender hips to wider shoulders, and nervously muttered that it's not for him. No, no way. That shit is way more traumatic than running into any chaser. Go to a fetish site for men who already know they want a trans girl, and select a decent one from among the many begging for you. In matters of the heart, Reese had one firm maxim, you don't get to choose who you fuck, you get to choose from among those who want to fuck you. She found Stanley on the most embarrassing of her many embarrassing fetish sites a site that hadn't updated its technology, much less its design, since the era of Web 1.0 but on which she reliably pulled all sorts of guys who didn't know enough about the queer world to look elsewhere for the kind of submissive trans girls they'd seen in porn but never in the bars they frequented. On their first date, he showed off by taking her to a Jean George's restaurant. He picked out a bottle of French Bordeaux from a separate section of the menu, where the prices were so high that they were vaguely shameful and had to be tucked in at the end, like the ads for dominatrices in the back pages of free weeklies. After an appropriate period of chit-chat, she asked her standard opening question, so tell me about your previous experience with trans girls. I've always liked trans girls, but my experience has just been escorts, he replied, then paused. I've had ongoing things with escorts, but in the end, those always made me feel bad. Because you don't like paying for sex. He blinked. No. I don't mind paying for sex. Then without effect, so she couldn't tell if it was a joke, he added, what do you think this dinner is? Without seeming to register her aghast face, he continued, the problem for me with trans escorts is that they all want vaginas. Most of the ones I met were doing it to make money until they could get one. It made me feel bad. I want to see that little bulge, and they all wanted to get rid of it that's why I went to that site. I figured anyone calling themselves a sissy or tranny had probably come to terms with her cock. He broke a piece of bread with his hands and popped it into his mouth. Reese continued to stare, unable to formulate a response. He said, come on, you asked me a blunt question about my sexual past and sexuality. I gave you a blunt answer. It's your turn. Don't act demure now. Do you want a vagina? He had blue eyes in a big bland face, shaggy hair, and was dressed like he planned to be photographed for a lifestyle magazine for wealthy understated men interested in birdwatching or some other non-vigorous outdoor activity, in a wax canvas barber jacket with many pockets and a heavily cabled turtleneck. When they met on the street, she joked that she was expecting a Wall Street guy in a suit. Those are the sellers. The bankers. Guys who want money, he said dismissively. I represent the buyers. The guys who already have money. I could show up to work in my swim trunks. Even Reese knew enough about finance to recognize this as a suspect oversimplification, but it sounded so much like a line from Glengarry Glen Ross that Reese merely said, Wow. And even she was unsure if that wow was because he had impressed her with his confidence or because she had never heard such a cliched performance delivered with so little irony so soon after an introduction. I sometimes want bottom surgery, Reese said. When I turned 18, I got some money that my grandmother left for me. It was about two thirds of what I needed to go to Thailand and get one. Instead, I spent it on a road trip with a boyfriend and moving to New York. I got a job here in a daycare, then as a server, and I figured that it'd be years before I could afford surgery working as a waitress, so I've worked to get comfortable with the idea that I have a penis, but that it's a woman's penis. I'm pretty much there, mentally. It helps that I grew up watching trans porn. I watched way more trans girls getting fucked than CIS women, so I think I internalized the idea of trans women with cocks as the hottest, most feminine women out there. I like that, Stanley said, and grinned for the first time. I could see you as a hot Jersey housewife. 
I want to put you in a pair of yoga pants, tight enough that you can't hide your cock. Reese really liked wearing yoga pants, but his interest in her penis so early in the date meant that she wasn't yet going to give him the satisfaction of saying so. She wondered if he'd somehow gotten confused. She'd clearly stated that she was a strict bottom on the fetish site. You know I don't top, right? What? Of course not. I don't want that. Okay, well you had so much interest in my junk. I'm interested in everything decorative on a woman. Referring to Reese's genitals as purely decorative was an objectively asshole thing to say. But instead of being offended, she was turned on. The waiter stopped by the table at this moment to refill Reese's wine glass, and Reese inadvertently blushed, unsure what he had heard. Meanwhile, Stanley was saying, I like dressing up women, controlling them. It's never role play. The waiter set down the bottle and departed with a maximum of discretion. Wait, what's not role play? Reese asked. He looked at her sharply. You need to listen better. The whole dominant thing. That's just who I naturally am. I don't need protocols, or bullshit like that. I want the subjugation to be real. But the only politically acceptable way to subjugate women is financially. Because women want that subjugation themselves. One thing I liked about those trans escorts was how easily I bought them. She had long since discovered that most talk about owning her turned her stomach liquid with desire. But at that moment, she had $400 in her bank account cracks webbed her phone screen, she needed a plane ticket to see her mother, and just as the items she needed weren't sexy, the idea of trading subservience for them wasn't that sexy either. It wasn't her fault that people paid finance douches millions and no one wanted to hire an uneducated transsexual. She had a funny cause it's true joke that she liked to ask whenever she met a new trans girl. So which of the three transsexual jobs do you do? Computer programmer, esthetician, or prostitute? Reese always hoped the answer would be prostitute, because prostitutes were the ones with a good sense of humor. Subjugation is fun in bed, Reese snapped back at Stanley. Women don't want that anywhere else especially not poor trans girls who don't have any choice. He darkened and told her to sit up straight, that she had bad posture. She did as he said, feeling self-conscious and humiliated but not in a fun way and resolved to order only a salad, since this date would clearly be their last. She couldn't afford to split the meal, but she wanted to make a show of non-obligation. When the food came, he criticized her use of utensils. You don't come to a nice restaurant and then eat like a slob. Didn't anyone teach you? He held his fork in his left hand tines down. See? Like this. I know how to eat. I work as a waitress. Know where I'd want to eat. She glared at him. But when she tried to use her fork tines down, she couldn't manage it. Not because she couldn't eat that way, but because he had intended to humiliate her, and had succeeded, which threw off her coordination. In trying to pick up a piece of flaking salmon from her salad, she shredded it into tiny bits too small to be speared on the tines. She blushed, set down the utensils, and took a sip of water. Oh, just eat your normal way. This is embarrassing to watch, Stanley said. But you need to practice your etiquette. Unless you want me to cut your food for you and you can use a spoon. Having sufficiently humbled her, he grew friendlier, conspicuously popping chunks of steak into his mouth, speared tines down. On the way out, he wrapped a sudden arm around her and gave the side of her face a bizarre kiss, closer to a nuzzle than anything else, and then pressed a fifty on her, saying, It's late, take a taxi. Reese hesitated, then pocketed the fifty waited until the car he'd ordered arrived to take him home, and then walked to the train. No way was she wasting 50 bucks on what could be a $2.25 subway fare, with only one transfer on the way.
The next morning, she woke up to an Amazon gift certificate for $500 delivered to the email account she used for fetish site communiques. He'd sent it with a note. I saw you didn't get a car home, even though I gave you money for one. I wasn't paying for the pleasure of your company, but since that seems to be what you want from me, despite your little outburst to the contrary, I've sent you what I think you're worth. Use it to buy some yoga pants to please me, and do whatever you wish with the rest. She entered the code into Amazon, and considered doing as she had done with the 50, buying the cheapest pair of yoga pants that she could find so that she could pocket the rest. But looking at her options, she decided, fuck it, when unexpected yoga pants come your way, go full Lululemon. She hit the purchase button, and said aloud, I hate him. But, considering it didn't even cross her mind not to buy yoga pants at all, the heat that came over her wasn't only from hate. She replied with a screenshot of the receipt and he wrote back an hour later. God, that was so easy. I didn't even have to work to make you into a whore. I haven't fucked you yet, asshole, she wrote back. He re replied with a second Amazon gift card for the same amount, along with an open table reservation for 7.30pm that Friday to a steakhouse, and the instructions, wear those yoga pants. Don't tuck. I fucking hate him, Reese said aloud again, as she dutifully scheduled the date on her calendar. As she shaved her legs in her cramped tub before the date, she reached down and idly rubbed her shaving cream, covered clit, and said it again. If there is such a thing as a hate fuck, theirs was a hate courtship, with plenty of hate foreplay. One week, in the midst of a January cold snap, he rented her a room at the Ritz Carlton Battery Park near his office. Once he had installed her in the room, he took away her clothes, leaving her only a one-piece swimsuit and the hotel bathrobes, so that she'd freeze if she left. She spent four days looking out at the frigid Hudson River, living off room service and waiting for him to stop by during his breaks to fuck her, or depending on his time constraints, to hold her face into a pillow with one hand, and jerk off onto her back with the other, turned on and resentful the whole time. At night, she invited friends to the room, and they drank bottles of wine on his room service tab, but she followed the rules, and didn't ask to be brought anything else to wear. Stanley had a wife, because of course he did. But the wife hospitalized herself for depression at about the time that Reese was willingly trapped in concubinage at the Ritz. This hospitalization or specifically, her subsequent inpatient treatment for it precipitated a series of conversations between the wife and Stanley about life goals, followed by a sudden separation. In lieu of a long divorce settlement, he promised his ex-wife a sum sufficient to buy a house in Portland, where her sister lived. Within a few weeks the wife had embarked along the Oregon Trail. Stanley told Reese he'd be pushing harder on riskier investments to make up for that unforeseen financial expense. Accordingly, he also told Reese that she should move into his apartment with him, as he didn't want to pay her rent any more something he'd been doing since their third week together. As a child in Madison, Wisconsin, Reese had badly wanted a best friend, someone who was yours and you were his. Her early childhood was one of serial BFF monogamy until sometime in mid-puberty, when the other boys around were made to know in the form of shunning that being paired as a best friend with someone so feminine pointed toward a clear and uncool faggotry. Later Reese re-narrativized the childhood urge. She hadn't wanted a charming, reliable boy for a best friend, she had wanted a charming, reliable boy for a sexual, romantic, and life companion, and simply framed that as friend, the only word available to her. She'd found charming plenty of times, but reliable hadn't come her way. So she found a certain comfort in Stanley's possessiveness, his assumption that she was his to install in an apartment as one installs a new sink. His controlling behavior confirmed how badly he wanted her. Anyone who needed her so close, who assumed the right to know where she was at all times, whom she saw, what she wore, was someone who wasn't going away, someone who could be counted upon, not just despite her transness but for it. This time she felt she'd found reliable, if not charming. Which is how, 
in accepting a 50 on the way out of a restaurant from a guy she had been telling herself looked like a tool who bought scalp tickets to Burning Man, Reese found herself looking at an empty walk-in closet in Stanley's bedroom. It was 35 square feet of recessed halogen-lit floor that amounted to all the physical space in the world over which she held complete dominion and even that space really belonged to Stanley. She stared at the empty hangers and thought about how she really had to get better at fighting back, because she had lost not just the upper hand in this battle of a relationship, but all her other limbs as well. As she thought such things, he pointed to a mirror he had recently hung on the back of the closet door and said, and now, you can spend hours staring at your own reflection, like the parakeet you are. Despite hate fucks that led to a hate courtship that built into a hate relationship, six months passed before Stanley finally hit Reese and split her lip. The question of motive gets dicey, however. Why that moment, and not so many others? Even a mediocre lawyer could establish certain basic facts. Stanley bought Reese a particular pair of expensive designer boots, and she, knowing it would anger him, exchanged them for a pair she preferred. Then, in an attempt to deceive him, she purchased a pair of cheap knockoffs that resembled the original pair, which she endeavored to pass off as the authentic item. Whereupon Stanley immediately recognized the forgery and took her attempted deception as an insult. How dumb did she think he was that he wouldn't notice the difference between some ordered online and sent from China ill-fitting glorified socks, and the $800 Stuart Weitzman signature suede lowland above the knee boots that he had personally picked out and bought for her. It wasn't bad enough that she exchanged his present. Then she went and faked like she hadn't, like she thought he was too stupid to know what he'd held in his hand. No. Fuck that. Slap the bitch. But in the way relationships get twisted, in how lovers or rather, combatants develop their own private language of aggression, the Boots incident was even more complicated than it seemed. In truth, Stanley already knew that Reese would hate the Boots when he picked them out. He bought them for that exact reason to spend money on a luxury designer item that she could never afford on her own, but that she also couldn't enjoy, in order to see the conflict that such a purchase would raise in her. He bought the boots to demonstrate for her a simple calculation of power, she enjoyed living in style, but her dependence on him for that style made him the final arbiter of what she put on her body. As a set of objects, the boots were beautiful, finely stitched in a soft suede the same grey shade as a manatee's hide, lined with satin, and set on a carefully moulded rubber sole, with little sw. S imprinted on the bottom so that as you walk the earth, your steps imprint the designer's initials. But once snugly up a pair of legs, the boots took on a second, more socially fraught function. With their incomprehensible combination of thigh-high length and flat soles, they seemed designed to allow for impossible models to flaunt how their legs refused to end even in what might have passed for the slouchy bottom half of an elephant costume. Reese's legs, by contrast to a supermodel's, would take only a short, truncated journey in those boots, a brief trip that would come to a definitive end in the cul-de-sac of bodily dysphoria. Gigi Hadid wore high flat boots like this, but the squattest of Lucha Libra wrestlers did too. Stanley knew which of the two Reese's cruel dysmorphia would reflect back to her from her parakeet mirror. Yet again, knowing Reese for a brand whore, Stanley expected she would still attempt to wear such expensive boots. However, in a climactic twist that Stanley had not expected, Reese returned the insult. In her own passive aggressive calculus, Reese never meant for Stanley to be deceived when she bought the knockoffs. She meant for him to easily recognize the difference between the designer boots and the poor imitations. She meant to show him that he was just as disposable to her as she was to him, that she had him figured out, and if he fucked with her in any way that she didn't find, at minimum, sexy and fun, she'd take his money and lie to his face. This unexpected declaration of her power, which they both understood to be communicated as an insult according to the rules of their ritualized unfriendliness, is why he slapped her. But in ways that both of them felt but neither could fully admit, the entire saga of the boots that led to the slap was a form of pageantry. Beneath it lay Reese's own sense of womanhood. 
The reason Stanley hit Reese reversed everything both of them wanted to be true, Stanley hit Reese because she wanted him to hit her. Reese wanted to end their games, to get hit in a way that would affirm, once and for all, what she wanted to feel about her womanhood, her delicacy, her helplessness, her infuriating attractiveness. After all, every woman adores a fascist. Reese spent a lifetime observing CIS women confirm their genders through male violence. Watch any movie on the Lifetime channel. Go to any schoolyard. Or just watch your local heterosexuals drinking in a bar. Here women define themselves through pain, or rage against the assumption that they do, which still places pain front and center. Hear the strange sense of satisfaction when they talk about the men who have hurt them the unspoken subtext of it being because I am a woman. The quiet dignity of saying how anytime a man gets a little rough asserting that you are a woman, and thus delicate and capable of sustaining harm. A girl could be twice the size of the man that little Al. Reminds him that he is a man, she is a woman. Once, Reese's friend Catherine was walking home drunk with her boyfriend when he tried to flirt with her by pushing her into a bush. She bounced back out of that bush like an enraged wolverine, spitting, scratching, fighting. For the rest of her relationship with him, he would say, careful, Catherine is aggressive, and Catherine would wince, understanding her womanhood was on the line every time. A good woman, she heard in the subtext, would have stayed in the bush and cried. If only some man would push Reese into a bush, she'd know what to do. Anyone who had shared a hotel room wall with Reese and Stanley could attest that Stanley had laid hands on Reese before. He took his belt to her ass on their second date and told her he wouldn't stop until she cried tears fell after six strokes, she sobbed after eight, and twenty minutes later she shuddered her way to a tectonic orgasm. A few years back, Reese might have thought their play extremely racy, titillating, and far beyond the sexual ken of most women she thought of the desire for violence in sex as some kind of resulting damage from being trans. Then, at around age 23, she watched the Catherine Deneuve film, Belle de Jour, and recognized her own sexuality in the upper crust Belle's secret desire to be mistreated and abused as a whore which meant that the strain of masochism that ran through her sexuality was only as racy as a 50-year-old film that shared a marquee with romances starring Doris Day. Everything about Reese's sexuality, she realized, was banal. Sex at the edge of abuse is banal. And when it comes to gender, consent makes it all pretend, which left consensual violence lacking real value in Reese's tally of gender affirmation. In old books she had read, Reese remembered women saying that if your husband doesn't beat you, he doesn't love you, a notion that horrified the feminist in Reese but fit with a perfect logic in one of the dark crevices of her heart. And yeah, liberal feminists especially the trans-hating variety would have a field day with her. She supposed that they would accuse her of misogyny, of being a secret man, a Trojan horse in slutty lingerie who sought to recapitulate under the guise of womanhood all the abusive tropes that they in the second wave, had sought to put in the past. But you know what? She didn't make the rules of womanhood, like any other girl, she had inherited them. Why should the burden be on her to uphold impeccable feminist politics that barely served her? The New York Times Regularly published op-eds by famous feminists who pointedly ruled her out as a woman. Let them. She'd be over here getting knocked around, each blow a minor illustration of her place in a world that did its gendering work no matter what you called it. So yeah, Stanley, bring it on. Hit Reese. Show her what it means to be a lady. For years, Reese had a rule, don't date other trans women. It was a hypocritical rule. Had anyone else ever ruled her as ineligible for dating on account of her gender? she'd have cried transphobia. But in her own secret heart, the idea of dating another trans woman repelled her. She understood but did not want to admit that the repulsion spoke to her own self-disgust. Instead, she explained it to herself by saying that she was hetero in the etymological sense, 
attracted to difference. It didn't really matter what the difference was although usually it was maleness to her femaleness, because men knew how to make her feel feminine, and feeling feminine turned her on, but she supposed she'd be open to other different types who could do the same. However, never someone just like her. No one should be that vulnerable to another. With a another trans woman, she imagined she knew the exact locations of all the seams, she could unstitch them with a simple snip, and vice versa. But God, Reese couldn't take her eyes off the baby trans sitting there with Felicity. She stared in a way that risked costing her all her veteran trans aloof cool. She stared like the most blatant of repressed chasers. She couldn't help herself. It was like the concept of space warped so that her every line of sight could only lead straight to this girl's face. Her only reprieve from overt lechery was her history. None of the dykes at that monthly trans lady picnic would suspect her of creepiness, a handful of them had tried it with her, and although she hadn't explicitly articulated her rule, the other women had intuited its general outline and word got around. Still, the sight of this girl caused her to bathe in a fragrant soup of her own pheromones. She knew why too. It was something even more taboo and transphobic to cop to than her rule, something she was never supposed to say, because what she saw when she looked at that girl was maybe a boy. Albeit, a specific boy. This girl looked exactly like Sebastian. Same frozen pond eyes, same sharp cheekbones. Were she to have taken a photo of this girl and posted it online, Facebook's facial recognition algorithms would have mistagged it as either Sebastian or someone Siberian husky. Maybe this girl was a little smaller and slimmer than Sebastian, but as Reese watched her talk, she noted half of Sebastian's gestures, and three quarters of his expressions. Little conical mushrooms polka darted the expanse of grass that lay between Reese and the girl, distant enough that Reese couldn't hear the girl's voice, but her brain filled in Sebastian's looping Norwegian accent. From beside her, Iris said, another year on hormones and she's going to be really pretty. She had noted Reese's silence and followed her gaze. Should we be threatened? The girl wore a pair of tight grey pants, calf height harness style motorcycle boots, and a long oversized boiled wool jacket, the uniform of some 1930s European military officer with a flair for androgyny. It was a hard outfit to wear and the girl wore it well, although Reese couldn't tell if the style mix and match reflected excellent fashion or such an early stage in transition that the girl didn't yet have a fully feminine wardrobe to pull from. Neither Iris nor Reese had been to a trans lady picnic in a while. Both had soured on advising just transitioning girls on the process, or putting up with their dramatics, hookups, and general woe is me. But Reese had been looking for an unimpeachable reason to avoid Stanley for a few hours on a Saturday, and Iris had been in a low for about a week and wanted to go somewhere where she'd be looked upon with adulation, which the baby transes happily provided whenever she could bring herself to be friendly instead of hanging around the edges making bitchy comments with Reese. Both Iris and Reese had a sense of themselves as trans elders, despite only being in their late twenties, they were, in trans age, much older than even that trio of just out forty-somethings sitting together on a checkered blanket, who self-consciously checked their reflections in their phones with a paradoxically unselfconscious lack of discretion. Stop staring at her, Iris said when Reese didn't reply. Everyone's going to know you're jealous. It's so much worse than jealous. I'm having a weird crush. It's really embarrassing, Reese said, still staring. Ha ha, deaf, Iris said, without laughing. Iris texted so much that her speech had come to unironically resemble SMS messages. Stanley will love that. Reese didn't want to think about Stanley right then. I wish I was threatened or jealous. It's so much easier to be jealous of another trans girl than attracted to her. Don't you think? asked Reese. At least jealousy is the kind of personality flaw you can work on. Girl, said Iris. But beneath that performance for Iris, the kind of talk that Reese could run on autopilot, Reese's thoughts were strange and stupidly hopeful. 
She'd gotten what she needed from Stanley. She'd proven to herself, to the world, that she could be a good little girlfriend. She needed to move on. I'm going to fall in love with that girl, Reese decided abruptly, and it felt oddly true. Sebastian had been a tall Norwegian foreign exchange student with a head of wild blonde hair and a long body and swimmer's shoulders, which he had gotten, naturally, from swimming. Specifically, Sebastian had been on the University of Oslo's champion relay team, but had been issued a year's suspension from Norwegian competitive swimming after he'd tested positive for drug use after a Christina Aguilera concert. The gender norms in all cultures are different, in Scandinavian culture it is apparently okay for a hetero young man to be quite into Christina Aguilera. A girl he knew who worked for the promoters told him which bar Stina and her entourage were heading to after the show, and there he met one of her dancers a tall American named Tiff who spoke with a Texan accent that Sebastian found both intoxicating and difficult to understand. Tiff seemed weary with tour life and wanted to see the city. To impress her, Sebastian and a friend offered to build her a bonfire in a nearby snow-filled industrial park along the docks, so that she could both stay warm and see the sea. To impress her further, they got another friend to bring cocaine. When the police arrived, unsurprisingly drawn to a two-meter bonfire in the empty lots along the water, they'd all been detained but the officers seemed not to want the hassle of it all and so they were let go. The next day, and not coincidentally, everyone on Sebastian's swim team was subjected to a drug test. His came up positive for both marijuana and cocaine. Were he to leave school officially, he'd be required to complete the mandatory nine-month army service most likely guarding the far northern Russian border, which his older brother had told him consisted of bored boys shooting the occasional tank round at stray reindeer every 23-hour Arctic night after 23-hour Arctic night. Rather than Sebastian spend a winter making Jackson Pollocks out of ruminants, his swim coach found him a semester abroad program at the University of Wisconsin where he could train with one of the better teams in the States and come back a faster swimmer than when he left. Patty, another waitress at the Madison Diner where Reese worked, brought Sebastian in. The place was a kitschy Midwest diner, a necessary stop during campaign seasons, where presidential aspirants ate real middle American pie for photo ops. In a presidential off-season, Sebastian stood out among the diner's clientele. He wore a Nutria fur coat and a sweatband, which, it still being a warm day in September, was perhaps the only thing he could have worn louder and more gauche than his own beauty. Between the outfit and the accent, Reese could not figure out whether he was gay. The first thing he said to her was your pants are stupid, which settled that he was an asshole, but could have gone either way on the gay question. Under the short waitress apron in which she kept a notepad, she had on a pair of tight jeans dyed a faux snakeskin pattern that she thought created a curve-enhancing optical effect. Your hair is stupid, she shot back without thinking, then floundered, mullet head. What's a mullet? he asked. What's on your head? Hem. He turned to Patty, and pulled a low-budget digital game with an LCD screen from the giant pocket on the jacket. Come on, let's keep playing. He pronounced both the P and the L distinctly, so you could hear the puff of the PUH and the light flick of his tongue against the back of his upper teeth in lay. A year or so later, working as a waitress in Manhattan, Reese discovered the contours of her own Wisconsin accent after repeatedly asking patrons if they'd like orange juice. To Reese's dismay, Sebastian came back to the diner the next day, without Patty, and sat at one of Reese's tables. What's the best sweet? he asked Reese. I don't know. Maybe key lime pie, she suggested. He ordered two key lime pie slices, and when she set down the two plates before him, he pushed one across the table and commanded, eat with me. I'm working, she said. There's almost no one in here, he replied. And I am trying to apologize. Her pants were not stupid, he explained, they were beautiful, 
and some girls were so beautiful that they made him angry and she was one of these girls, and yesterday he was baked out of his mind, so he directed his anger at her pants. Sometimes, he confessed, I pass by a girl, and she is so beautiful, I just shout fuck. She was so surprised she sat down with him. Oh. Well, that explains why people have been shouting fuck at me. I figured it was for something else. Because you used to be a boy, yeah? Immediately she stood back up, her own fuck ready on her tongue. I like that, he said mildly, as though he hadn't noticed how she sprang to her feet. My first was someone like you. Older though. I was 15, she was 27. That's illegal. It's different in Norway. And anyway, I have always been tall and I told her I was 20. We aren't in Norway. I know, he said. I just bought a Chrysler LeBaron. He stabbed his key lime pie with the tines of a fork to emphasize his point. The complete lack of segue threw her. A what? A Chrysler LeBaron. He aimed a whipped cream, covered fork out the window. Parked in front of the diner sat an early 90s era red Chrysler LeBaron convertible with the top down. It is not a very good car, everyone tells me, but it looks like such an American car like what I saw on television in Christians and growing up and it was so cheap. I could never have a car like that in Norway. She stared at the car, at a complete loss. She didn't have a car, but even if someone offered her a LeBaron, she wasn't sure she'd want it. Will you come for a ride with me? Suddenly, he was boyish, his face animated, and Reese had a moment to contemplate how charm and charisma had something to do with how someone speaks, the patterns and pauses, and how an accent can suddenly amplify that. Say yes, please again the strange P to L shift that Reese had already noticed I have a red American convertible and I need a pretty American girl in the front seat. She nodded without quite thinking of what she was agreeing to, just happy to be in the pretty American girl category. After work, though. At seven. She sat in that same seat two weeks later, as he drove the LeBaron West, across the pastel badlands of South Dakota. He hadn't liked the rules of the Wisconsin swim team any better than he'd liked the rules of the University of Oslo team, and he found Madison as stultifying as the prospect of forever nights at the Russian border. She'd been blowing him since the first date, but only took her panties off in front of him at a motel outside Wall, home of Wall Drug, because she had already convinced herself that she was in love with him, and so she had to do it sooner or later. He did not go down on her in return. In the darkness afterward, his arms wrapped around her, big spoon style, she allowed herself one quiet sob at her own weakness when listening to the boring older transsexuals in her support group. They'd advised her to wait on surgery at a time when she had half planned a trip to Thailand to buy herself a pussy with the money her grandma had left her for college to which she had also not gone. Listening to Sebastian's slow breathing near her ear, with his one inert hand coming from beneath her body to softly hold her breast and the other resting on the widest part of her hips, she would have so much rather had a pussy than the slowly dwindling balance in her bank account. By the time they'd seen California and headed back east, overshooting Wisconsin to arrive in New York City, she'd put aside her doubts and cultivated the fantasy of life with him. She would be his wife. In Norway, a man could marry a transgender woman, who would be recognized as a woman as long as she had been, as the website Sebastian showed her had translated it, irreversibly sterilized. But Reese had also almost run out of money, and news that Sebastian's swimming stipend had been cancelled arrived by email when they were somewhere in Pennsylvania. In New York, they crashed in Astoria with some trans girls she knew from Live Journal. Their second day in New York, Sebastian sold the LeBaron on Craigslist to pay for a ticket back to Norway. His plans were vague. He'd sort out his military service problem then send money for her to fly to Oslo. It won't be more than three months, he calculated. He told her to get a job as a waitress again. 
She got a job nine days and 26 applications later, in the East Village, an hour's commute by subway from the couch in Astoria for which she had begun to pay rent to the other trans girls to sleep upon. The restaurant wanted her for one shift a week. But a waitress there knew the manager at a gym opening up in Chelsea that needed people to run the in-gym daycare. She applied to the job stealth, the first time she had professionally hidden her trans identity. But she wanted no trans panic when it came to her and children. She got the job without incident. Thus, starting at 5am the following Monday, Reese found herself sitting in a playroom done up in bright primary colours, replete with games, a foam castle with a ball pit, a corner for art, and all manner of toys. Ambient music from Sesame Street. Played from hidden speakers. All day long, the Count, that purple, vampiric Muppet who suffered from a nearly sexual obsession with positive integers, sang of his love O-N-E. Hey hey hey, T-W-O. Hey hey hey, as mothers came in and handed Reese their children for an hour or two, while they took a spin class or ran on the treadmill. In the corners of the room, cameras surveilled and broadcast everything that occurred there to closed circuit channels which the mothers could watch from various angles on channels 1 and 2 of the LCD screens mounted to the workout equipment. The second week, two mothers who were friends came in simultaneously, each handing Reese a six-month-old infant, a diaper bag, and a bottle of breast milk. If she starts to cry, each mother said of her respective daughter, just give her the bottle. Before this moment, the youngest children brought into the daycare had been toddlers, and now, Suddenly, Reese found herself entrusted with two infants. Neither mother appeared to doubt Reese's credentials a young woman in childcare. Such a luxe Jim must have checked out her background, right? Great, here's a baby. Reese experienced a moment of initial panic when she forgot which bottle of breast milk went with which tiny girl. She pictured the mothers watching her on the surveillance feed while they sweated on their ellipticals. Then something clicked. The tiny soft bodies in her arms, the way they giggled and cooed, triggered some sort of deep oxytocin-laced trance in Reese. She felt she knew instinctively what to do, knew just how much of the breast milk to give each girl so that she didn't get sick, knew when they needed to be burped, knew when each needed to be picked up and held, when each could be settled back into her baby carrier. The mothers returned to their daughters sleeping and fed. They gushed that Reese had natural mothering instincts, and together began asking at the front desk for Reese's schedule, planning their workouts to correspond with her shifts, then telling other young mothers about the tall maternal brunette. Within a few weeks, Reese was overwhelmed with children during her shifts, and offers to babysit in her free time, so that management was faced with either hiring a second employee during her shifts or changing the policy to no longer disclose her schedule. At the end of three months in New York, Reese had an evil genie's facsimile of her dream life, surrounded by children, with a man who promised to take care of her. Only the children were not her own, and her man lived an ocean away and rarely called her anymore. When she and Sebastian did talk, he was often drunk. Increasingly panicked, she held back the need to ask about the plane ticket, about the plan, about his love. When she finally blurted something out, on a low-quality VOIP call from some third-rate bodega calling card, it came out resentful, half-formed, and not at all the first move in the meticulous chess match she'd planned to get him back on track. You're never going to fly me to Norway, are you? I have a theory, he responded. What are you talking about? I have a theory, he said again, then went on when she didn't speak. My theory is that the only thing I enjoy doing is destroying my own innocence. I have no more innocence to destroy with you. She had, after only three months of dealing with young men in New York, come to recognize the grandiloquence of a man in love with himself, the hero of his own private movie and Sebastian's movie included a dalliance with a transsexual, to establish his libertine character. What the fuck does that mean? Am I supposed to find that some kind of tragedy? It means I can't fly you to Oslo. She knew it was coming. 
But still the pressure inside her chest made it hard to breathe, and when she finally spoke it was because something inside her had broken. I waited for you, she said into the crackling VOIP line. You promised me. My promises are no good. He sounded sad about it. I want a family someday. I don't think you can give me one. How cruel to be accused of lacking the one thing she most desperately wanted, a thing she felt sure he could easily give her. She let out a low moan, but then, even in her incipient grief, hated how low the pitch sounded and cut herself short. She needed an unguarded moment, a moment of actual pain. But instead, fear of a non-passing voice shocked her into doing what she always did, pushed down her feelings. Get cold. We can fix this, she said as evenly as she could. I know we can. I love you. You love me. Just tell me what you need. No, he said. I just, you're not a forever person. She knew that in only a few moments the guillotine of sadness would slam down upon her, severing her from her pride, and anything that might keep back despair. She would beg, she would cry. But it hadn't yet come down. The sentence had not been executed, and her sense of pride, in its last moments, remained defiant say anything, no matter how stupid, don't go down crying. I guess I shouldn't have taken off my panties, she spat out, then hung up, and waited for the agony of heartbreak to hit as she considered the thousand other more biting or pleading ways she could have said goodbye. The trans lady picnic occupied a clearing atop a hill across from the picnic house in Prospect Park. Reese had to admire how, in the way that trans women can be ever and subconsciously vigilant, the picnic's organizers had chosen a militarily advantageous hill, the kind of hill a general would have chosen to make a stand, wooded on three sides, with a view of the grassy fields below as well as every path by which a pedestrian could approach. Arrivals to the picnic were spotted and identified among the drifting weekend crowds of Park Slope parents long before they had summit. No one would be sneaking up to surprise the transsexual women. Which is not to say that the passersby were not themselves surprised. Among many other instances, Reese saw it in the body language of a pair of teenagers ambling by. The moment the two boys glanced up the sloped lawns to the group of women sprawled on blankets passing Tupperware back and forth, their teenage figures suddenly huddled into each other to confirm and broke apart with a laugh. When Reese turned back from the teenagers, she found Sebastian as a girl watching her. A jolt ran through Reese. In the intervening years, she downgraded Sebastian from real love to a teenage affair, and her own feelings from tragic to immature. But the near-familiar face planted doubts about that revision, the lingering suggestion that she downgraded defensively to spare herself. Sebastian as a girl held Reese's gaze for a beat or two, the almost known features wobbling from an uncertain frown into a friendly, even smile, a slight nod, before she turned back to other women beside her. Iris tapped Reese's knee, drawing her attention. I know Felicity, Iris indicated with a nod toward the pretty Latina girl who had somehow skateboarded there in a dazzlingly white dress and was just then making Sebastian as a girl laugh. Wanna go over and talk? Get an introduction? No, of course not, Reese replied. I've lost control of my heterosexuality, not my dignity. Iris snorts. As if you have dignity. You had to sneak out of daddy's house today. Reese thought it was natural that she didn't bring Stanley to queer parties or spaces for what seemed to her complicated but obvious subcultural reasons. She was afraid of the things he might say, his big body and L. L. Bean style among the sea of queer, cut off black jeans, the way he'd take up space, make decrees, and just generally be triggering. Even if he kept his mouth shut, something he'd never shown much interest in doing, it'd be like bringing a water buffalo to a suburban pool party. Yes, that water buffalo might just be standing in the shallow end, gnawing happily on cud. 
but, still, no one was about to cannonball into the pool and splash around. Rhys turned back to Iris, who blew smoke over her shoulder and held her cigarette in her particular way, arm almost straight, two fingers outstretched, as though she hoped to pass it to someone else. Let's cut temptation off at the root, Rhys said. Let's get out of this stupid park and go to some straight bar. Somewhere where we can get high on the ambient testosterone. What, like a bowling alley? Come on. Pick a spot, I don't care. Okay, Iris agreed. But rather than make any move to pack up, Iris rose and sauntered over to Felicity. She bent to kiss her hellos, to hold out one hand in a light touch while her other kept her cigarette at a distance, but every time she could get away with it, she flashed a discreet but malevolent grin at Reese. Iris had a fifth gear of charm that she rarely bothered to engage, which she only ever shifted into to make trouble. Reese, Reese, Iris called after a minute like a hostess at a 50s dinner party. Come over here, there's someone you just have to meet. Felicity and Sebastian as a girl watched as Reese stood, so that she had no moment to collect herself, straighten her clothes, pat her hair, or basically do anything but walk over to their little cluster as nonchalantly as possible to say hey, like the worst kind of bore, because what else was there to say after you made that kind of painfully laborious entrance? She couldn't even stab Iris in the heart, because although at least that would have been more interesting, it might have made for a bad first impression. Felicity, whom Reese had met a few times before, greeted her with a lazy hey, girl, which Reese returned before sticking out a limp but not too limp hand to Sebastian as a girl. Reese, she said. Amy, said Amy, and gave Reese's hand a light tug. Sit with us. Reese scooped her skirt beneath her and sat beside Amy. The women on the blanket were playing a casual game one of those conversational exercises that fritter away time among acquaintances with whom you want to give the impression of high-spirited openness, but with whom you can only risk it obliquely. The rules, pick three items from your local CVS that would most upset the checkout clerk when rung up at the counter. A sample from that conversation. A dog collar, those long balloons that you twist into animals at children's parties, and a tub of Vaseline. Sudift, a kitchen knife, and some twine. Condoms, a shovel, and a styrofoam cooler. They don't sell shovels at CVS. Yes they do. Where are you from? Like Montana? They don't in New York City. A trowel then, one of those little shovels? No. Fine, then I'll walk in carrying a shovel, and buy those other two things. That's not in the rules. If you're allowed to bring things in, there's stuff way more disturbing than a shovel. When the game came around to Amy, she said, I think we aren't really taking advantage of the rules. Like, everything you all said hints at sex or murder, which, yeah, is upsetting in a generalized scandalous way. But I think if you can trigger someone to make them sad about their own life, it's way more upsetting. I'd find the checkout person who looks the most tired and lonely, and then I'd buy a huge tub of chocolate chip cookie dough ice cream, a bottle of diet pills, and whatever women's magazine has the saddest headline, like, how to get a job that isn't degrading, or how to not still be alone years after heartbreak, or orgasms. Will you ever have one? You'd have to pick the right clerk, but if you did, it'd be devastating. Oh yes, Reese thought. This girl is for me. When the conversation turned to a cadre of literary type punk girls in whom Reese had zero interest, she allowed her attention to drift. When she tuned back in, Amy was pointing to a cluster of buildings to the south that rose visibly above the rim of green encircling the field. She lived in one of those buildings. Reese didn't bother to ask what Amy did. She already knew the equation white young trans woman plus apartment right beside the park equal job in tech. Reese barely paid attention to Amy's actual words. She had the same mannerisms as Sebastian, but her voice, 
the way she used it, was flat and midwestern with none of Sebastian's charismatic pauses and accented flourishes. The phantom of Sebastian disappeared from her as she spoke and rubber banded back when she went silent. Then, suddenly, the conversation split. Iris and Felicity got up, hunting to see who might have brought beer in a backpack, and Amy and Reese sat alone. I saw you looking at me, Amy said boldly, in Reese's opinion. You look familiar, have we met before? Maybe we know each other from online? No, said Reese, not thinking before she spoke. I would have remembered. Amy smiled, unsure if she'd been offered a compliment. You look spookily like someone I used to know, Reese said. Who was she? Amy asked. And suddenly the trap that Reese had inadvertently set for herself sprung. There was no way to admit that she had been thinking of a boy. Such admissions will scar a baby trans. Fuck it, Reese thought. I'll flirt my way out of this one, it's what I want anyway. An old lover, Reese said, and looked hard at Amy, whose backlit face remained slightly shadowed with her hair haloed. One of my best. Amy laughed lightly, then squinted at Reese to see if she had been teased. Reese indicated nothing, simply held her gaze. All right, Amy said after a moment, with a slight nod, as if affirming an offer. Good. All week they texted each other and it was breath play a tiny suffocation veering toward death between every blip of dopamine bestowing communication. On a night that Stanley had gone to dinner with his friends, and Reese knew he'd be out for hours, she invited Amy over. Reese ignored Amy's questioning eyes, which cast about the lush masculine apartment, and just led her to Stanley's bed, stripped her bare to finger and toy her until she came. Afterward, Amy observed, you have a working fireplace in your apartment. Reese understood that Amy was asking a question she couldn't bring herself to say directly. He pays for everything. He? My boyfriend. Or whatever he is. If he's not your boyfriend, what is he? Mostly an asshole. Amy laughed, assuming that Reese's insult had been affectionate, careful to maintain a tactful distance between her own hopes and the primacy she assumed Reese still gave to her boyfriend in matters of love. But Reese betrayed no humor. Amy caught her laugh, suddenly protective. He's an asshole. Unquestionably so. Why don't you leave? Reese shrugged. She had half affected a world weary attitude about Stanley to impress Amy, but at the question, the weariness congealed into a real emotion. And go where? In one of those wild leaps that come only at the outset of a devastating crush, Amy blurted out, Come live with me. Reese turned, cocked her head to the side, then reached out to tip Amy's chin toward her. You want to U-Haul already? You really are a lesbian, huh? Amy and three of her friends, all women, handled the move with the military precision of a hostage extraction. They waited until Stanley went to work, arrived in a rented truck, and moved Reese's belongings out of the closet in Stanley's apartment and into Amy's place by noon. Reese and Amy had already eaten two meals together in their new home before Stanley even learned of his own reacquaintance with bachelorhood. Reese stole Stanley's blender when she left. She told herself that both she and he deserved it. That small theft turned out to be the grievance on which he litigated his subsequent stream of enraged voicemails, texts, and emails, her greed, how spoiled she was, the way she used people, broke them down and ultimately stole their small appliances. Then the messages stopped. Even a few years after the financial crash, the occasional aftershock reverberated to collapse yet another firm. This time it was Stanley's. Chapter 3 Six weeks after conception Waves boom against the breakwater along Lakeshore Drive, beneath the Chicago skyline. 
they bounce back from the vertical concrete seawall into the oncoming sets, rolling under and over the newcomers, violently hoisting each other aloft then dropping apart diminished. Even from inside the taxi, with the windows rolled up, Ames can smell the water, can sense the ionized air that jolts him into a pleasant alertness, as happens near waterfalls, or just after a sudden, hard downpour. Bikers weave to avoid the spray, which gets caught by the wind and carried over the lake path. Two windsurfers rip across the flat inner breakwater at Navy Pier, bracing their weight so hard against the gusts that they've pulled back the sails, closer to parallel with them perpendicular to the horizon. One of them carves toward the channel entrance, where the steeper whitecaps come in, catches the first big crest, and launches twelve feet into the air, hanging for a moment like a kite. Ames is so surprised and impressed by the maneuver that he cries out and grabs Katrina's arm, forgetting that, for the past week, every conversation that does not stick tightly to questions of their work has ended in uneasy sadness or recriminations. Sorry, he says, his hand retreating. Did you see that, though? That guy was using his sail like a wing when he jumped off the wave. Katrina refuses to direct her attention toward the lakefront, and the full bore of her distress is recalled to him. He exhales slowly through his nose. At Michigan Avenue, the taxi pulls off the drive and shoves its way along Chicago's best rendition of glitz. Their clients have chosen some bistro off the magnificent mile that bills its food as Wisconsin cuisine, a nouveau supper club concept that only makes sense as the kind of food Chicagoans would decide New Yorkers need more of. Ames grew up in the Midwest, among the casseroles of St. Paul, which was why, he supposed, he didn't have much tolerance for Midwestern A.W. shucks. Out here, people acted like you were putting on airs if you majored in art history before you went to business school, much less changed your name and started shooting estrogen. The resentful Midwestern inferiority complex. The last time he'd seen his aunt, nearly a decade ago, he'd offered her French press coffee and she'd sniffed that Folgers was good enough for her. She didn't need anything delicate and foreign. Good, he told her, because this will be dumping boiling water on grounds and waiting five minutes. Then he transitioned and they hadn't spoken since. In his aunt's schema, changing one's gender might rank as even more snooty than French press coffee. Now the taxi idles in traffic by Water Tower Place. Ames risks a glance at Katrina, who is gazing at the giant billboards of women in Victoria's Secret. I'm glad we're getting to have dinner together, Ames says inanely, as though by going with him to a business dinner, she'd agreed to a date. You made the travel arrangements, Katrina notes. I mean, I know it's for work, but I still love traveling with you. Remember when we made that weekend trip to Montreal? They had spent almost the entire weekend in bed together. Yes, Katrina agrees. You got me there under false pretenses. The taxi driver took a peek at him in the rearview mirror. For a moment, Ames casts about for something truly awful to say to her, but he can't think of anything and the urge subsides. She doesn't deserve it. The past week without her closeness has illuminated for him just how much he has come to need it, how big a place she's come to occupy in his emotional habits. At work, he's spent the past several days maneuvering to spend time with her in situations that cannot devolve into demands that he make a decision about the pregnancy. His efforts had been assisted by their current project, another one of her weird marketing ideas, creating a 90s retro Giga pet app for a pet insurance company. Because what would get pet owners more alarmed about their pet's health than gaming out for them the many horrible ways that Fluffy might succumb? They'd have to hire out-of-house for programmers to create the app, at considerable cost, so Katrina and Ames came to Chicago to convince the clients to sign on to a simpler approach that could be done in-house, and thus add profits to the project. Ames had worked stupidly hard to set up the deal, which culminated in this trip. In his free time, to avoid getting lost in his own thoughts, he'd spent almost every waking minute digesting the intricacies of the pet insurance market, understanding the clients in the online pet arena, 
and charming his counterparts in the client's marketing department all for a chance to show Katrina that he was a reliable person who could protect her reputation and interests, which in turn, he hoped would create a situation in which he'd have an opportune moment to propose his plans for the pregnancy. At dinner with the clients, she surprises him by ordering two bottles of champagne. She commences to fill and empty her glass much more rapidly than he has ever seen her drink, chirping happily that progress on the deal needed celebrating. Two glasses down and Katrina's cheeks and ears have flushed, her quick eyes taking on a shine. She's talking to the clients the pet insurer's marketing strategist and the assistant chief of business development with more animation than Ames has seen all week. The men, speaking almost in tandem, like a stage act, explain how they live in a suburb called Naperville. They live in the same neighborhood, with kids who go to the same school, and wives who were friends first one of them even hired the other. Oh, that's cute, Katrina says. I bet you too carpool. The men consider this, and Biz Dev tentatively agrees yes, perhaps it is indeed cute. To Ames, Katrina's out-of-character theatrical enthusiasm, like her champagne order, demonstrates an attempt to cover for emotional distress beyond what he'd expected she seems on the edge of some wild action but neither man notices. Instead they marvel at the fun side that this previously all-business lady has unlocked from her safe and brought to dinner. She avoids Ames's eye contact, and when he manages to catch hers, the brown of her eyes shines back deep and glassy rather than with the customary shrewdness he expects from her glance. The appetizers arrive, various fried breaded things, and a plate of cheeses, on top of which sits a pile of fresh cheese curds. The waiter, with the same gravitas that he names the Norwegian Brunost, announces the curds are squeaky cheese, clarifying that they will squeak when you bite them. Katrina pops a few curds of squeaky cheese into her mouth and chews with her mouth open, biting into the curds with her molars. Oh, can you hear that? she asks. Biz Dev leans close to her face to listen. I can, he says, with more amazement than Ames feels is required for listening to someone else chew food. Can you hear it when I do it too? Ames might have thought she was doing impressions of a drunken hostess desperately willing her party to be fun, had he not made a face at her and seen in response a private look of near anguish cross hers. A moment later, she covers for it. Listen, Ames. Listen to him too, she suggests. Ames obliges and bends into Ward Marketing's mouth. The man bites down. Out comes the little flatulent squeak. Yep, agrees Ames it squeaks. Ames tries to bring up the pros and cons of flash-based programming for the web version of the app, but Katrina keeps interrupting by asking personal questions of the men. Finally, Ames gives up and attempts some small talk with Biz Dev about where Ames had grown up, how his grandparents had actually gone to supper clubs in Upper Wisconsin a similar culinary experience entirely in brown meat and potatoes and gravy and beige carpeting and instant coffee and grease darkened oak tables. When the waiter passes by, Katrina orders a bottle of wine. Whatever is good and white, she instructs. It arrives and another glassful disappears he's so taken aback by her performance that it's only when the food arrives that he wonders if the drinking is a sign meant for him to interpret. The pregnant woman downing alcohol. Even Biz Dev is beginning to notice that the rate of wine consumption has gotten awfully high for a dinner like this. He puts his hand over his glass when the waiter tries to refill it. Oh, yes, well, I should probably stop, Katrina says, waving her hand lazily, signaling the waiter to top her up. She's pretty drunk by now, eyes bright, cheeks flushed, just beginning to teeter on sloppy. But Ames is in charge of travel so you'll see that I make it home okay. Still, Ames says diplomatically, you don't want to be hung over tomorrow. How the fuck do you know what I want? The fun-loving hostess pulls off her mask. Behind it is Katrina herself, looking straight at Ames for the first time tonight with her usual fierceness, unable to hide her sudden fury. 
These dev and marketing both find something to examine in the food on their plates. Katrina points a cream sauce, covered spoon at Ames, but addresses everyone else. He forgets that I'm his boss. Ames makes a what the fuck? Face. This is her project, her reputation as the firm's weird genius who pulls off unlikely deals that she's in the process of exploding. She's mostly hurting herself. Obviously choosing words with care, marketing says, Ames has been just super on this project. Just super, these dev chimes in. I didn't think anyone could understand the pet insurance sector so fast, and then actually be funny about it. Yeah, we're really about it. Yes, says Katrina. Ames is quite the charmer. I'm constantly surprised at just how varied his life has been. He seems to have a way with all sorts of interesting people. Her delivery buzzes with malice. He has the most unusual past. Ames wants to kick her under the table, but she's sitting too far away. He suddenly realizes that she is very drunk in addition to being very upset. He's done this himself at times when the pressure of discomfort at some social event valves over into some increasingly recursive internal monologue until he is ready to lash out at everyone near him. But the men don't take the bait on Ames's past. They are interesting men themselves. Charmed me, says BizDev. Ditto, agrees marketing. I wonder, says Katrina. Okay, says Ames, striving to end this moment. What about dessert? Transsexuals, Katrina says, ignoring him. Ames sighs, and runs a finger down the bridge of his nose, where it had once been broken. You're going to do this? Now? Pardon, asks marketing. Transsexuals, repeats Katrina. Ames has a history with transsexuality. Beast Dev can't help himself. You like transsexuals? Unbidden, Ames pictures Reese as she had been when they lived together, as she had been when she thought herself unwatched in their shared apartment her eyeliner wings smudged at the end of the day, wisps of hair along the sides of her face escaping a now loosened ponytail, her public-facing dancer's posture lowering into a slouch after she's locked the front door and slumped down on the couch. Yeah, agrees Ames, and he wipes his mouth with a napkin. I like transsexuals. A challenge sits at the edge of his voice. No, says Katrina. That's not what I'm saying, I'm saying that. Water spills as marketing sets down his glass of water with a clunk, and Ames flinches. Ames is willing himself to recede from the scene, but maybe not fast enough. He's angry, not sure he can handle even the mildest slur about trans women from these guys. Now, look, marketing says, addressing no one in particular. I've been married 15 years and no one has ever asked me about my wife's genitals. Any man who does can expect a punch in the mouth, and I'd expect Ames to do the same for whatever woman he loves. He ends this declaration with a masculine nod. Ames, his fingers tight on a balled-up napkin, has prepared himself for an entirely different statement. He needs a moment to key into the present, a moment to sort the various implications through which to refract the man's meaning. What Ames would have given, for years, to have heard a straight CIS middle-class man compare a trans woman to his own wife, much less in order to defend the trans woman. Now, much too late, one such man has appeared just in time to hurt another woman Ames cares about. This man meets Ames's eye in man-to-man -man acknowledgement, the women we love are sacred and we will defend them. Across the table, Katrina shifts in her chair, and Ames catches a waver to her face. A part of her must understand that that moment between men excludes her, will always exclude her but worse, a part of her must also see that in that moment, she is not the woman whom Ames, or anyone else, has positioned as eligible for protective love. You're not hearing what I'm saying, she suddenly interjects. I'm saying that your good buddy Ames here used to be a fucking transsexual. Reese knows 
that Ames has gone to Chicago with Katrina. He told Reese that he'd talked to Katrina about his plan, the one that Reese agreed to, sometime while on this business trip. She keeps checking her phone, and still she hasn't heard anything from him. The stress of it is getting to her, and the more time that goes by the more implausible it seems. Is sharing motherhood really what she wants? Or is she so desperate that she'll take any scrap thrown her way? And if that's the case, it seems to Reese unlikely that an apparently successful CIS woman would settle for so little. To distract herself, Reese has been seeing a lot of her cowboy. But predictably, tonight, her cowboy called to postpone their date. On a last minute whim, Reese decided to go see her friend Talia's weekly set at Dynamite one of several North Brooklyn queer dive bars run by the same shady family of straight people. Talia was a former drag queen turned transsexual, one of the earliest converts in the Great Drag Enlightenment, when a significant quorum of Brooklyn's queens came out as trans, began to inject estrogen, and renounced their gay past, the consequences of which miffed them into misandry, as the desperately cute twinks who used to sleep with them no longer would. Talia runs a set called Anger Management. in which she plays tropical dubstep to keep everyone chill, then undercuts her chill vibes with hourly advice sessions in which she solicits and landers style questions from the various twinks who form her now sexually unavailable fan base, then berates them for their stupidity in profound and profane harangues. It was reliably the most entertaining way for Reese to spend a Tuesday night. Tonight, one of the twinks asks about sharing chores in a relationship the twink has found that in his relationship with a masked dom, he is doing much more household work, so can he employ feminist arguments for a more equitable share in the domestic labor? To which Talia responds that no, he is a little bitch, and in the midst of a shortage of actual true-to-god dom tops, he had best start scrubbing if he wants to keep his man happy. However, Talia adds, the whole premise of the question ought to be rejected because there is no such thing as a pure mask top everyone will eventually want something in their butt, because that is the nature of having a butt when the moment comes that things get equitable in bed, so should they be in domestic labor. The twinks giggle happily, but Talia rebukes them, and demands they give her quarters for her own laundry, because her parents have cut off her money as a consequence for yelling at them on the phone. Emphasis, she shakes her tip bucket from the pedestal DJ booth from which she reigns, then segues into one of her favorite themes, her parents. Her parents are good, long-suffering people, she tells the assembled twinks, and these good, long-suffering people still support her at age 29, because she is a spoiled brat who has never had a job a weekly show at a queer bar doesn't count which is an embarrassment to her. And what does she do to repay her parents for their generosity? She spits the words into the MIC so acerbically that it pops with her consonants, then pauses a second before answering her own question in a mock outrage duration. She changed her gender. Just to stymie and confuse them. And now she yells at them on the phone and hangs up on them if they misgender her. That's what they get for supporting a child with artistic tendencies. But what else did they expect? Did they think they could just let their child wear carpery pants and that there would be no consequences? And do you know the worst part? Talia demands of her twinks. The worst part is that most parents get to one day have a moment of comeuppance, when their kids become parents, and then those kids reassess their own childhood with a parent's eyes and regretfully admit that dad knew best all along. And mommy was so generous. So kind and also beautiful and young. But not my parents, Talia concludes with a cackle. Because with all the hormones, now I'm sterile. I stole that comeuppance from them. The cute boys in cut-off shorts lined up along the bar laugh. Talia theatrically narrows her eyes at them. What are you all laughing at? If you're here listening to me, she admonishes, it probably means you're also a disappointment to your parents. If you like my shtick, and you didn't just wander in off the street, there is a high probability that you are also a degenerate who will never give your parents a grandchild. Talia spits out her gum in a pique, 
then continues on to the next question unabated. Talia had given Reese a drink ticket and Reese laughs happily along with the rants, sipping on the free corona. Reese sort of loves Talia's parents, or at least, Talia's version of them. She empathizes with them. They make all the classic parents of a trans mistakes, but unlike Reese's own parents, they seem to truly and deeply love their child, as baffling and confusing as they find her. Reese can relate, Talia is deeply lovable and talented and spoiled and capable of inexplicable rage which makes her one of the most compelling girls Reese knows. Talia also happens to be one of the most talented musicians in the city, though she prima donnaishly refuses almost all offers to perform her parents' largesse allows her to avoid the grind of petty performances, which lesser musicians accept primarily in order to eat and secondarily to build up a following. Still, although Talia performs only rarely, half of her twink followers are fans of her music who settle for seeing her yell at them in a dive bar because it is the closest thing available to hearing her sing. Talia's talents only explain a part of Reese's deep affection for her. Reese knows a lot of talented people half the trans women in Brooklyn live in a state of perpetual pre-celebrity, awaiting a well-deserved recognition that will never come. No, more than simply finding Talia compelling, Reese secretly and proudly thinks of Talia as her trans daughter. Reese shares this with almost no one, because she'd be mortified to take public credit for how remarkably level Talia has turned out to be even though in her own mind, she deserves a healthy share of that credit. Reese met Talia in the first months of Talia's transition, just as Talia entered the full bloom of the second puberty, just as the changes in her body began to show, just as every evening the momentous pendulum of estrogenatic moods swung to despair, just as Talia burst into the period of transition when she cried at the moon, and broke mirrors in self-loathing, and fell in love real and present love for the first time. How many nights had Reese sat down with Talia to offer her counsel, both stern and loving, as Talia writhed like a turtle who'd lost its shell, its soft unarmored flesh abraded by the newly felt humiliations of life as a transsexual? How many times had Reese gone over to Talia's apartment and held her when she cried, and tried to give her advice without telling her how to act or patronizing her or creating a hierarchy in their friendship? because as much as Reese wanted to shake Talia and tell her to grow the fuck up, she admired Talia, and all the skills and dreams that she harbored those same dreams and hopes that Reese herself had given up. Isn't that the most motherly thing of all? To hope your daughter has the chances that you never gave yourself or that you were never given. Mother-daughter relationships among drag queens or gay men have a long lineage as a New York City phenomenon as every queer to have reverently watched Paris is burning will gladly inform you. Reese knows the mother role still holds sway with the black and Latina girls adjacent to the ballroom world girls whose families reject them young and early, who need guidance and love and firm talking tos on occasion. That's not how it is with the white girls Reese knows, though. Those girls, unlike the teenagers seeking family in the ballroom scene, often haven't yet lost their sense of entitlement, and won't stand to be told what to do won't accept an explicit hierarchy of mother-daughter, especially not from some tranny only slightly their elder whose own mistakes layer and squish on each other like a melting cake. Reese has raised a few trans daughters over the years, and all of the mothering has been tacit, the girls need it, yearn for it, but won't accept it if they realize what it is. And Reese, for as much as she complained about these ungrateful girls, needed them too craved the chance to nurture someone to care and soothe them with her softest, most selfless love. Of course, her first trans daughter Ames had also been her lesbian lover. Amy. A daughter whom Reese had raised to love Reese well as a wife, with all the strange dynamics in power that entails, the dynamics that are so confusingly sexy and painful and satisfying and awkward that the rest of society has an incest taboo to avoid them. When her daughter lover detransitioned into her son, he weirdly put her through all the stages of anger, rage, and betrayal that Reese had heard from countless other parents when their daughters transitioned for the first time. So was it any wonder that when Ames popped back in her life, he did so with the intention of making her a mother? 
Reese had caught Amy so young in her womanhood, in early pliancy, and motherhood had always been a code to their love. Not just two women in love, but mother and daughter. Talia sways slightly on her DJ pedestal. A little dance that both mocks and gives into the cheesy chill of the vaporwave song she's just put on. All Reese's children, and here she is, still alone. How can Reese not feel kinship with Talia's parents? These nice middle class people, he a doctor and she a teacher who ache with worry for their daughter and who have no idea Reese exists. Who can't know there is a shadow mother? plotting and worrying alongside them. She wants to hug Talia's parents. To tell them it will be okay. Suddenly Reese has to get out of the bar. She has the awful fear that she might begin to cry pity from the early twenties trans girls among whom she sits would be the final mortification. Grabbing her purse, she slips out. No one notices. Behind her, Talia, charismatic as always, tosses back at the audience the slips of papers on which they have written their questions, then slides up the volume on another breezy dubstep mix in a show of huffiness that may or may not all be part of the act. On the sidewalk outside the bar, Reese attempts to bum a cigarette from a handsome guy who looks to her like a slightly fam vin diesel, but who doesn't register her until she speaks directly to him, because he's fixated on two slim boys leaning against each other in the doorway. Distracted, he gives her a cigarette, and then coming to himself, chivalrous lights it for her. That's my daughter in there, Reese tells Fam Vin Diesel. He peers through the darkened glass windows at Talia, then back at Reese. You must be very proud, he says gamely. The two slim boys move back inside and Fam Vin Diesel glances at them with an expression of loss unsure how he has committed himself to a supporting part in some transsexual neurotic mother roleplay. Go with your friends, Reese tells him. She angles a stream of smoke out the side of her mouth, and waves the cigarette cherry in the direction where they've slipped away. He nods gratefully and steps lightly after them. A few moments later, Talia comes out. Oh my god. I had to escape the baby transes in there. One of them was complaining about how a CIS woman looked at her today at the store. That's how wounded she is, she can't take being looked at. Two eyes appraising her is trauma. I can't take it. Such is the explosion of girls transitioning in and around the Brooklyn drag world, and so devoid are these girls of their own trans history, that Talia, having been on hormones not quite two years, has found herself forcibly placed in a maternal role. Her tone evinces a teenage mother's exasperation with children, having just been one herself. Without asking, Talia takes the cigarette from between Reese's fingers and puffs hard. Reese laughs. This is the moment. What is the moment? The moment you just said your mother would never get. When a daughter finally has kids of her own and begins to understand that her mother knew best all along. Talia exhales and hands the cigarette back to Reese, who declines it. Don't be smug about it, Talia says. Maternal smugness is very annoying. Remind me to tell that to my mother next time I call her. She lifts the sole of her shoe behind her, twists herself with easy balance to stub out the cigarette on it, and flicks the filter into the gutter. Her lashes curve luxuriously around her eyes even when she doesn't wear mascara, and tonight, she's worn the mascara thickly, making the amber irises appear bright and unearthly by contrast, illuminated as they are by the orange light of the sodium vapor street lamps. Many people think a trans woman's deepest desire is to live in her true gender, but actually it is to always stand in good lighting. Normally that means avoiding the unflattering orangey glare of street lights. Yet Talia, with her dark curls and smooth skin, stands resplendent as a Greek pop star in the fiery hues. In, in Reese's memories of childhood, Knight had a different blue-black tone than in her adult life. And, in fact, she later learned when she returned to visit Madison after a long hiatus, this change in the color of Knight was not an illusion of time and remembrance but a historical fact. Like most American cities, 
Madison, Wisconsin, had replaced the blue-white lighting of incandescent and mercury vapor street lamps with the orange of sodium vapor. This not only required less energy to run but, because a trick of the human eye perceives orange light to be brighter and thus more revealing than the same lumens of white-blue light, cities installed sodium vapor in the super-predator panicked 90s as a method to deter street crime. As though one would comfortably rape and murder and steal in the privacy of blue light, but would hew to a life of church-going and clean language if illuminated by the eerie public gaze of yellow-orange sodium vapor lamps. In the pictures of Reese's early childhood, cities shone as stars, but now they burned a combustion orange glow heavenward, flames licking the firmament as whole cities engulfed themselves in nocturnal conflagration, eternally incinerating, blazing, scorching everybody caught within their scaffolds of kindling. And at the center, her daughter, Talia, queen of fire. I think I need my shot, Reese tells Talia. I'm feeling very grandiose and morose and old. That's always a sign that I'm hormonal. I was thinking that night is a different color than it used to be. I have to change songs, Talia says, taking Reese lightly by the arm. Stop being weird and come back inside. And this, Reese reflects, is the other reason to be a mother in whatever fashion motherhood comes your way so when you're old and alone and feeling sorry for yourself your daughter will roll her eyes at your theatrics and bring you in from the cold. After the disaster of their dinner with Biz Dev and marketing, Ames puts a drunk Katrina into a cab and, despite her protests, gets in after her. I'm not leaving you alone. No matter what you say to or about me, he insists. His reasons for staying with her were twofold wanting to make sure she was safe and because the driver seemed skeptical about having a drunk woman in his car without a chaperone. Now Katrina slumps against the window, holding her head. I'm not that into pet insurance anyway, Ames says finally, into Katrina's silence. Katrina doesn't change position. The car travels slowly, block by block through traffic. Tourists and a few groups of teenagers frogger their way across the streets. Did you drink like that to punish me or the baby? Ames asks as the car pulls back onto Lakeshore Drive. Katrina pulls her head up from a lull. If there wasn't all the road noise, Ames guesses he'd hear the whirring of a mind calculating the most damaging insult. But instead, she pulls her thin jacket closer and starts to softly cry. I don't know, she chokes out after a minute or so. I didn't mean to out you. I don't want to hurt you either. I don't know what I'm doing. You were supposed to care about me. I wasn't supposed to be alone. The volatility of this mood change wrongfoots him. The delicacy of her frame shows in her coat, the fabric hangs loosely from heaving shoulders only moderately wider than his forearm is long. No, Katrina, he protests, but it's a weak protest. I'm not sure what to do either. I mean, I'm trying to come up with a plan. Why do you need a plan? Why can't you just love me, and be who I thought you were? I am who you thought I was. Everything I did it's my past that made me like that. No. She rubs her eyes hard and the mascara she put on for dinner smudges. I thought I knew you, but I don't. I trusted you. I opened up to you and told you about myself. I told you how vulnerable I've been. But you didn't do the same. You could have told me at any time. But instead you betrayed me. You hid yourself from me. And only now that I'm pregnant, when you can't lie anymore, for your own sake, are you willing to tell me the truth. She wipes her face and shakes her head, as if she's heard something she doesn't like. I blame myself. I still want to hear you try. What do you mean? She stares at him, then at the seat in front of her. I broke so many rules my own, and bigger ones. I hooked up with someone who works for me. I told myself it would be fine because we had something so special. I was swept up in it. But it turns out, I was deluding myself. I don't know you. I don't know you at all. The person I thought you were, 
Not only would he have actually shared his past, but he sure as fuck wouldn't have left me dangling for a week. I'm trying. But she shakes her head. I'm divorced. I'm pregnant. I'm 39. You know that doctors call pregnancies over the age of 35 geriatric pregnancies. I have to make one of the biggest decisions for my future, and I'm a mess, and I don't trust myself, and I can't even learn from my mistakes because you know what the worst part is. We don't have to focus on the worst part, Ames tells her. The worst part, she continues, ignoring him, the worst part is that I miss you. Her lower lip is extruding, she's trying to hold back any show of emotion, and failing. That's how bad my judgment is. Even now, I miss you enough that I just want you to lie to me. I want you to tell me it's okay, that you'll love me, that you want to be a dad in my life. But I know that'd be a lie. If you lied about something so fundamental before and treated me so cruelly because of your own shit how could it not be a lie? He puts out a hand. I don't know. I am desperate too. What can I do? Nothing. He shakes his head. Let's start small. What if I promise to tell you everything you'd ever want to know? She looks at his open palm. A moment passes. The shadows rotate like a second hand with every street light that passes. The whir of tires hiccup regularly over the tarred repairs of the Chicago streets. Tentatively, she presses her forefinger into the center of his palm, and his hand curls around it. I tell you that you're still probably lying, but that I want to hear it. Come here, he says, pulling on her hand. Come here, please. Sit in the middle seat and lean on me instead of the window. She hesitates, then fumbles with her free hand to unlatch her seatbelt, slides into the middle seat, where he circles his arm around her shoulders, pulls her in. He wakes up in her bed, his nose inches from a lock of glossy hair that had trailed off her pillow to violate the imaginary DMZ he'd unilaterally marked down the center of the bed. For empty plastic water bottles, the complimentary contents of which she'd chugged to stave off the hangover, lay scattered on her nightstand and she's snoring cutely. Quietly, he slips back the sheets, walks down the hall to his own room, and collects the four water bottles the hotel had allotted for his room. She's peering at him groggily when he returns to set them down beside the empties. More water for you, he says. Fuck. She sits up and puts a hand to the back of her neck, then fumbles through the empty bottles to check the time on her phone. Oh fuck. Oh fuck fuck. Last night was a mess. I'm so sorry, Ames. Yeah, it was. We've got a meeting with them Thursday. Think we can fix it before then? I don't know. You outed me to them. What's there to fix? Katrina scrunches her nose. Yeah, but those guys were on your side. He sits on the bed next to her. Quietly he says, Abby is the project manager for them. And Josh is dealing with the contract. If they tell either of those two what you said. Well he pauses you effectively told the whole company last night that I used to be a transsexual. Katrina's face goes slack. Oh god. Oh fuck. Those guys probably won't tell, right? I mean, why would they? Ames shrugs. Who knows what they'll do? He wants to add that she really fucked him over, but she seems to know. Katrina groans. We can deal with this, Ames. I'm sure we can. Maybe. Maybe not. But maybe it's okay in the long run. Maybe we're even now. Even in hungover remorse, she's not quite having it, and looks up at him from under a curtain of hair. I feel awful, but I don't know if comparing our crimes is a road you want to go down. Well, what then? What's next? She winces. Coffee and breakfast. Then we strategize. We've got a day before we meet with them again. 
I meant about us. Not just about work. What are we going to do about us? He puts his hand over where he guesses hers is under the covers and gets a wrist. Do you still want me to explain everything? That was the plan last night. I want to show you I can let you in. She grimaces, then says, more water. He takes his hand off her wrist to hand her another bottle. She drinks half of it in a go, then wipes her mouth. Yeah, we'll do that too. But not until after food and caffeine. They sit at Oak Street Beach after breakfast. The wind has changed direction since the previous evening, a warmer summerish breeze from the south that has pacified the previous night's chop. The air smells totally different. Katrina is caught in the stupor of her hangover. The time strikes him as good as any to tell her about transition. She regards him flatly, emotions ironed out of her effect by the weight of her headache. He tells her about cross-dressing as a kid. About trying to make it a part-time thing. About how his parents hadn't spoken to him for a year when he finally went on hormones. How meek he had felt as a trans woman. The exhaustion of knowing you're vulnerable. Of seeing bizarre and nonsensical creatures on television and realizing that they were your reflection, as seen through the funhouse mirror of the world's impressions of trans women. He tells her of the courage it took him, every day, just to go to the corner store the preparations just to leave the house, put on your makeup, keep your shoulders back, walk with an imaginary book on your head, your hips under your spine but still swaying, and keep that emotional armor tight and polished. The cold stab of fear that hit when something tiny happened say, a teenage boy follows you home from the store, and says appreciatively, hey, baby, where were you made? A weird compliment of a catcall that hints how close the boy has come to the edge of figuring something true but if you speak, he'll hear the real answer in the timbre of your voice. And then you fear the boy will get ashamed and then violent. This recitation of facts and memories, though they seem to captivate Katrina, has so far been totally unsatisfactory to Ames, he's barely begun to skirt the contradiction of knowing his trans, yet having detransitioned. It's like trying to explain one's childhood in a matter of minutes. Everything sounds cliché. Everything gets boiled down to types. He's relieved when she makes a slight conversational detour away from his own story. She's suggested, in the way that naive CIS people do, with a hint of self-congratulation at their own broad-mindedness, that it seems like trans people are starting to be everywhere, that maybe gender doesn't matter that much. In his reply, he can't help but let loose an old defensiveness on this topic. I think it's the opposite, he says too sharply. The whole reason transsexuals transition is because gender matters so incredibly much. Does it matter to you like that still, she asks. Yeah, he admits. This fatherhood thing is proving that I think it'll always matter to me. So even though you detransitioned, you still consider yourself transgender. Her question isn't cruel, it's fact-gathering. She has recognized an important data point. I don't think it's something you outgrow. She peers at him, squinting a little in the sunlight. Why did you detransition, then? He scoops up a handful of sand, feels it run through his fingers. Do you want the cold facts or the abstract reason? The cold facts. Two things happened that were related. I convinced myself that I couldn't protect and satisfy the girl I loved, also a trans woman, while being trans myself. The other thing that happened was that I got beaten on the street and no one helped me. It was the last straw. Living as a trans woman just seemed too fucking hard after that. In New York. Brooklyn. But not what that makes it sound like. It was a rich white guy who did it. In Williamsburg. He wore car keys. His getaway car was an Audi SUV. Katrina gave him a once-over, as though looking for wounds or evidence, as if he were saying it had just happened. So you got sick of being trans? 
I got sick of living as trans. I got to a point where I thought I didn't need to put up with the bullshit of gender in order to satisfy my sense of myself. I am trans, but I don't need to do trans. Ames could run through this routine without even thinking about it. How many times had he tried to explain his detransition to other trans women? Tried to assuage the sense of betrayal that their wariness obviously communicated. In Ames's formulation, trans women knew what trans women were, they knew how to be, but they didn't know how to do. All the intratrans fights online, all the arguments with CIS people, all of it was just to define what it meant to be a trans woman, to say what she was. But when you're a trans woman, there's almost nothing out there on how to actually live. In his last year of living as a woman the year in which Ames stopped being so angry with how CIS people treated trans people and he started growing sad and contemplative about how trans women treat each other he came up with a private, not particularly catchy term for the trans women of his cohort, the ones who began transition in the early 2010s. He called them juvenile elephants. Nowadays, Ames didn't really feel that he had the right to say anything much about trans women, but if you had asked him that year, he would have told you about juvenile elephants. In 2002, park rangers in the Hlulu Imphalozi Game Reserve in South Africa hunted down and shot a gang of three juvenile elephants that had made a sport of chasing, raping, and killing rhinoceroses. The elephant gang raped and murdered 63 rhinos before the park rangers caught up with them. In Sierra Leone, another herd of elephants raised a village of 300, flattening the mud and wattle homes, and killing an elderly woman who attempted to chase them away. A young elephant in that pack, barely full-grown, pinned the woman to the ground with a knee, and slowly gored his tusk through her chest with malicious precision. Toward the end of the civil war in northern Uganda, Karamung villagers began to leave out poison-laced elephant snacks, to retaliate against raids by the legally protected elephants of nearby Kidepo Park, who smashed the homes in the adjacent villages to get drunk on the fermenting fruit the Karamung used to brew wine. Perhaps the villagers needn't have bothered. Since the mid-90s, 90% 90 of male elephant deaths in South African game parks could be attributed to murder by other roving gangs of pachydermicidal elephants, a 1500% increase in elephant-on-elephant -elephant violence over previous decades. Ames learned all this in an essay titled Elephant Breakdown, published in the science journal Nature, in which a group of leading elephant behaviorists argued that the abnormal quality and frequency of elephant attacks and violence could no longer be understood through the long-standing reasoning that suggested high levels of testosterone in young males or competition for scant land and resources. No, the behaviorists argued, the younger generation of elephants suffered from a form of chronic stress, a species-wide trauma that has led to a total and ongoing breakdown of elephant culture. The cause is simple, throughout their long history, elephants have lived in intricately ordered social structures. Young elephants learned their place and healthy behavior in concentric societal rings of caregivers' birth mother, aunts, grandmothers, friends' relationships that might last a lifetime. 70 years or more. Unless orphaned, young elephants stay within 15 feet of their mothers for the first eight years of their lives. When an elephant dies, her family members grieve and ritually mourn. The bereaved conduct week long vigils by the body, covering it with brush and rubbing their trunks along the teeth of the lower jaw of the carcass, a gesture of greeting among live elephants. This millennial generation of elephants is an orphan generation. In the last few decades, humans have murdered, mutilated, or displaced an entire generation of older elephants who might have bestowed upon this generation the familial, societal, and emotional skills required to handle one's individual 15,000 pounds of muscle and bone, through which courses intolerable memories of pain, trauma, and grief. When the park rangers in South Africa finally caught and shot the three elephants responsible for the rhino assaults in the park, researchers examined the corpses and determined that all three perpetrators had been transported by wardens to the game reserve some years earlier. All three had been adolescent males, 
originally found as juveniles chained to the bodies of their dead and dying relatives a practice that poachers commonly employ so that the park rangers can find and handle the young ones, much as fishermen toss back young fish. Once transported to a new locale, a savanna free of any elders, the three traumatized elephants found each other, bonded in mutual sorrow and grief, and wreaked their vengeance on each other and the world. Ames, having explained the condition of juvenile elephants, drew this metaphor, trans women are juvenile elephants. We are much stronger and more powerful than we understand. We are 15,000 pounds of muscle and bone forged from rage and trauma, armed with ivory spears and faces unique in nature, living in grasslands where any of the ubiquitous humans may or may not be a poacher. With our strength, we can destroy each other with ease. But we are a lost generation. We have no elders, no stable groups, no one to teach us to countenance pain. No matriarchs to tell the young girls to knock it off or show off their own long lives lived happily and well. Those older generations of trans women died of HIV, poverty, suicide, repression, or disappeared to pathologized medicalization and stealth lives and that's if they were lucky enough to be white. They left behind only scattered exhausted voices to tell the angry lost young when and how the pain might end to tell us what will be lost when we lash out with our considerable strength, or use the fragile shards of what remain of our social networks to ostracize, punish, and retaliate against those who behave in a traumatized manner. And so we become what we have seen. How could we know not to? Have you seen many orphaned juvenile elephants behaving otherwise? Katrina puts her hand under the little waterfall of sand that cascades down between his fingers. I realize my knowledge about trans people is largely just the detritus that floats around the zeitgeist. But like, I got into IU Pool's drag race for a couple of seasons. And on those, they're constantly talking about mothers, and calling each other mothers. Like, just at a casual distance, I guess I thought of mother roles as part of trans culture. Ames hadn't expected Katrina to question him on his own trans knowledge. He'd forgotten how much the culture had changed even in the few years since he detransitioned. Caitlyn Jenner and Levin Cox on the covers of magazines, straight people talking about drag race the way they used to talk about Survivor. And of course, trans motherhood had always been Reese's particular obsession. But he doesn't yet want to start talking about Reese to Katrina. Yeah, he admits. On Are You Paul, those are brown girls talking. Same for trans women of color. They had mother relationships. Katrina laughs. Wait, I ignored your self-pity about how it sucked to be a woman, but now you're saying you feel sorry for yourself cause you were a white girl. On matters of race, Ames feigned a casualness at odds with his actual tendencies to avoid the topic. Of Katrina's two races, he subconsciously found himself often appealing to the white one, and at times over the course of their relationship, she had recalled for him that he was not, in fact, speaking to a white person just like himself. In those moments, as now, a wash of defensiveness lapped at the edge of his emotions. Usually the elephant story really buttered people up. When he speaks again it is without any plan. Yeah. I have the bad habit of saying trans women when I mean white trans women, which is how you can tell I was a white trans woman, it's endemic among white trans women. I'm not saying it's harder for white girls at all. I'm saying that the white girls I knew the generation that I transitioned into, the media that basically invented screaming online were a tribe of motherless women without survival or social skills, prone to destruction suicide, and romanticizing their own abjection. I'm saying that no matter whatever sloganistic squishy ideology I might have pretended to adhere to, deep down I was ashamed to be one of them, and ashamed of the thwarted life I led. Even the white women who survived and managed to mature didn't want to deal with mothering all that, and immature white girls were too angry and self-righteous to accept mothering anyway. God knows that all the brown trans women I knew were careful to call themselves trans women of color and not just trans women and I don't blame them for emphasizing the distinction.
I suppose that the black and brown mothers out there might take offense to my including their daughters among the orphaned elephants. Katrina shrugs and addresses the understatement with another understatement, yeah, probably. But beyond that she only asks, so what did you do? I stopped being an elephant. I became something else. She still holds a handful of sand, seeming to have forgotten about it, squinting one eye at Ames in the sunlight. But elephants can't stop being elephants. Or more to the point, women can't just stop being women. I can't stop being a woman just because it's hard not that I would even if I could. I know. That's my problem. So do you think about retransitioning? Would you put a traumatized juvenile elephant back where the poachers killed her mother? She tosses the sand aside, but little dry brown burrs in the sand cling to the edge of her sleeve. Shouldn't the correct answer be that those elephants eventually grow up and just chill the fuck out? Yeah. At some point juvenile elephants become adult elephants. Then, eventually, they have their own kids, and hopefully, they treat those kids right and they get to reconstruct the matriarchy. Something clicks for Katrina, she pulls her hands close to her, defensively. Is this your way of talking about the pregnancy? He sighs. Yeah. It's hard for me. I've got some fear going on. I talk obliquely when I'm scared. Charcoal smoke passes on the breeze. Two men debate in Spanish the optimal way to set a small hibachi grill into the rocks of the breakwater, while their families play soccer on the grass alongside the boulders. Down on the beach ripples lap against the shore and a couple introduces their child to the water's edge. The woman wears a red one-piece. She leans over her daughter, pointing out little freshwater shells and seaweed. The child wears a white hat to shield her from the sun. A man stands protectively off to the side, poised to leap into action, should anything approach from either lake or shore to threaten his wife or child. The scene could be b-roll footage for wholesome family time. It's too much for Ames, like the world has chosen to mock him at that moment. After moments of silence Katrina begins, apropos of little. My friend Diana and I were talking. You met her last year at the NYF advertising dinner. She's baby crazy and trying to make some choices. We were saying that it seems like all of our mutual friends who got pregnant act like they got sure of everything in pregnancy. That nature just makes that shorty happen. You don't actually have to decide things. Instead you get some kind of biological mama bear instinct that shows you the way. I don't feel that way. My mama instinct hasn't kicked in. I don't know what to do. She laughs, not happily, she stares too intently at the flower gardens in the middle distance, blinking back emotion. He wets his lips, pauses, and says, what are you thinking about doing? Katrina throws her palms up, helplessly. I've been waiting for you to give me some input. But since you can't do that, I have to consider ending the pregnancy. It's not like it sounds like you're going to be a father. Or whatever. No. No? No, don't end the pregnancy. He's fumbling with his words, trying to pull up some semblance of bravery. This is what I'm saying. You don't have to be a single mom. I don't know if I can be a father but like, I can be a parent. Katrina drops the stone she'd been fidgeting with. She gives a hard stare. What's the distinction? He still can't quite find the courage to tell her what he'd offered Reese. His own weaseling shames him, and he sits up straight, as if a physical backbone has some connection to a metaphorical one. No. But like, I think if I'm going to do this, I need to be back in the trans community or at least have other trans people involved. I need to be with people who understand where I've been. What are you talking about? Ames cocks his head in involuntary sheepishness. Well, I talked to Reese. Who? Remember that girl I told you about earlier? Reese? 
my ex. When I used to complain about not knowing how to live she just scoffed at me and said, I'm going to live and do like millions of women before me, I'm going to be a mother. Our plan had been to become parents. To raise a child. I think if she was part of raising our child, I could do it. As our baby's godmother or something. I don't think I'd have a problem with that. Well, I was thinking of a role closer than that. Like another mother or something. Katrina holds her breath, the way one does when contemplating the water below from a high dive. There's a lot roiling just behind that stillness, but Ames can't read it, so he just goes on, letting his words tumble out. I believe she will love a child more fiercely than anyone else I've ever met. It'll be hard, because she's trans and I'm. He searches for the word, and abandons it, I'm as you know I am but she's the type to turn hardship into hardness like a shield for people she loves. That baby will be safer with her than at the center of a fortress. And I think we could do it with her parent, I mean. I've been trying to feel what I want, and I want to be with you, Katrina. I'm afraid if you end the pregnancy, it'll end our relationship with it. So I want to be a parent with you. And with Reese, I could be a parent without being seen as a father. Maybe only with her. Katrina blinks. Wisps of hair have freed themselves from her ponytail and tremble in the light breeze. She swallows before speaking. You're, like, actually crazy. Her tone borders on shock. Like a sociopath or something. No one could believe you'd ask that. No one will believe it. She doesn't sound angry. She sounds as if she's speaking to herself. Just think about it. What am I, some kind of walking uterus to you? Have you seen pregnant women? Do you think I would choose to go through that just to play a part in giving a baby to your ex-lover? Do you have any respect for my body? Do you value me at all? Ames tries to calm down, reminding himself how much he really cares about her. Katrina. Please understand I mean this, I will support you however I can. But you're not being exploited here. You actually do have the power. You say no, that's a no. You tell me what to do, and I'll do it. But you've asked me for honesty all week to tell you what I really think would work, and now I have. Katrina stares at him in a strange wonder. Then with a sudden gesture of her hand she waves back the wonder, tucks away the moment the way you pocket the business card of someone you're sure you'll never call. At just that moment, Ames's phone rings. It's BizDev. He tilts the screen so she can see. Take it, he asks her. Yeah, you better. On Thursday, the pet insurance representatives sign a contract to add web functionality to the app. No one mentions Katrina's dinner behavior or drunken revelation. Only once does Ames catch Biz Dev scrutinizing him. On a break, Katrina says to him, maybe it will be fine. Maybe they just thought I was drunk. To Ames it feels like wishful thinking, but too many other things crowd out his attention, so he agrees and slowly begins to indulge in that same line of thought. It will be fine. Those guys don't care, right? And so what if they do? On the plane ride home, they fly business, sitting beside each other. Katrina rubs his arm in a friendly, distracted way that he can't make sense of, so he pats her hand in an avuncular manner that immediately dismays him. At La Guardia, when he asks if she wants to share a cab, she declines. I need some space. I need you to give me some time to myself. I'll call when I feel like talking again. It is Monday when she approaches him again, by calling him into her office. The weekend of silence has been agony. She doesn't sit behind her desk. Instead, she closes the door, and perches in a chair beside him. Ames, I thought about it all and Katrina begins, but the solemnness of the moment, the sense of portent, is broken, because a strand of her hair has slipped and gotten to her lip gloss. 
Ah, she says. This is what I get for freshening my makeup before you came in. Backfire. She's visibly nervous, and picks the hair free and tucks it behind her ear. Anyway, what I was going to say is that I told my mom. You told her everything. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't tell my friends, and I couldn't be alone with it anymore. Ames nods. Then, in a way that even the pregnancy test or the conversation with Reese had not, the pregnancy becomes real to him. It is no longer their secret. It is no longer just theirs or with the people with whom he had shared it. It was one step further to being public. A known fact. Collective knowledge. He had fathered a child. My mom is someone who I know for sure is on my side, even if I was really afraid of her judgment. Katrina says. I was expecting her to tell me to run away from you. I guess I even wanted that. Someone to make you the villain so I didn't have to. But you know what? She wasn't even that judgy. Who knew? Turns out mom has some wisdom about mothering. Ames hadn't even considered that Katrina might tell her mother. Because he had gone so long without telling his own mother anything. He had forgotten such an act was possible, much less permissible. But of course Katrina had told her mother. Several times in the past, he had been on the couch, just out of view of her phone's camera, when she chatted on video with her mother. And he had heard, firsthand, the conversation between two women on such familiar terms with each other's lives that they spoke in near code, nicknames, allusions, inside jokes. Some time when Katrina was in college, Ames knew, her father had fallen off a ladder. The fall resulted in a traumatic brain injury. He spent three weeks in a coma, then awoke an angrier, more impulsive man. Maya nursed him through a year that Katrina winced to describe, then left him, though the two never officially divorced. In singledom, Maya bloomed, moving to the Bay Area, where in the first housing bubble, she built a niche as an interior designer providing, as with the bare print couch, unexpected home decor touches. Her reputation survived the crash, and as tech millionaires bought up and down the bay, her name made its way to one of the prominent Mrs. Googles, who wanted to remodel her vacation home in Montana. After that job, Maya had all the work she could take. When she called Katrina, it was usually on the pretext of showing her some item she'd found, asking her daughter if maybe this time it was too weird, if she'd gone too far. On the first phone call Ames overheard, it was a set of antique dresses, which Maya had reproposed as wall hangings, and he was so curious as to how exactly this was to work that he nearly blundered into the line of the camera's sight and revealed himself as an incorrigible eavesdropper. Katrina's hair has gotten caught in her lip gloss again. This time, she pulls an elastic from her wrist and ties her hair back, as she continues to speak. Katrina has only met her grandmother once, she tells him. Her grandma had never grown comfortable speaking intimately in English. She was not pleased to have a granddaughter who looked more like the American parent and spoke only like that American parent. I don't know what she said to my mom, Katrina says, that one time we visited, but I know it was a short visit. When Katrina told her mother she was pregnant this past weekend, Maya had begun to cry, and at first Katrina thought that Maya was upset with Katrina's situation. But that was not it. Maya was crying because she couldn't help recalling the things her own mother had said to her when Maya herself had become pregnant with Katrina. Maya's unborn child with this suspicious man, Isaac, Maya's mother had intimated, would not be welcomed into the family. The coldness and distaste that Maya's mother had shown for Isaac would be shown as well to his child. You know, my mom has never pressured me about having children, Katrina says. But on the phone this time, she said she wanted to be a grandma. That she has always felt guilty about how much I missed out on by not having a grandmother, and how often she fantasized about being the good grandmother that I never had. I didn't realize she had wanted it that badly. I'm impressed that she only badgered me a little about it all through my marriage with Danny. I'm sorry, Ames says. 
Actually, my mom was crying on the phone, and then I started crying too. And we were both crying about the same thing that I did and didn't have a grandma. Ames nods. He had a grandma, who was fine, he guessed. His family was a chain he'd voluntarily decoupled from in order to breathe, so he couldn't quite relate but now wasn't the time to say that. I thought about what you were saying about redemption, and I realized that I felt the same thing. That I had a chance to connect my mother to my child, to relink the maternal line that my birth broke. Ames couldn't help but sit up abruptly, suddenly wildly alert. So you're going to keep the baby? Well, that's the thing. I was talking to my mom. About you and what you proposed. About this woman, Reese. About my career, and my finances, and my time commitments, and what I want in a relationship, and well, so much. We were talking for hours, listening to each other and you know what she said? Katrina doesn't wait for Ames to ask but pushes on. This is going to sound crazy, but somehow, even though I'm nearly 40, when my mom approves of something, it makes it seem possible, like, not rebellious. You know? Like, when you want to do something wild as a teenager, and you realize your mom also thinks it's cool, suddenly it's like, doable. Katrina, Ames cuts in and puts his hand on his sternum to settle himself. He thinks he sees where Katrina is headed, and can't tell if his sudden anxiety would be better alleviated if he were right or if he were wrong about his suspicion. I know you're really good at dramatic presentations, but please, the suspense is killing me. My mom, well, after we talked about everything, she was like, the one thing I learned raising you through successes and failures is that the best way to be a mother is to do so with as many other moms around as possible. You laid out a number of options for me to choose from, and the thing is, honestly what if we had them all? I want my career, I want to build and commit with you, and a child is a lovely time-tested way for that. Meanwhile, you want this woman Reese as your family, and she wants a baby and respect and purpose as a mother, and my mom wants to be a grandma, and you and I could be good to a child, I think, and we all want it to be something redemptive. Ames waits and Katrina angles her glance at him slightly askance. So, she says, I'm just asking you what my mom asked, as like, a question to explore, but during your time, ah, in the queer world, was it common for people to raise children in a family that is what do you call it? Something like a triad? Chapter 4 Eight years before conception The poppers hit. Purple jellyfish expanded and pulsated across the backs of Amy's eyelids. She had just enough time to get her mouth back on Reese's soft cock before her constant interior monologue that complicated apparatus that processed all the raw signals from her body into a tolerable meaning, for the first time in her life, cut out. Some critical component of consciousness withdrew like the needle lifted from a still-spinning record. No words. No thought. Just raw, unprocessed, open fire hydrants of data that rushed in from Amy's senses. Time became a slippery fish among it. Fragments of atomized notions began to coagulate. Slips of words formed, as cosmic dust glums together by its own weak gravity, drawn together into molecules of gas, pressed against other molecules, collectively gravitated pressure growing, until a change, fusion, heat, light and Amy flared back into an interior language, into words, and the possibility of reason. The purple jellyfish descended back into the depths. Her vision cleared. Where was she? Oh. There, sobbing with Reese's cock in her mouth. Shivering. How long had she been sobbing? She didn't want to sob, she wanted to kiss the pretty dick resting on the pad of her tongue. For the last month, she had been obsessed with Reese, all she wanted to do was get closer and closer to her. It was to the point that the phrase I just want to eat you up took on shades of the literal digestive incorporation being the only act that Amy could imagine getting her closer to Reese than sex. Just an hour before, Amy had watched Reese brush her teeth, her long brown hair hanging loose, and her arm pistoning back and forth so hard as she brushed that her tits waggled side to side under her slinky nightgown. 
Amy decided it was the sexiest thing she had ever seen, topping each of the 50 other Reese actions she decided one after another that day was the sexiest vision ever. The simultaneous emotions of wanting Reese so badly, the happiness of actually having her, and the fear that something might happen to either herself or Reese to ruin it all made her stomach fizz with a virulent form of a crush. Mixed in with the crush sickness, stiffening out the saccharine taste, floated a few drops of unease. Amy's trust of Reese was shaky. Or rather, the fact that she didn't fully trust Reese, that she couldn't quite map squarely the Reese she knew onto the Reese about whom she'd heard stories. The expression suite of personality disorders had been said to her about Reese by two different people. Amy couldn't say whether the expression had been repeated simply because it was a catchy queer-proved pseudo-psychological way to talk shit or whether the phrase arose independently each time because it apparently described Reese so well. But either way, the general consensus when Amy moved Reese into her apartment a week after meeting was, one, yes, that's exactly how Reese operates and two, girl, be careful. The first person to use the expression about Reese had been a trans guy named Ricky, whom Reese had dumped cold when she took up and moved in with Stanley, the rich finance guy Reese had left for Amy. I don't know exactly what Reese's diagnosis would be, Ricky told Amy, when she volunteered to help him fix his motorcycle, which mostly consisted of handing him tools, Amy was ideal for the task because she knew enough about engines and tools to play assistant but she also understood that ogling a trans guy while he fixed his motorcycle was gender validation time for them both. But it's got to be a whole suite of personality disorders. Come on, Amy chided, just say you don't like her, don't play armchair psychiatrist. Ricky hesitated. He'd propped his motorcycle, some sort of a 1970s era Honda, on its center stand in the middle of the Bushwick sidewalk. Pedestrian stepped over the scattered panelling he'd removed. Reese has a lot of amazing qualities, Ricky said, but I'm probably the wrong person to enumerate them cause and it hurts my pride to say this I was stupid enough to let her casually break my heart. I'm not going to say anything more if you're too wrapped up with her to hear it. Please tell me. She's so incredibly charming when she wants to be, Ricky said, crouching by the chain but she has only a few close friends. That alcoholic, Iris, who I trust less than her, and otherwise, just whoever else is infatuated with her at any given moment. Sociopaths and pathological liars are charming like that. They'll read you, process you, figure out your insecurities, then tell you everything you want to hear because for as long as they desire you, they believe it too. But eventually, it falls apart and you figure out it isn't true can you put an 8mm socket on the quarter-inch ratchet? A Amy attached the socket and handed it to him. She noticed that he gripped the chain without regard for the grease getting all over his hands. So masculine. Last time she had seen him he had one of those ironic bowl cuts that queers inexplicably loved. Having worn that cut herself as a little child, Amy couldn't quite shake her infantile associations with that look, the faded memory of sitting in a barber's chair with a balloon-printed bib around her tiny neck, hair falling away from the sides of her head in tufts under the buzzer's drone, while the barber called her little man and her mom tutted handsome. Still, she always complimented bowl cuts, because she'd made enthusiastic appreciation of queer style an important part of her social approach, regardless of her actual opinions. Since she'd last seen him, Thank God, he had shaved off the bowl and left his hair and stubble the same length, which Amy could compliment with much more genuine gushing. Reese doesn't tell you what's true, Ricky concluded. She tells you what you most need to hear. Stuff that you told yourself no one would ever understand about you she figures it out and tells you. Tells you that the thing about you that you most want to be is exactly what she loves about you. It's fucking intoxicating. It's like drinking validation from some psychoactively seductive source. She loves being that source. She loves being the thing you need so bad. She means it all too, but only for the moment she's directing her charm at you. Like the love and joy you feel on Molly or something, it's real while you feel it, but only for that long. He grimaced as he pried a bolt loose. 
she's not intentionally cruel. That's why I say she's just got, like, personality disorders. And she ends up hurting people, so then she's alone, which makes her lonely enough to do it even more. Amy didn't know how much to believe. The tendency of lay queers to assign other people's psychological pathologies struck her as boring and tautological. A certain person does a thing because that person is the type of person who is compelled to do that thing. No capacity for either change or responsibility or even a consideration of the why, much less the how, of a particular human. Why does the cat torture the injured mouse? Because the cat is a cat and so shall it be forever. Besides, rumor was, famously stoic Ricky had gotten drunk and then loudly, inconsolably, and theatrically sobbed in the corner of a hay queen. Party the night he discovered Reese had left him to move in with a finance guy. Maybe he had to pathologize Reese into a sociopathic, manipulative, emotional mastermind in order to explain his own vulnerability to heartbreak. Look, Ricky said, reading Amy's skepticism. Here's a story, one time I slept over at her house. If you know her, you already know she is incapable of hanging up a towel after using it. She left early to meet someone for coffee, so I stayed in bed for a while, then I took a shower, picked up her towel from the floor she only had one dried off with it, and carefully folded it in thirds and hung it up over the top of her closet door. Then I left. Three days later we go to her house. And the towel is exactly where I left it. But she's freshly showered and made up. Aha, uh -huh, Amy said. She wasn't sure she was going to believe any story that turned on a towel. But on the other hand, it was true, Reese left all her clothes and towels wherever they fell when she was done with them. Ricky dropped the ratchet to focus on telling his story. It hit the concrete sidewalk with a clink. He needed to wave his hands around in order to express how much this incident exasperated him. So I ask her where she got ready, and she gives me a look like I'm crazy and says, at home, of course. So I point to the towel and I was like, how did you dry off? That towel hasn't moved in three days. Ricky paused for effect. She fucking lost it. She doesn't say she has two towels. Or that she air dried herself. Instead she starts screaming at me like, what are you, a towel detective? Did you fucking solve the case of the folded towel? It would have been almost funny, but she was so wild-eyed about it that it was straight up alarming. Especially because she wasn't trying to be funny, she wanted to demean me. It just devolved into what kind of insecure loser I was, leaving booby trap towels in her room. Calling me jealous. Asking what kind of man I was who had to know where she was all the time. And I you know, I just back down, because what am I going to do, make my last stand over a towel? And as a result, I never really asked where she was that night. Or if she was gone for three days, or just one night. But I was dying inside, because it's one thing to be like, okay, she's seeing someone else. But the way she does it, it's like she's furtively hiding another life that you aren't allowed access to. And here's why it's poison, on one hand, she has this incredible ability to sense what you desperately need to hear, to see your insecurities and placate them. On the other hand, she's secretive and she lies. So it feels like the things she told me that felt so good are lies. That, in reality, everything I fear about myself is correct. It's murder on your self-esteem. You doubt yourself. You end up feeling way worse about yourself when she leaves. You know, you know what the worst part is, he continued. I finally put together a conjecture, whose towel was she probably actually using? That finance douch bag. Who was secretly paying for the apartment. Which she also hid from me. A guy who is jealous and has to know where she is all the time. The kind of guy she demeaned me for being is what she really wanted all along. At this last statement, his hands flapped around like wounded seagulls. He inhaled, calmed himself, and picked up the dropped ratchet. I'm telling you, personality disorders. 
His assessment had been echoed even by those who'd never crushed out on Reese. Ingrid, one of the trans girls who'd been around Brooklyn at least as long as Reese, had said in half admiration and half condemnation, Reese is the only trans girl in this city whose incessant drama really has almost nothing to do with the fact that she's trans. Her drama is just what she makes for herself as a woman. Two weeks later, Amy lay crumpled in bed, having inhaled poppers for the first time, and decided that nothing felt as good as being vulnerable to Reese, so fuck whatever everyone else said. Might as well enhance that vulnerability with chemicals, and Reese had whispered to Amy that the poppers would make her helpless, docile, and pliable. Amy's whole problem pre-transition had been a complete inability to ever let anyone far enough past her defenses to glimpse any vulnerability. She'd always shut down or dissociated first in order to avoid it. If Reese had some magical ability to see what Amy most craved, to see past her crust of armor to what that tender, kneeling inner self most wanted then please, oh, please, bring it on. Amy hadn't expected to have such a strong crush only in movies did people fall for each other in a matter of weeks or days, and even in movies only the most sentimental characters could believably do so. So when it happened to her, she wasn't ready for it. For the past year and a half, peering into her future provided her with only the haziest of views, a grey mist in which the barest outlines of events began to reveal themselves only one to two months away. Transition had been the first of a number of unthinkables. Other unthinkables had been her long-term girlfriend breaking up with her, her parents refusing to speak with her, the shattering of her own confidence. She'd lied to herself about her own gender for so long and lied so deeply, how could she have any faith in her own convictions? Whoa, babe, whoa, whoa. Reese's voice came gently. Take it easy, sweetie. What's the matter? Her hand on Amy's shoulder gently pushed Amy away, and still uncoordinated, Amy tumbled back like a rice sack into the scrum of blankets, one leg falling off the mattress. Amy's vision came to rest on the attack of the 50-foot woman poster that Reese cut into three strips and hung like a triptych by the now-darkened window. Amy didn't like the poster at all, but that came with a certain pleasure a perverse stab of joy waking up every morning to the sight of stupid kitsch in what had before been her intentionally sparsely decorated bedroom because it meant she no longer inhabited it alone. Post poppers, Amy couldn't stop crying or shivering. Couldn't explain that everything was fine. She only managed to say oh we, and weakly held out her hand, trying to signal that everything was fine. Her teeth clattered, and Reese leaned over, pressed her body weight down on Amy, and wrapped the comforter around them both. Reese's amused voice showed only a touch of concern as she murmured, Baby, what just happened? Only twenty minutes later had Amy returned sufficiently to herself to begin to explain. Amy had made a seat with four pillows, Reese's two and her two. She could tell her pillows and Reese's pillows apart because she couldn't seem to get Reese to stop sleeping in her makeup, so two of the four pillowcases, once a bright solid yellow, now had squiggly patterns, single eyeliner wings pointing off in haphazard directions among the centipede footprints of mascara-drenched lashes. Taylor Swift played from Reese's laptop. God, those poppers made me so dumb, Amy ventured. Of course, countered Reese, who snapped shut her laptop now that Amy no longer appeared aphasic. Poppers are supposed to make you dumb. A dumb little slut with zero inhibitions just how I like you. Reese hesitated. This was perhaps too direct. For as much as Amy was able to say that she was in love to the point of sickness their sex had not been good. It had been tentative, quiet both intense and mild. Penetration was aborted in favor of oral, or even more frequently, mutual masturbation the more sex became like cybersex or coming, only in person the more comfortable Amy seemed. Reese surmised that the majority of sexual situations in which Amy had genuinely felt at ease had occurred within easy reach of an off switch. Reese had been trying to get Amy to loosen up, to begin to curb Amy's habitual shutdown at the prospect of sex to keep Amy present, and in the body Amy had spent a lifetime learning to avoid acknowledging. But it was a tightrope walk, tell Amy what to do too forcefully 
and her shame at the prospect that she was not great at sex would make her dissociate, but leave her to her own devices and patterns, and she'd dissociate from the start. Telling her what was cute might have been too much, so Reese added, but poppers are not supposed to make you shiver and cry. I want you helpless, but not that kind of helpless. Amy nodded. I'm not sure why I shivered. Maybe my blood pressure dropped too much. Amy had seen signs at Callan Lord warning against the use of poppers while on Viagra because both caused drops in blood pressure. She hadn't taken Viagra, but she had uncommonly low blood pressure, a consequence of her spiro, the testosterone blocker she took every morning in two round 100mg pills that looked and tasted like breath mints made from corpses. Reese said gently, but, baby, why did you start crying? Amy tried out an explanation. The poppers made me dumb, she said. That was the problem and what was so good. So dumb I had to be present. The first year of transition, Amy discovered, was about learning how much you've lied to yourself. How unreliable your own self-assessments were and how little the sense of self from your past could be put to good use in transition. The awful part was watching what therapy called your coping mechanisms flame out. There was a moment in which you could catch a glimpse of how scared you'd been and the degree of pain in which you'd been living as a boy, before that pain and fear actually hit you and shredded you. The same way in which 1950s films captured men in early atomic bomb tests watching the flash and mushroom cloud rise, marveling at the Shivesque destruction for just a split second before the shockwave and heat sent their searing bodies flying backward, along with the camera recording those bodies, and after which nothing could be seen, only felt. And then you developed new coping mechanisms, new language, new walls to keep yourself safe. The problem with the poppers was that they made Amy too dumb to keep all that cognitive machinery going. It all ground to a halt, and instead of the new lies, she fell into direct contact with a raw fact, she was a girl in love with a girl. It was overwhelming. It was all she had ever hoped for. To say that Amy had never before had sex as a woman was the kind of thing that trans activists would take issue with. Feel free to peruse the Tumblr Twitter industrial complex for all the ways that trans women have always been women even before they transitioned. But for Amy it was the first time she saw herself fucking as a woman without laying a psychic veil over whatever sexual scene was occurring, the first time it just was rather than something that, with effort, she could manage to see. It was the first time she had been present as the woman she so obviously had been all along, a woman who required no effort to be present, and who connected directly with Reese. So often when she had sex, she allocated the majority of her mental capacity to managing her own impression of herself as she fucked, with a secondary concern being her partner's impression of her. This allocation left little mental energy for actually desiring her partner, much less vocalizing or displaying that desire. Which, she knew, did not make her a good lover. It made her a bad lover, and this was, in fact, her impression of her own sexual prowess, disappointing, tepid, with occasional flashes of mediocrity. The exception to this was the men she slept with back when she was a crossdresser and called herself a sissy. She did not care about those men, was not attracted to men, and so didn't care what their impressions were they were simply another feminizing accessory, albeit a difficult and unwieldy accessory. But when deployed right, they were even better than a corset for making a girl feel dainty. Their job was to provide lots of masculine contrast to her girliness, a task they set about diligently, because most of them were straight identified, married, and therefore invested in getting to enjoy her body while avoiding any thought that allowed them to ponder why the thing that made their cocks hard was a hard cock on a girl. The whole object of these encounters and the men acted reciprocally involved ignoring the man's needs in order to instead focus on herself and what kind of person she must be that a man was using her for his own sexual enjoyment, even as she ignored the particular man and his particular need. Amy lost her virginity when she was 15 to a 17-year-old cougar named Delia. Delia was punk, with PC bleached and waxed hair and threadbare vintage shirts that advertised intentionally on cool brands Pepsi. 
taste of a new generation and overall gestalt that read to the adults in their lives as troubled. Delia had been in and out of hospitals with an eating disorder, had tried both coke and heroin, and the rumor at school was that she had done anal after a rave with a 28-year-old. Whether or not that was true, she always made out with other girls at parties. Three weeks after Delia and Amy slept together for their one time, Delia's parents mortgaged their house to send her to one of those military detox schools in the middle of the desert, where semi-professional guards locked kids in their rooms or left them in the middle of the wilderness. Amy never saw Delia again after that. The afternoon she lost her virginity, she was not supposed to be with Delia. Instead, she was supposed to be going home, putting on a decent collared shirt, and returning to school for an awards ceremony for her baseball team. Her team had come in 16th in the state, a feat that sounded solidly unimpressive, but because her school was a fraction of the size of the giant baseball breeding farms in the rural areas of Minnesota, had become something of a miracle story. Amy, in her own miracle, ended up stealing the most bases in the league that season, a feat she accomplished by leaning into pitches, getting hit, and taking a free base, then stealing her way around like a twitchy squirrel. Bruises brindled her left arm and torso from March until June. On the bus home after school the day of the baseball awards, Delia traced the stitching on Amy's jeans with her finger and said, my parents aren't home. Which was how Amy's own parents ended up sitting together at a baseball awards ceremony, increasingly embarrassed, as the coach repeatedly called out the name of their always baffling teenager to come receive a plaque while other parents stared at them questioningly. At that moment, the teenager in question was eating pussy. Something she'd never before done. She'd fingered a girl once, a girl who, to show she wasn't a slut, unbuttoned only the top button of her buttonfly jeans, leaving Amy little room to actually maneuver or learn anything in the space between denim and body. When Amy went in for a kiss and got an ear, the girl began to giggle, and Amy was relieved to withdraw her hand, she'd been terrified and ashamed that she was doing everything wrong. That her inept and cramped fumbling would make obvious to the girl what Amy already knew, that there was something wrong with her masculinity. That she was flawed in deep and terrible ways as a boy, and worse, that anything to do with socially expected sex would cause these flaws to reveal themselves. The only consolation came from the young adult authors she'd read, the books for girls that she'd taken from her sister and read in secret, where the common theme involved the anxious awfulness of teenage sex. In light of these stories except for the blustery eagerness to partake in sex that all the boys were supposed to have, an eagerness she barely registered in herself except as a social right that was dangerous not to perform she could almost convince herself she was normal. Why had she gone home with Delia? She knew her parents would be furious that she had skipped the awards. They had been so grateful that she'd finally given them something proper a son who was good at baseball of which to be proud as parents. And then she'd stolen that from them. And why? So she could tentatively go down on Delia. She had her face close to Delia's vagina, her body tense, like a cat attempting to sniff a candle's flame, ready to pull away at any sign of pain from this apparition. And yet, still, why? Did she want Delia's vagina? Did she want to taste it? That was what she was supposed to want. How many boys had she heard describe the taste of pussy? She opened her eyes and looked at it. She didn't know what was what or where. Stupid. How stupid she was. And above her, Delia waited, with her own eyes shut. Then Delia craned her neck forward and peered at Amy. How are you doing down there? Fine, Amy said. How incredibly stupid. Fine. The least committal, most unsexy word you could say. Fine was what you said when someone asked you how you were, and you didn't want to talk about it. She might as well have said, I am confused and ashamed. To counter for her shame, she began to lick, hoping to convince Delia of the eagerness she was supposed to have. Maybe this was how you did it. Hi up, Delia said from above. What? Use your tongue higher. 
Delia had her eyes shut again, frowning like she was concentrating hard on some thought. Amy cringed. It was awful how much she didn't know. Amy tried again, and after a moment Delia stopped her. Look, said Delia, as she spread her labia with two fingers, this is my clit. Amy nodded, but a second later, she realized she'd been too ashamed at having needed the instruction and hadn't paid attention. She'd focused instead on examining Delia's face for mockery or derision. This is not a big deal, she told herself. It is your first time. Delia knows that. She can't expect you to be good. Is it good? she asked Delia. Yes, said Delia flatly, in a way that Amy knew was a lie. What else could Delia say? Good, Amy said. I like it too. Two lies. The only thing worse would be if Delia faked an orgasm. Amy had seen an episode of Sex and the City where the four women talked about inadequate men they'd had to fake it for. Delia's leg twitched as if in involuntary pleasure, and Amy, to punish herself, thought, fake. How long did it go on for? Until Amy felt Delia gently touch her hair, which was short, fuzzily growing out from a buzz cut she'd impulsively given herself one night. Let's take a break, Delia said. Maybe just have sex. I like sex best. Okay. Okay, said Amy. She pushed herself up and tucked her legs under her to look around the room. A girl's room, more feminine than Delia's punk aesthetic might have indicated. Lavender accent wall that Delia said she had painted herself. Nail polish lined up along the windowsill under diaphanous sea green curtains wafting inward on a breeze. Amy loved getting girls to paint her nails. It happened less and less, though in middle school, girls loved to paint the boys' nails. By high school, they mostly didn't give a fuck what boys did with their nails. Clothes were piled up beside the bed, with a pleasantly faint odor of Delia, a scent that Amy previously hadn't known was the odor of Delia, until she smelled the clothes, and then it clicked. Next to the bed was a copy of Prozac Nation. Amy reached for it. She had never read the book, but she had gathered that this was a book you were supposed to make fun of. A lot of Amy's cultural touchstones in high school were like that, things to which she was ignorant or indifferent, but about which she opined her received wisdom. She didn't make fun of the book, though. On the bed, Delia looked so frail and so beautiful beneath the sheets she wanted Delia to hold her, or she wanted to hold Delia. She did not feel sexual. Once, on the bus home, Delia told Amy that she'd lost so much fat from her bulimia that her body grew a layer of soft down to stay warm and compensate for the lack of fat insulation. She didn't know how to help, but she liked how Delia had gotten in the habit of confiding in her. Delia had asked her if she could keep secrets, and for once, true to her word, Amy repeated nothing that Delia had told her. But looking over Delia's body, half illuminated by sunlight, with blocks of color from a small stained glass charm suction cup to the window, Delia's skin just looked soft and bare. Over the winter, when no one could see and it was acceptable to wear windbreaker pants to practice, Amy had shaved her legs and gotten terrible razor burn that turned into acne as seemingly each hair on the backs of her thighs inflamed itself into a pimple. It was bad enough that it hurt to sit down. How did girls like Delia avoid that? It's good, said Delia, of the book. I'm angry about the same things as her. Should I read it? Delia scoffed. I don't think it'd be your thing. What was Amy's thing? Pop punk and baseball? That's what people thought. Amy had pierced her ears over the winter, but her coach made her take the studs out. When her mom saw the little studs, she called Amy a dork. She didn't think her mom was using the word dork correctly, and that probably the word her mom was looking for but didn't know was poser. Still, getting called a dork hurt her feelings, because she understood what her mom meant, and if even her mom could see it, the other kids absolutely could too. Do you have condoms? Amy asked. 
She had never worn a condom. No, I'm on the pill. One of the few things my parents and I agree on. Amy nodded, and Delia smiled and cocked her head to the side. Take off your boxes. Amy did as she was told. She was not hard. She didn't know if her penis was good. Besides size, she didn't even know all the other ways it might not be good. Probably it wasn't, and she fought the urge to cover herself with a sheet. Come here, Delia said, and Amy cuddled up close to her. Delia's hand touched her. Amy was desperate to get hard. She began to concoct a fantasy. Something that fit with what was happening, but wasn't actually what was happening. She was Delia's pet. Her owner wanted her to get hard, and she didn't want to disappoint. It would happen whether she wanted it to or not. Her owner thought she was pretty. She looked at one of the bras laying on the floor and told herself, that's my bra, she took it off of me. Oh, you like that, Delia said. Amy was hard. Yeah, Amy whispered, afraid that the intrusion of reality might disperse the fantasy that let her get hard. You ready? Delia asked. Yeah. Delia threw off the sheets, lay on her back. She guided Amy in. The first thoughts Amy had were of warmth. Slow at first, Delia said. She had a half smile. It was too much. Too close to being laughed at. Amy shut her eyes and focused. But she could feel the sexual charge leaving her. She pulled the fantasy back up, she wasn't really fucking Delia. Delia was fucking her. She belonged to Delia. She was Delia's girl. Yeah, Amy said, and Delia made a noise like an affirmation. What did she wish Delia would say to her? Maybe something like you're mine. You're mine, she whispered to Delia. Delia's eyes widened in surprise and she pulled Amy closer. Delia liked it, Amy realized. Delia liked what Amy liked. What else did Amy want to hear? She submerged back into the fantasy, like sinking into a pool. She was in Delia's room. Delia was fucking her. Delia was grabbing her body. Telling her she was a hot little thing. And Amy was grabbing Delia's body. Was fucking her. She tried to call Delia a hot little thing but the words choked in her. So hot, she grunted. And back into the fantasy, Delia was calling her a slut, had a hand on her neck. Could she do that? I wanna make you my slut, Amy said. Delia looked up at her quizzically. You like talking dirty, Delia stated. Do you like it? Delia grinned. Yeah. Amy grabbed Delia's hair. Pulled her around. Can we do doggy? Amy asked. Yeah, said Delia, and pushed Amy off, turned over. And then Amy was back in. Both into Delia and into the fantasy. In two places at once. Amy wanted her ass grabbed. She grabbed Delia's ass. Delia moaned. She pictured Delia pinching her nipples and reached around and pinched Delia's tiny breasts. And then, without warning, Amy was coming. Not in the room with Delia, but in another similar room, where Delia was spanking her, where she was Delia's little slut, where Delia had her captive, where she was Delia's good girl, forever and ever. And then again, she was back in Delia's actual room. She'd collapsed on top of Delia. Wow, said Delia and it sounded genuine. Slowly she pulled herself off of Delia and Delia flipped over, and she nestled under Delia's arm. Amazingly, Amy had the sense that she had done a good job, that she was a good lover. Wherever she had gone, Delia hadn't noticed. And maybe that was how you have sex. Later, much later, she would learn the word for this, dissociation. She'd figured she had just been fantasizing. The word dissociate sounded pathologizing to her at first why should she be accused of dissociating when normal people get to call it fantasizing, 
and talk about how fantasy just made their sex better and better. But pathology felt more and more apt the more sex she had. It took her a while to understand the cyclical loneliness of disappearing in dissociation during sex. That people have sex for a shared joy that keeps an existential loneliness at bay, so when she disappeared inside of herself, her more experienced partner sensed that absence and her disappearance hurt them. Since she dreaded hurting those she most wanted to connect with, she grew to dread and avoid sex with specifically those most liked people. And of course, clearly dreading having to have sex with a person only hurt that person more and drove them away concluding in a final angst in which the loneliness that had made her want to connect with someone in the first place returned upon her tenfold with every attempt to have sex. In fact, it was Reese who had best named the sex Amy had been having for most of her life. You learned how to fuck like a cryptotrans, Reese said. CIS women take a long time to realize when someone's doing it, because they often don't even know the name for what they're seeing or what it means. Trans women see it right away. It's how the most awful chasers fuck, because the most awful chasers are oppressed trans themselves. Meaning, most of us have fucked that way at one time or another. The worst part came later that night with Delia. Some part of her performance changed Delia's estimation of her. She wasn't just the sweet boy Delia could confide in on the bus home. Amy's performance had created a fundamental separation between the two of them. Something that hadn't existed before. Something animal in her. A brute who could take a woman. Delia talked to her differently like she had more respect for Amy, but also, had to maintain a careful distance. This was a budding man, after all, powerful, dangerous. The person outlined by Delia's new deference horrified Amy. What did she really want from Delia? She wanted to sit on Delia's bed, surrounded by all that girl's stuff and get her nails painted. She wanted to be cuddled. The thing Delia seemed to newly admire in her was everything that would lose her what she wanted from Delia. She pictured how the sex would have looked to someone watching, her behind Delia, holding a fistful of Delia's hair, Amy's hairy thighs thrusting away. The image made her sick. A beast whom women were wise to eye warily. We can do this again, Delia said, walking Amy to the corner through her backyard, a route that she chose in case her neighbors reported to her parents that they had seen a boy leaving through the front door while they were out. Amy agreed. She had to agree. That was what she was supposed to do. But Delia and Amy never did it again. Amy's parents grounded her for embarrassing them at the baseball awards, and by the time they freed her, Delia's parents had shipped Delia off to Utah or wherever. Over the next few years, Amy sharpened this mode of dissociative sex, mostly in order to fulfill a social obligation that she felt from both girls and boys. Girls, who wanted to see Amy respond to their beauty, their flirting, in the correct ways. Boys, who wanted to brag about conquests, or more commonly, bond over them. In Amy's late teens, sharing attempted conquests had become the primary and most thrilling activity among boys. The way they got to know and trust each other. The girls were incidental. More than that, they were vaguely disdained in subtle manners by the boys in college, a girl Amy talked to about her high school years made a strong case for calling this disdain misogyny because girls frustratingly didn't always conform to the boys' plans. Still, enough of them did for Amy and her friends. And so the important questions were, how many girls would be at the party? Did you see that short girl? Did you get with her? She had nice titties, didn't she? Did you give it to her? No? She left you blue-balled. Sucks, bro bitches be cray. The more Amy went along with this, the more she grew to fear sex. To fear the come down afterward, when she couldn't dissociate any longer, and had to confront her obvious brutishness. She came to resent the tight cliques of girls who saw how other, dangerous, and terribly male she was. They might have said she was cute, noticed her abs or her pretty boy face. But she was not to be allowed in among the girls. 
Amy was disgusted at the way she craved approval through behavior that made her feel like a cosmic joke, an asshole with no self-esteem who wanted to be one of the girls so badly there weren't even the words for it, so she got close in the crudest ways instead. At times the resentment spiked into self-loathing whole weeks when she either couldn't bear to look at herself in the mirror or didn't want to do anything else. When she watched the girls she knew, a burning jealousy would stab through her. Little things. How they pluck their eyebrows. How they put their hands on each other's arms. Jealous. 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 So it was easy for her to call girls bitches. To dismiss their concerns, which cruelly could never apply to her. To charm the boys with jokes about the ridiculousness of girls, of femininity in general. Her school had a tradition, student switch day, where once a year, each student drew another student's name from a hat, then dressed like that student for a day and attended that other student's classes on their schedule. Amy got Mary Ann's name. Mary Ann was full-figured and gorgeous and probably would have been popular had she not loved horses so much. Mary Ann had been in child pageants. A popular rumor about Mary Ann, one that may or may not have had factual basis but nonetheless had staying power, when Mary Ann hit puberty very young, nine or ten, her mother made her eat toilet paper to starve the fat going to her hips and chest. The fiber in the toilet paper would curb Mary Ann's appetite her mother said. Nevertheless, by 14 Mary and had the biggest breasts at school. Other girls told Amy to ask Mary and to lend her a dress and do her makeup. And Amy longed to ask Mary and for that, longed for it so badly it was terrifying. The night she drew Mary and's name, Amy stared at herself in a mirror, trying to picture what Mary and's eyeshadow and mascara could do for her face. But she never asked Mary Ann for anything. Instead she found a triple F bra at Goodwill, stuffed it, and did nothing else to impersonate Mary Ann. Amy arrived to school on switch day with the bra stuffed under Amy's otherwise everyday clothes. Mary Ann's face fell the second she saw Amy, it was a look of pure hurt, crestfallen with disappointment in what Amy found to imitate in her existence and body. Why are you so mean, she asked Amy. And suddenly Amy saw what she had done, a pair of tits. She was saying that's all Mary and was. And at that moment, when she might have apologized, might have found the courage to ask Mary and for help, to tell her she wanted to understand her better, that she wanted to be like her if only for a day, John McNally came by, pointed at Amy's stuffed bra and said, nailed it. Mary and managed a smile with her mouth but her eyes went wet, and she nodded and said, I hope you have a good day being me. Amy considered taking off the bra, abating her cruelty for Mary and sake. But she didn't. She wore it all day. She liked wearing a bra. She liked people commenting on her boobs. That night, she wore the bra again when she jerked off to the fantasy of Mary and forcing her to dress up in her clothes then tossed it in a dumpster on her way to school the next morning. If that afternoon at Delia's had been Amy's first time having sex with a woman, Patrick had been her first time having sex with a guy. Although whether Patrick was, in fact, a man, Amy later came to doubt. He was the first maybe trans person she had ever met. He probably wouldn't have called himself trans. Just a crossdresser which was what Amy called herself at the time. But no one had ever seen her dressed up. Not even on Halloween. She had figured that by the time she got to college and had a lock on her door, she'd spend a bunch of her time behind it dressed up pretty. But even by her sophomore year, she had barely accumulated the basics of a wardrobe. Her makeup remained in an equally dismal state. She'd had no one to teach her the art of makeup so she stuck to the three cosmetic basics whose application was more or less explained by their packaging, lipstick, eyeliner, and mascara. Her frequent attempts to shop for women's clothes failed more often than not. She never went into women's boutiques it'd be impossible to explain herself in there. Instead, 
She haunted department stores Walmarts and Targets taking circuitous routes around the edges of women's wear, feigning interest in adjacent kitchen appliances, then snatching something, anything, a swimsuit, a purse, a bra. The whole exercise humiliated her. She looked like a creep, she knew. But she couldn't be cool. The closer she got to actually buying clothes, actually browsing in the women's section, the more her blood rushed and her face reddened. The more her hands shook. There wasn't any way to be casual while holding a pair of panties and looking like you're at risk of passing out. Because who did that? What the fuck was wrong with her? And how much other random shit did she buy attempting to hide those panties? Did she think the checkout girl wouldn't think a college boy buying a baby doll dress was weird if the purchases also included three bags of chips, some beef jerky, and a folding chair? She found Patrick in the fall of her second year at college. Forty miles away. A 36-year-old divorced hotel clerk posting in a Yahoo group that he wanted someone to dress up with. Just two guys, dressing up in lingerie, to relax. He undercut his own casual, no homo, bro vibe by adding that he was versatile. 19-year-old college student. 5 feet 8 inches 140 pounds. Do you have lingerie for me? It took Amy two hours of deliberation to send that message. No, but there's a store for cross-dressers where I get mine, Patrick replied. I'll pick you up from your school if you want and we can go tomorrow. Which was how Amy ended up standing on the street in front of her dorm, wearing a hood low over her eyes, as if her pervert tranny intentions could be read plainly on her face by any other passing student who glanced her way. Picture an anonymous strip mall, veneered in a two-red brick, housing a subway franchise, a vacuum cleaner store, and sandwiched between the two, a dingy painted sign that read, Glamour Boutique. Now picture Amy's disappointed face. With a name like Glamour Boutique, she had been naively expecting, well, glamour, three-way mirrors, flattering directional lighting and sleek dresses hung sparingly on brushed metal rails. Instead, racks of clothing cramped the small space. The clothing mostly fell into two categories, frumpy or sexy, like the clientele wanted to either deflect all attention from themselves or wild out in one big skin-revealing splurge. In the back hung black latex and vinyl fetish gear, French-made outfits, schoolgirl ensembles, and frilly sissy party dresses. At the counter, the clerk, a goth girl with straight black hair and thick winged liner, rang up the purchase of a middle-aged man in golf clothes. The golfer kept his eyes fixed on the middle distance, refusing to make eye contact with anyone, which allowed Amy to examine him surreptitiously. Maybe he told his wife he'd gone golfing. Maybe he'd just finished a round of golf. Either way, a satin corset lay on the counter in front of him, the goth clerk met Amy's glance briefly, gave a slight nod, then looked away tactfully. After the golfer left, the clerk watched Amy and Patrick without appearing to, her body language communicating that she presumed nothing. But Amy couldn't help imagining what she thought. A tall balding man, and a young slender boy. She probably thinks I'm the sissy, Amy thought, and the thought both excited and ashamed her. Amy paused at a shelf of silicone breast forms. Let me know if you want to try any, the clerk said. She pointed at a mannequin wearing a bra and forms. We have a special sheer bra with pockets that can hold them so that you can see the nipples. But you can also wear them in any regular bra. Instinctively, Amy shook her head. Then she caught herself. How much are they, she asked depends on the cup size. What size are you? Amy didn't know how to answer the question. Obviously, she had no breasts. The girl tried again. What size bras do you have? I don't know. Well, the sizes bigger than D are 160 for the forms, the smaller sizes are 130. All the bras are 40. Can I see the C cup? Amy said. The girl appraised her. 
I'm guessing you're maybe a 34. But I can measure you if you want. Rarely had Amy wanted something so badly. No. I mean, yeah. Okay. In the dressing room, which was a curtain pulled over a closet in the corner, the girl directed Amy to turn around. Amy wasn't sure how, in this moment, she realized the girl was a transsexual. Some combination of aesthetics clicked into place. I'm getting a bra fitting from a transsexual. She told herself, not quite believing it. She wanted to ask the girl everything, but even more than that, she wanted to be cool. She didn't want the girl to know what a creep she was. A creep who had jerked off to transsexual porn the night before. Yes, the girl said as she wrapped the tape measure around Amy's chest, you can wear either a 34 or a 36. I'd recommend a 34 because bras stretch as they wear out. The girl brought her a 34, with silicone breast forms already in the sheer pockets. The silicone gave off a faint chemical odor, but was pleasingly pliable when squeezed. When the curtain dropped, Amy put it on, and the weight, naturally pulling on her chest, triggered something like an endorphin rush. She gave a little hop, to see them bounce, to feel the weight and movement. A giggle slipped out, like a bubble. She opened the curtain. I'm going to buy this, she told the girl. Can I wear it to try on other clothes? Sure, of course, the girl said. I'll just take the boxes up to the counter. From behind her, Patrick gave the thumbs up. Looking good, Patrick said, and Amy had the strange urge to cover her fake breasts, her fake nipples strategically visible through the sheer fabric. Amy had expected Patrick to be something quite different than what he turned out to be. She had imagined someone quite masculine, the stereotypical man in a dress. Some cleft-chinned action hero with blue eyeshadow Patrick Swayze into Wong Fu. That was the best trans she'd seen on TV. Her other options were the silence of the lambs or the bird cage or maybe the crying game. She had no reason to think Patrick would have been any of those things. Look at Amy herself, neither comedy nor horror nor tragedy, neither especially masculine nor overtly striving for fam. Just a skinny blonde college kid standing on a curb in a red hoodie that repeated washings and wear had faded close to pink, not exactly a macho style, but passably close to indie rock. When Patrick pulled up, a stab of disappointment came over Amy. Nothing about him struck her as notable, moderately tall, stooped shoulders lost in a knit polo shirt, hair on the top of his head nearly melted away small neutral eyes peering at her standing on the curb through wire-framed glasses. Even his car, a 90s-era Geo Metro, a car so nondescript she had forgotten the model had ever existed until she saw him in one. She would have thought she might have the wrong guy, except that he rolled down the window and asked, Tiffany. The name she'd given him for herself. He hadn't given her his fam name. I'm just always Patrick, he'd written. She got in, and he looked at her cautiously, then slowly drove down the street, leaning forward and concentrating on the road, giving the impression that the passing surroundings were shrouded in mist and appeared to him only a few feet from the end of his nose. They spoke little as Patrick drove through town, as though they might be overheard through the windows of the car. Out in the Berkshires, though, they began to talk. Patrick worked night shifts at the Red Roof Inn. He didn't like the job and spoke of it with bewilderment, somehow baffled as to how it had come to be his. He had been the manager at a blockbuster video before that, but it had closed. He'd gotten a divorce at the same time, and a judge had ordered him to pay child support for his two daughters, five and seven. My beach ex-wife doesn't work, though, he said, and Amy flinched a little. Patrick hadn't previously come anywhere near language so strong. This guy is such a loser, Amy thought. But the assessment gave her a feeling of security. They occupied worlds and concerns miles apart. No one could tie them together. They would barely understand each other. She had found a truly safe man with whom to dress up.
Had you heard of the Glamour Boutique before this? Patrick asked as they came out of the Berkshires and into central Massachusetts. He glanced at her with the same smirk that kids wore when they asked each other about a weed hookup. Amy could see he wanted a particular answer. No, should I have? Just wondering if you like the same kind of stories I like. He emphasized the word stories, drawing it out. Like what stories? Erotica. Yeah. Amy adjusted her seatbelt so she could lean subtly against the door and watch him. I like erotica. Glamour Boutique is the sponsor for the Fiction Mania archive. Do you read Fiction Mania? As if he had physically shown it to her, Amy could picture the Glamour Boutique at Banner, depicting a line drawing of a Victorian-looking woman lacing up another woman's corset, an ad banner that floated at the bottom of the fictionmania.tv site. Amy didn't answer. The car banked through a turn on the highway. She had never spoken about what she masturbated to with anyone. The stories of women forcing boys into girlhood. The online archive of Fiction Mania stored 20,000 of these stories, and anonymous writers all across the world added more every day. From the sheer number of stories, Amy understood there had to be thousands of writers, and therefore exponentially more readers, tens or hundreds of thousands of people an entire literary subculture whose existence required that that subculture itself never be acknowledged. The stories formed a trans samizdat so clandestine that you'd have to be a certain sort of trans to ever think about looking for it in the first place. You must be this trans to ride this ride. The first rule of Fiction Mania Club is never talk about Fiction Mania Club. The stories were dangerous. But she knew, from the self-evident existence of the site, that all over the world eyes were eating up the text and penises were spurting at the climaxes of the stories of when the crossdressers themselves first took dick, or when a former boy now Buxom Shamali was humiliated and raped, or when a strong man was feminized against his will. The femininity forced upon the males was the ultimate in degradation and humiliation and what did that say about her opinion of femininity? Amy hated how much she loved the stories, the orgasms that came as she read them at all hours of the day sneaking in a story in the 20 minutes between classes, or whole nights spent in a jerk-off marathon, story after story, until reality began to fade. She knew that anyone she knew who discovered it wouldn't understand. They'd just think she hated femininity and equated it with humiliation. She'd be shunned, and deservedly so. For years until she transitioned, until she met women into rape play, into servitude and infantilization, Women who had eroticized and sexually defanged every unspeakable shame and violation life had thrown at their womanhood she couldn't actually think of a single argument to counter the undeniable orgasm-certified evidence of her unpardonable misogyny. Patrick waited for a response. But Amy couldn't seem to find any words. Neither a confirmation nor a denial. I'll take that as a yes, Patrick said. Yeah, Amy admitted. I know fiction mania. Which stories do you like? Patrick asked. Then without waiting for an answer, he continued, I like the extreme body modifications, when they get given huge boobs. I don't like the stories where they transform through magic. I like the surgery, though. Because it really exists, so I know it might happen to me one day. Patrick's voice took on a note of brightness that Amy hadn't yet heard. The possibility of anyone choosing to foot the cost of surgically implanting Patrick with enormous breasts struck Amy as no more or less likely than an elf which casting a spell to give Patrick boobs. But still, Amy knew what he meant. She didn't like them magic either. She liked the stories that were as close to her life as possible. A shy college boy. Domineering older women. What she really liked was when the women made the trans girls have sex with men. When the older women watched and laughed. But there was no way she'd admit that to Patrick. I usually choose the wedding dress or married category, Amy said. Weddings are so kinky. I think most non-kinky people just never realize it. Think about it. 
you put a woman in a special elaborate outfit, and then one man gives her to another man like some kind of BDSM scene, and then they put like a symbolic collar on the woman's finger, and then the man lifts her dress to show everyone there may be hundreds of people. Her garter and lingerie. Then he picks her up and takes her away to fuck her while everyone else knows it's happening. It's so dirty. It's like the kinkiest thing I could ever imagine and it actually happens all the time. So I like to think about it happening to me. She had never said anything like this aloud before. Patrick laughed. And then she laughed. As she laughed, Patrick did something unexpected. For most of the drive, he'd been leaning forward, peering through the windshield, his hands at two and ten o'clock. But he dropped his left hand and started rubbing his crotch. Amy thought Patrick might just be adjusting, but no, he kept at it. He was playing with himself. He didn't so much as glance at her, just kept going, talking about which of the stories he liked from his favorite category, physically forced or blackmailed. For a moment, Amy felt disgusted. But isn't this what she wanted? Didn't she understand it? Hadn't she wanted to share the sexuality she hid with someone? Anyone? She reached down and rubbed herself too. But she couldn't keep going. The vibe in the car wasn't sexy. She felt like a boy, with a man, but a man she'd judged to be an unattractive loser. Maybe she'd feel differently after they had dressed up. Glamour Boutique got fun after about a half hour. The clerk introduced herself as Jen. As Amy's jitteriness faded, Jen actually began to help Amy with clothes. The sense of women advising each other on outfits, of her inclusion in that feminine right, nearly overwhelmed Amy. It was more than she could have hoped for. Wearing the breast forms and bra, she wanted to try on everything not just the fetish clothes, items she'd only ever seen online but simple dresses as well. Always look for the empire waist, Jen encouraged, holding up a yellow dress with a sash under the bust. Everyone always thinks it's about minimizing the shoulders, but no, it's about the right ratio between shoulders and hips. Empire waists flare out, give you hips. Amy and Patrick nodded, listening carefully. Patrick had touched Amy a few times now, in ways that Amy wasn't sure how to interpret. Once Patrick held up a dress against Amy's body and said, this would look nice on you, then ran a hand down Amy's side, pressing the dress against it. A contrail of unease followed Patrick's touch, but she refused to let anything like that ruin the moment. A vague euphoria wafted over Amy. Here they were a bunch of girls talking clothes. Initially, she glanced at Jen frequently, worried that Jen might be annoyed by their excitement or laughing at them. But no, she judged Jen's friendliness as genuine. It had to be boring to work in a place where you have to carefully avoid eye contact so often, like with that golfer. Maybe hers and Patrick's excitement made them better customers. Amy had read about transsexuals online. She'd even taken a test the Kojiati, combined gender identity and transsexuality inventory, developed by some transsexual woman and based on DSM psychological models to determine if the test takers were true transsexuals who needed to transition, or merely transgenderists that is, male fetishists for whom transition would be a tragic mistake. She'd read whatever psychology about trans people she could find at her college library and on the internet. Most of it was decades old. According to what she'd found online, there were two types of male to female transsexuals. Those people who had always been girls, who had played with dolls, were attracted to men, and hated their penises. The second kind, the autogynophiles, were men who got turned on by the idea of themselves as women. These were the fetishistic crossdressers, who conformed to all sorts of male stereotypes, loved their penises and got turned on wearing women's clothing. They ought not transition, the psychologists said they weren't really women, they were fetishists who took their indulgence too far. Amy caught the whiff of moralism in this assessment and understood what it meant. There was something bad and immoral about autogynophilia. 
In the comments below the psychology articles, a number of trans women irate at this psychology always posted rebuttals. They called the idea of autogynophilia transphobic. They called the psychologists who came up with it chasers. Amy remembered how one of them patiently explained that the term autogynophilia only works if you don't think trans women are women. If you do, then you immediately see that the majority of women, CIS, or trans, are all autogynophiles, and that most men would be autoandrophiles it's not something special about trans women. Of course women are turned on by being women and men turned on by being men. Watch any porn and the sexuality of everyone in it is actually about their own autoandrogynephilia. Listen to them talk. It's all about validating their own gender. Oh yeah, I'm your little slut, yeah, baby, you like this big cock. And alone on their laptop somewhere, the viewers, turned on to identify with people identifying with their gender. Other trans women claimed that these psychologists had begun to be discredited, that their research methods were revealed to be the suspect practice of hanging around in bars without institutional review board approval in order to pick up trans women, sleep with them, and later write clinical papers both based upon and obscuring those experiences. But Amy doubted those trans women. No one with expertise cared what the trans women had to say. Who were they to tell psychologists with doctorate scientists? that they were wrong. And hadn't it even been a transsexual woman herself who'd written the Kojiati test? Of course a bunch of deranged creeps whose paraphilia revolved around womanhood would claim they're women crazy people never think they are crazy. Check and mate, sickos. Amy didn't have to take the test to know her own result, a fetishist, a pervert. But she took it anyhow, a series of bizarre questions about imagining shapes and quantifying empathy. You are talking with a friend. Outside, far away, somebody is honking their horn regularly and endlessly. It is not very loud, you can just barely hear it in the quiet room. What is your reaction? You meet somebody and they are polite to you, but seem a little distant. They are actually secretly disliking you. How likely are you to know this? You will never, ever be a woman. You must live the rest of your days entirely as a man, and you will only get more masculine with each passing year. There is no way out. What is your reaction? You're in a desert walking along when all of a sudden you look down and you see a tortoise. It's crawling toward you. You reach down to flip the tortoise over on its back. The tortoise lies on its back, its belly baking in the hot sun, beating its legs trying to turn itself over, but it can't, not without your help. But you're not helping. Why is that? Some of the questions made no sense but others betrayed by their wording a clumsy trend in the conclusions they would formulate. If you had spatial skills and active sexuality you were clearly a fetishistic man, and if you empathized with people and didn't care about sex, you might be that rarest of things, a true transsexual, a woman trapped in a man's body. But Amy wasn't that. The test showed her to be the autogynophilic creep she already assumed she would be. Jen was obviously a true transsexual. Amy had never met a trans girl in person, and her fascination with Jen bordered on painful. Look at her. She looks like a girl. She sounds like a girl. More than that, Amy thought, she wanted something from Jen. Something like sexual attraction, but shaded differently. Something closer to the thrill she felt when a celebrity passed by. Of a nameless wanting in the direction of that celebrity. The abstract beckoning that celebrities exude. The gravitational pull of their fame that tugged at Amy so that she felt anxious to be close, to be seen, and to be valued. To feel those celebrity eyes move without friction across the smooth surface of a clamoring fandom, then suddenly catch upon her, stop dead, and return her gaze. That moment of mutual recognition, that's the only way to have your existence stamped valid, to transcend the anonymity of mere fan, of inconsequential gawker. Jen's was a non-celebrity celebrity that Amy could feel. A pull that maybe. Only she would feel. 
Amy kept turning to see where in the store Jen was. Shockingly, Jen seemed to be having a good time. Moreover, she kept saying things that countered what the Kojiati test said a true transsexual should feel. When Patrick asked about French-made outfits, Jen clucked in approval. Back wall, she said, pointing. But also, we have some sexy ones in boxes in the back that we never put out because they take up so much space when they are unfolded. It's not the cheap Halloween style, they are the sensual kind with petticoats that actually fluff. In mock sotto voce she admitted, I got one myself. I have a thing for that flouncy feel. My boyfriend always wants me to tidy up in it for him. But no way. I just wear it around my apartment for special, ah, uh, personal time. She giggled at the admission and Amy thought that Jen might spontaneously combust from her own incredible and suddenly revealed transcendent hotness, an attractiveness that had only a tangential relationship to her appearance. At one point, Patrick stood on one leg, working a pair of pantyhose up the calf of his other, while Jen stood in front of him with a French-made outfit at the ready, when the bell above the door chimed. In walked a pleasant-looking woman, plump with loosely curled blonde hair, and her teenage daughter, who looked healthy, like maybe she was on the soccer team, an impression that Amy had because she was wearing casual athletic gear. The two of them were mid-laugh perhaps lured into the store by the super fun sounding name Glamour Boutique. What mother and daughter wouldn't have fun with a little glamour on an outing together? Alarmed comprehension dawned on the mother's face as she took in the store. But by then it was too late. Patrick, Amy, and Jen had all seen her come in. Turning in horror would let everyone know what she thought of them. No, she would show her daughter how to play it cool. Amy's joy in having found a feminine space meant especially for her dimmed, as the light fades when a heavy cloud crosses the sun, then winked out completely. The sense of safety that she had spun over the store vanished. Everything on the racks shrugged off their previous disguises to reveal themselves as tawdry and desperate. Inwardly, she disavowed the space. This store did not reflect her. She did not truly belong there. Patrick, still only half in his pantyhose, blanched to a beige color and made a fast walk beeline for the curtains that hid the changing area, stepping on and dragging the half-donned hosiery as he did. Jen winced, still holding the French-made dress. This must have happened to her many times, the panic among customers she'd just coaxed into comfort when civilians wandered into the store. After a moment, the mother decided on a course of action she would browse. After all, it was a store and she was allowed to browse, wasn't she? In an attempt to look natural, the mother poured through the closest rack and bravely held up a top complex with straps and spandex. Oh, look at this. It's interesting. What do you think? Despite her bravado, a cringe squeaked into her voice. Yes, said her daughter, panicked, without even glancing at it. Her gaze raked the walls, hung thickly with gaffs, breastplates, wigs. Amy saw the store through her eyes, a silence of the lambs' level display of disembodied female body parts. Worst of all, the red-faced men, one now hiding, the other creepily fingering panties and who knew what else. The specialty panties with wider gusset for women of all anatomies. That Amy held in her hand and had been examining with curiosity when the bell above the door announced the women's entrance, burned radioactively. She longed to drop them, to throw them away from her, but feared that doing so would attract attention her way, the equivalent of waving a lace-trimmed pink flag. So she stood frozen, apparently transfixed by the panties, hating the image she felt sure she presented. She wanted to apologize. She couldn't help herself. She stared at the teenage daughter. What was the speed of calculations whirring through that poor girl's mind? How long would her mother fake brows before they could escape? Wigs, proclaimed the mother, mustering her best cheer. Fun. Wigs, agreed Jen, 
setting down the maid's outfit and extending a white hand in a gesture to the wall. The ones at the bottom are synthetic, at the top are human hair. Like the store itself, Jen had transformed in a moment. Her previous secret celebrity had inverted itself. The polarity on her magnetism had switched, she now repelled rather than attracted. To Amy, Jen's posture now landed with echoes of witches had she just said human hair. Grotesque. As Jen walked back behind the counter into the sunlight streaming through the front window, the witchy aspect grew more pronounced. Amy, who had had Jen's arms around her, fastening a bra in place, before she realized Jen was trans could no longer see anything but how trans she was, accompanied by revulsion at every feature she identified, lank dark hair, heavy knuckles, gaunt cheeks, traces of last night's makeup darkening the circles beneath her eyes. Fear had poisoned Amy's thoughts. Cruelly and involuntarily, her vision flayed away all the beauty from Jen like sheets of skin peeled from her body. We have wig caps, if you want to try one, Jen said. Mom. Let's go, said the daughter. The rack of books behind her were illustrated erotica labeled forced womanhood, their covers decorated with drawings of she-males bound and being whipped. Yes, okay. Out darted the daughter, but with the door open, her mother paused. She turned back, her hand resting on the frame. Your store is fun, she apologized, not just to Jen, but to everyone. She nodded, almost to herself, and a moment later the overhanging bell announced her departure. Patrick drove too fast on the ride home. The sky had darkened while he and Amy had shopped in the glamour boutique. Fat drops of an April storm splat onto the highway, making the asphalt surface into television static. Amy didn't trust the geo to stick to the shiny road, slick with oil and rivulets, especially not when Patrick turned off the interstate and onto the windy state highways that cut over the Holyoke Range. I'm sorry, Amy said. I was in a car accident when I was younger, so I get nervous. Can you slow down? She hadn't actually ever been in a car accident, but it seemed socially easier to blame her unease on herself rather than his driving. Patrick grunted and lifted his foot slightly from the accelerator. Roll down the window, he told her. The fan in this car is broken and I can't see through these windows. When she cracked the window, the sound of tires hissing over the wet pushed in, and droplets sprayed the left side of her face, and with it came the pungent odor of the wet forest, a rich mixture of damp dirt, decay, moss, and sprouting leaves. Amy liked the way rain amplified the mustiest and most comforting smells of the forest, making the forest much more foresty, just how a dog when wet smells so much more doggy. The smell of the forest appeared to act as aromatherapy for Patrick too. His posture released. He wiped at the window, then leaned back and drove at a reasonably slow speed. That was awful, he said into the sound of rain and wind roaring past the cracked window. Those women coming in. No, it was okay, Amy assured Patrick. I mean, why should we be embarrassed? It's our store. The possessive just slipped in. She wasn't sure how the store became theirs, but the mother had said it too. Your store. The store for people like them. It wasn't okay, Patrick said. Amy nodded. He was right. It wasn't okay. She didn't feel at all okay about it. She would do almost anything to never again be looked at the way those women had looked at her. It wasn't that they had even been rude. They had simply seen her. Seen a true thing in her that she had spent her life making sure never to show to anyone. Once, when she had been about 10 or 11, her mother had gone on a business trip and come home with gifts for Amy, a pair of fluorescent blue rollerblades with neon yellow ratchet straps, and a t-shirt on which the words Florida Keys and a picture of a tropical fish had been embroidered in thick thread rather than screen printed. The thread on the inside of the shirt was very scratchy. After about a week of wearing the shirt, Amy had a very good idea. She went to the front porch, where her mother was planting geraniums in the window boxes. 
I love this shirt, it's my favorite, she announced to her mother, but it is scratchy. It rubs. Can I borrow a bra? Her mother continued potting the flowers without turning around. I'm sorry, can you do what? Amy's voice wavered, less confident on her second time asking. She pulled her shirt away from her nipples to illustrate the problem. The embroidery is scratchy. She had worn her mother's bras in secret, when she was home alone. Now she had an excuse to have a bra of her own. Some of the girls in school were getting them, but she knew she wouldn't without some careful maneuvers on her part. Then, her mother turned, trowel in hand, and gave Amy a look of irritation. Just wear another t-shirt under it. That will be too hot. A bra would be better. Her mother set the trowel down with a clunk and gave Amy a strange look. She saw that her son wasn't being stupid. It was the precursor to the look Amy had gotten from the women in the glamour boutique. That is not something a son asks his mother, her mother said carefully. And in her tone, beneath the impassive way she said it, Amy could feel something harder, a pit of revulsion, pulling tightly in on itself. Her mother had never said anything like that before. She was not the type to categorize behavior into what was and wasn't done. Amy saw, in a flash, that her mother knew the request had nothing to do with scratched nipples and, worse, it had disturbed her. What seemed like a foolproof ruse had revealed everything. Oh. Amy said. I forgot. I have that white tank top. I can wear that underneath, and that won't be too hot. She smacked her palm against her forehead. Of course. Her mother's strange gaze didn't change. Amy walked away with her mother's eyes still on her, and then she avoided her mother for as long as she could. At least until dinner that night. Now, almost a decade later, Amy finally had her own bra. Not one pilfered from some girl's underwear drawer and stuffed into a backpack at a party. She looked at the bag of her purchases sitting at her feet in Patrick's car. She should have felt happy, but she didn't. Instead, she felt as if she had given in to an urge that ought to be turned away from. As when people shut their eyes in horror at the possibility of an apparition. Don't even acknowledge it it'll fuck up everything you know about the world. In addition to the bra and breast forms, she had bought a pink dress empire waist, as Jen had recommended and a pair of white faux leather stripper heels, six inches tall and made from cheap plastic, with a thin ankle strap and a two-inch platform. She'd also bought two pairs of panties. All this had been very expensive, nearly $300. After those women left, the shopping never got quite as fun as it had been before. Jen seemed more aware of how skittish Amy and Patrick were, and her suggestions were more circumspect. Amy supposed that had those women not come in, she would have bought much more during that brief euphoric mood that made her forget for a short time that women's clothing could be dangerous. She wished that she had at least bought a wig. She tried one on and looked terrible. Jen had assured her that makeup would alleviate the resemblance to an 80s rocker instead of a beautiful woman, that Amy had been shocked to find staring back at her from the stall's vanity mirror. The difference between the effect that she had always hoped would occur and the reality of what she'd seen in the stall's mirror had so disheartened her that she couldn't bear to try on another. Maybe if the shopping euphoria returned, she'd thought, but it never did. I have to be more careful than I was today, Patrick said, breaking Amy's reverie. I can't let anyone find out about my cross-dressing. Me neither, Amy said. Patrick looked at her. But you don't have that much to lose. I'm going through a divorce. Anyone sees me and I could lose visitation with my daughters. He swallowed hard. I used to wear matching panties with my wife sometimes other stuff. She said it was fun, it was like a sexy game but I know she has already told her lawyer about it and I think they're going to use it against me. Wow. wow. That sucks. Amy only half believed Patrick. Who was this woman who would let him wear panties around her? 
no. He had to be lying to impress her. Besides, she absolutely had as much to lose as Patrick, maybe more. Patrick was already a loser. She wasn't. I can't be seen in a store like that one, Patrick continued. It could have real consequences. But wouldn't anyone going into that store be going to it on purpose? Those women weren't there on purpose. Patrick had her there. She didn't know what to say. This was some heavy adult shit. Custody. Divorce. Instead, she changed the subject. So do you still want to go to your house to dress up, though? Other than her minuscule dorm room, Amy had nowhere to wear her new outfit. She couldn't bear the idea of donning it all only to strut the two steps that it took to cross her thinly carpeted room, back and forth, like a sad-eyed giraffe at the zoo, endlessly circling her tiny enclosure. Yes, Patrick said. Don't you? MMHMM, please, said Amy. For a long time, Amy would remember the day at the glamour boutique as erotically charged. But she would remember very little about the sex that she and Patrick had, only that it was not erotic. Eventually, that was how she would come to understand what sex with men was for her. The erotic part lay in the dressing up, the foreplay, the mental switch into a feminine role. And yes, dressing up with men almost always culminated in sex, but a distant faraway sex one that Amy felt like she hadn't participated in. The sex itself was necessary to break the spell. The orgasm released the tension that had been building and brought you back to yourself. After sex, the spell could dissipate, and she saw herself as she truly was, a boy, lying dazed on his back in a stranger's bed with a dress hiked up to the waist, a string of his own precum on his thigh, and a stranger lifting himself off the bed to sheepishly pull off a reservoir-filled condom. While Patrick washed himself in the bathroom, Amy got her bearings took stock of the action figures lined up along the wall. The she-male porn DVD playing on the TV, which Patrick had stared at insistently and vacantly while he fucked Amy, the way Amy had scrunched shut her eyes and gone far away, taking with her only the sensation of being penetrated, of being filled by cock, of being passive for a lover. It was not Patrick's cock she had taken with her. Or, maybe, in one dimension it was. But in the place Amy had gone, it was Jen from the shop inside of her. The encounter, both real and not, expanded inside Amy's mind, a sequence that moved from that looped memory of Jen fitting Amy for a bra, then to Jen's imagined body, and then, Jen was fucking her, fucking her as a woman, and Amy could feel it, couldn't she? The thrusting inside of her, the hands on her hips and shoulders feel that? That was Jen fucking her. Yes, it was and would be as long as she clung tight to this faraway place, and in this place she could enjoy herself for once, she could feel everything as it should be. I'm coming, Patrick had said, breaking the silence and loosening Amy's grip on the place she had gone, so that it slipped away from her as when you let go of a ledge, and she fell careening back through the wormhole, through time and space, back to Patrick's bed, where she opened her eyes, and saw him on top of her thrusting then one last hard thrust, with his eyes locked on the television. She didn't say anything. Not like with Delia. No encouragement. No pretending that she had ever been present. Wordlessly, she and Patrick both understood the rules rules that she would henceforth employ for all sexual encounters with men, neither of them would actually be there for the sex. They would take from each other what they could, each from their own places. They would use what they could of each other's bodies. But encouragement, or solace, or care no, neither of them wanted any of that. Just give me enough of yourself to put me in touch with the part of me that can believe I'm a girl, and beyond that, you can go fuck yourself, in whatever theoretical dimension you need to be in to do that. Baby, why are you crying? Reese had asked. Because some combination of hormones and poppers had made possible the sex that Amy had given up on. The poppers made her too dumb to flee into herself, to send herself somewhere. So there she was with Reese. Not off elsewhere working to see herself as a woman when she lay on top of a woman, or replacing a man with someone else while he lay on top of her. She simply was a woman present with a woman. 
It felt like some kind of healing, some kind of redemption. And all she could do was cry. Later that night, Reese stroked her hair and whispered to her, I'm sorry you've been in so much pain for so long. Any night before that one, Amy would have denied it, would have told Reese about all the privileges she had, about how lucky she had been compared to other trans women, how many advantages she'd been granted. How few of the readily nameable traumas she ever suffered. And without legible traumas to point to, what would pain make her? At best, a trans version of those Didion worshipping bourgeois white girls who subscribe to a grand unified theory of female pain, those minor wound dwelling brooders with no particular difficulties but for an inchoate sense of their own wrongness, a wrongness that fell apart when put into words but nonetheless justified all manner of petulance and self pity. In pain? No, not Amy. That night, however, she gaped at Reese, shocked at how easily Reese had named what she'd gone through. She remembered Ricky telling her about Reese's uncanny ability to say what you need. Whether she could trust Reese or not, no one had ever said such a thing to her. No one had so casually seen through her hollow stoicism to the accumulated disdain and disgust she harbored within. No one had ever implied that Amy might be wounded or suffering too, least of all Amy. She didn't know she needed that kind of permission until that moment. She opened her mouth to protest, gulped once, and collapsed into tears all over again, sobbing onto Reese's chest at all she had done to herself for years, at the hurt she'd inflicted upon herself and on the people she'd been with, while Reese gripped her and didn't tell her to stop, 